Sup. I swear the computer just just uh, froze up in the middle of my music, man. <coughs> Bullshit. Well, I'm, I'm, I, maybe it's the fan. Maybe the fan needs cleaning. It might be. Yeah. Is it? Have you downloaded anything to check the temperature? No. What? How do I? Uh, download a program called Speed Fan, and uh, that'll let you check the internal temperature of the computer. And if it's getting too hot, you know that you'll know it's the fan. Hmm. Sounds like a lot of work. Yeah, it's a lot of fucking work. Better just just throw the whole thing out and spend money on a new computer. No, this was <laughs> built from scratch. Oh, well, <laughs> don't stop being selective with your laziness then. <laughs> By the way, uh, that the Justice League Snyder Cut... Um, It's a mess. It's just a mess. It's everybody's praising it, but it seriously is a mess. I think they're is just it, going. Was it better than the uh, theatrical version? I'm not so sure because <laughs> the theatrical version was a piece of shit. Well, neither one of them are, are you know, uh, Avengers yeah. Endgame or Infinity War or anything like that. See, yeah, I've seen people saying that it's actually better than Endgame. No, no, it is. Which, yeah, I have doubts about that. And I don't even really like Endgame. Nothing. Nothing is better than Endgame or Infinity War. Um, I don't know why Marvel is better at shared universe stuff, but they're I, straight up kicking DC's ass with that. Well, I think it's a couple reasons. One, they have Zack Snyder doing the shit. <laughs> and two is well, because, you know, they Snyder, tried to... Zack Snyder did a pitch-perfect version of Watchmen though. He brought uh, No I like that less and less the more I, I the more as the years go by. It's probably the best um it's probably the best version of Watchmen we could have gotten at the time. Oh he left out the giant squid. Who cares? It isn't even the giant squid. He doesn't seem to get what Watchmen is about. Okay, what what do you think it's about? Well, one, it's a, uh, it's you know about how the, it's about the superheroes. It's about the characters, and he replicated he did, the comic. Except, well, did, uh, we just lost him. Um, but yeah, one of the biggest problems was with Silk Spectre. It's like I don't know if he just doesn't know how to write women, or if he um, just didn't get Silk Spectre's character. That was a big problem. Same with uh, Doctor Manhattan. He didn't really seem to understand what was going on with Doctor Manhattan. How he was increasingly becoming alienated from, um, you know, from humanity. It wasn't like a, a sudden turn like it is in the movie. It's something, you know, that uh, happens over time because he's increasingly losing his humanity and showing the way he showed the, uh, um, uh, the original Minutemen in the flashbacks, I think is also indicative of how he didn't get it. Uh, he doesn't, you know, he didn't really explore how, the Minutemen, which is important to the comic. And I know there's only so much you can fit in, but, it, you know, the way he handled, um, uh, um, what was his name? The uh, the original Night Owl, it wasn't very good. Um, the way uh, the way he handled the opening scene with the death of a comedian wasn't very good. Um, you know, the way it just sort of, you know, the way the comedian puts up a fight like I know that's supposed to be more cinematic but I don't think that's a good thing because it's supposed to be indicative of how at this point the comedian is basically just a lonely broken old man so he gets so he's easy to get to, to take out um you know he um doesn't really get Rorschach's character either he just he's um he doesn't explore Rorschach's um dis um increasing uh alienation he doesn't he, he spends way too much time on the action scenes because in the comic the action scenes are brief and they can be brutal but the the thing is like for Zack Schneider apparently the way to make something brutal is just to uh is just to um you know show bones broken have it go on forever have all this like matrix shit going on when in reality it um it probably should more look like the violent scenes from the Irishman if it was done properly. Um, but you know, despite 
all of that at like at the time that probably was the best version of Watchmen that we were ever going to get especially considering that stupid ass screenplay that had been circulating around that had the fucking Watchmen uh uh doing shit like um going back in time and and all of that it, it that I don't I, what the fuck was that same thing so tell me can you can you hear interference at all right now uh nope i hear the cat rubbing itself but i don't you hear what running itself the, I see, the hear the cat rubbing himself against your okay. microphone but that's it okay i've got a fan i've got like one yeah. of those little portable fans on top of the computer blowing towards the the vent at the top does that make sense is that a good idea uh that might work um you might also try just uh blowing a uh a, a straw into the uh into the fan compartment Hmm. That might maybe it might just be too much collected dust, so maybe that could That's be it. Quite plausible, but uh, right now I'm hoping that the 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 portable fan blowing towards it will rectify it until we're done here tonight. That should help us at least some. Gracie's yeah. blessing the microphone. Yes. Thank you, Saint Graceless of the yeah feline. Um, <laughs> Of the feeling as domesticus. Yes, thank you. Now, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Hello. while you were figuring that out, I went on a rant on why I didn't think the Watchmen movie was as good. Was very good. He replicated the comic except for the giant squid. I don't know what you're complaining? <laughs> that, no, like I, I had this whole rant. Like he doesn't really, oh. he really didn't get the characters. It's like for him, is this like, you know, oh, all these cool people who are kind of flawed and, uh, but they do cool action shit. No. It's like he doesn't explore the way they increasingly become alienated from humanity, which is the whole point of the comic, especially with Dr. Manhattan and Rorschach. I don't know. I thought that he was matching the whole thing, you know, uh, nuance from nuance by nuance. And that like, it was especially bad it because he replicated it. He, even if that it wasn't the replication. Yes, That's it was. A, though. There was dialogue that was that was the same. Um I'm telling so you, what? <laughs> that doesn't the only thing, the only anything. thing that was different is the giant squid. Well, it uh, wasn't different because the 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 tone and the characters are very important to the comic. He especially didn't get Silk Spectre. Like Silk Spectre is a complete non-entity in the movie, and it's like he, he. I don't know if he just doesn't know how to write women, or if he just didn't get Silk Spectre. Everything she did was in the comic. She's and a, one thing that she did not do in the comic. I mean. If 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 you're saying that the that he didn't get the characters, then I guess Alan Moore didn't get the characters. What do you? If Alan Moore wrote the damn thing. I know, and it and the, it's the same thing on screen, except no, the it is, but it isn't. He doesn't explore the the actual aspects. He left out the documents or whatever in between stories. I mean, what? <laughs> it isn't, but the like the like. Can you name me anything memorable? Silk Spectre actually did in the movie. Versus what she did in the comics. She was always forgettable like that. No, she wasn't. She had her whole relationship with her mother. That was a big part of the comics. And that in was the, in the like, movie, though. It was a flat remember? nothing in the movie. No, no. I, don't, said, the, I the barely remember it from the movie. Brighter. The past keeps getting brighter. Uh, the future keeps getting darker. And the past just keeps getting brighter. That was part of her relationship with her daughter. And also, you know, the, there's no... Um, you know, there was no chemistry in the relationship between Night Owl and uh, Silk Spectre. It's like he sacrificed the character development for shit like that. Really, st like uh, drawing out the sex scene and with uh, in the uh, Artemis with with for some reason playing Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah. That was a stupid idea. Well, what's the problem um, with it? I don't understand. Why do fans have a problem with that scene? It draws out way too long, and it's not. It's a uh, you know, it's so he's not a quick. The, they're not. They're not doing a quickie. Good for them. <laughs> it 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 misses the you know what it symbolizes in the uh, you know in the comics because in the comic you know it's pretty clear this is them feeling alive after they've been out you know fighting crime. Whereas in the movie, it's they just go like for a beer with the the, uh, the the hero guy uh, that that he goes to meet every Wednesday, and on the way out, they they get into a fight with a bunch of thugs 
and they start feeling aroused. It's exactly like the comic. I'm telling you, Zack Snyder like owned that story, <laughs> except for the giant squid, which you must be a giant squid <laughs> fan is what you're really, you just don't want to admit it. That's what you're really mad about. I'm not, I don't think it's the, it was the worst way to um, streamline the story. Uh, you know, I, I still think it gives like this sort of weird, uh, like uh, superheroes are gods, like aspect that Snyder is uh, obsessed with, except he thinks they're benevolent gods, which really, which they are not, especially okay, in Watchmen. The comedian, the comedian makes it pretty clear that they're not gods and are very flawed. I mean, and, well, and again, that's faithful to that's the That's another problem. Like in the in the comic, um, it's faithful you know, to the, the material in every way. <laughs> in the comic, the comedian gets taken out pretty easily, which I, I mentioned earlier. And he did was in the beginning, indicative. I'm sorry, dude. But no, he didn't. He did. He put up a huge fight in the beginning. It's like it was a ridiculous fight scene, and it should not have done that because, uh, you know, because it, it, that at that point, uh, comedian is just a, a lonely old man, and he gets taken out easily, which is the whole point. You I know, think you after... need to go back and watch it because he really did get his shit kicked in. He got his shit pushed in pretty bad. I mean, not compared and... to the comic. In the comic, he basically doesn't even put up a fight because okay. at that point while he's basically he's broken. Thrown, while he's being thrown across a table into glass, he's laughing and saying, "It's a joke. It's all one big joke." He wasn't putting up too much of a fight. I mean, that's just which is another thing. The comedian is not the fucking Joker. He's actually he's a human and he's afraid to die. If that's what he is in the comic. He doesn't really react when he's thrown out the window because, you know, he's too dazed and confused and broken. Okay, he was drunk during that. Now, any face that he might have had while he was falling out the window, it's just common, you know, human, you know, body mechanics. I mean, come on, dude. You know, I mean, there's faithful to the source material, and then there's being, you know, very, achieving verisimilitude with it being, picturing it in a real life setting, you know. So there's ver verisimilitude to factor in, too. I'm telling you, everything you're naming, man, is, it's faithful to it there. Except for the giant squid, just admit it. You want you you miss <laughs> the calamari crushing the city, which is lame. You, well, me. you met, we mentioned Silk Spectre earlier. Do you? It, that's another problem I had. That was a major problem I had when I first watched it. Silk Spectre's complete non-reaction to seeing the destruction in New York. That made no okay, sense. She had one line when that went down. She said, "No, she didn't. She had a whole monologue about how said, fucked up it was." No, she all she all I remember her saying is, "These people went out for chicken tandoori and now they're dead," or something like that. If they had left that line out, because it was, it would have like. Uh, it wasn't just that. It wasn't just that she said that line. It says she has a complete non-reaction in the movie. She just looks around like, "Oh, something happened here." I mean, it, you know, it does. It registers right away. Some it doesn't register right away. Something that magnitude. You're looking at and it's and trying to figure it out. I mean, you know, I, I really think you're nitpicking the things here, man. Rorschach was faithful to a T. Everything about Rorschach, he got. Now that again, that's the thing. It's it, Rorschach. I mean, he does the things he does in the comic. The problem is like there's none of his real development is there. It's just like brush He has the the interviews with the psychiatrist. I'm sorry, dude. I'm not trying to be difficult, but <laughs> everything you're naming is in the movie. They're barely in the. They're that's barely in the movie. It's only there to have the to have the flashback to where he killed it the is, guy in the building. It, is, it has become socially acceptable for for directors to to go, to to direct like four hour superhero films now. Back then, Watchmen was pushing the envelope on length and uh, uh, you know. Uh, channeling a, a, a somewhat obscure to the mainstream uh, comic book story, okay? Oh. Zack Snyder helped realize what we see today in terms of, you know, I mean, like, he helped. That's not really a good thing. No, no, it is. It is. I don't think it is. I mean, you just said just the, his, his cut of the Justice League was not good. Okay, but that's different, okay? <laughs> Snyder cut of Justice League is seriously a train wreck walking. Is I'm it worse scary. than Batman v Superman? I was, was, was going to build. I w I haven't seen it, but I mean, if that's Don't. <laughs> if it's a, it, it it harkens back to Batman versus Superman, and so if it's in that continuity, then I mean, yeah, it, may, it makes sense that it would suck. Here's the thing: at the time, I didn't really mind that 
Joss Whedon version of Justice League, but it still didn't hold a candle to Avengers. Uh, I mean, you had Robert Downey Jr. as Iron Man with just like, you know, chewing the scenery, you know, knocking out one-liners, like totally natural, without even uh, one ounce of cringe. I mean, you just feel it. It's cool, you know. And I don't know, maybe it's the Russo brothers, but they really have a, a magical way of making a shared universe, you know, not feel contrived. Whereas with Justice League, uh, I think, the, I think Snyder- the biggest problem is that they rushed it. It's uh, like um, they started with the bad Man of Steel out, which fucking sucked. And um, he uh, and then they just decided, oh, the shared universe thing, uh, Batman v Superman, Justice League. And then we do the their their movies. And it's like, nope, didn't work. It fucking sucked. Wait, wait, and, and Wonder Woman. They did Wonder Woman before that, too. Right? Oh, yeah, Wonder Woman did come before Justice League. And, then, yeah. like, and that they, was the one decent one. And then they dropped Flash and Aquaman into it before they've even done a, an Aquaman movie, much less a Flash movie. Um, I've heard mixed know, things about the Aquaman movie. It's not even the Flash from the TV series, is it? No, and I oh, think God they didn't tie any CW stuff in. Because if you think the movies are bad, CW stuff is fucking garbage. Okay, it is. It is so fucking bad. It, it punches me in the nuts and takes my lunch money. Yeah, it, it it's ambitious without like uh, a just without justifying the ambition. It's like it shouldn't be that hard to put together on screen the Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Aquaman, and there's no Green Lantern, by the way. I mean, he's been a f- a uh, pivotal member of the Justice League for like decades now. I mean, yeah, I thought it was a weird choice to have Cyborg as one of the Justice League. Like, it isn't he more associated of, with the Titans? It screams of like minority social justice shit. Because Cyborg, I don't think so. Well, no, but Cyborg think. wasn't a ma- wasn't a major character until they kind of just forced this character down our throats. I would have. Well, taken I mean, if you watch the old Super Friends episodes, he was, but yeah, Cyborg's been around forever. Has he? Because I don't remember. Yeah. Okay, so I you never watched uh, Super Friends, the cartoon. Yeah. I, I mean, I may have, but I don't. I don't remember it. Uh, actually, there is a Martian Manhunter in in the movie uh, uh, Eli. But I'll get to that in a second. Uh, okay, I would have taken Amazing Man or Mr. Terrific over Cyborg, because at least I know something about them. Or Bloodwind, but I know that that's getting real obscure. But uh, to the point being, I mean, I feel like there were there were more identifiable African-American superheroes than Cyborg. I, I didn't know that he'd been around so. forever. I mean, isn't there... I mean, what's that one... Uh, Green Lantern dude's name. There's like several of those, but John there's a black Stewart. one. John Stewart. I, yeah. I mean, that definitely would have made more sense. Hell yeah, that yeah. would have made more sense. Even if they didn't bring in Ryan Reynolds as Green Lantern, uh, yeah, John Stewart as Green Lantern would have been more believable to me. How long has Cyborg been around? I don't remember him until this. Oh, oh he's, he's been, been around, around for a long time. Since like the 60s or 70s. Really? Yeah. 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 Um. Well, I guess okay. it's a hole in but, my nose. And I know that, and I, hate, I don't really like DC all that much. <laughs> For okay. some reason, they don't like giving him a dick. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... What do you mean? Are... Cyborg never has a dick. Really? What, what, what do you yeah. mean? What, 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 what is... What? That's part of the lore? Uh, and Well, it was more explicit like in the later comics, but yeah, apparently it's uh, uh, canon that he has no dick. And that's part of his part of his curse or whatever, you know, type of thing? Is yeah. that part of his story? Wow, that's pretty weak. Yeah, uh, that, I actually... Uh, found that out because the Champagne Sharks had a uh, small segment where they discussed that, and the um, I guess the um, I guess you would say the you know the weird racial undercurrents of having a black eunuch as a character. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that's half man, half machine Steel. too, right? See, yeah. Steel would have made more sense to me than Cyber. I've heard of Steel. He's not, he's not really a Justice League character, but. Did, did you ever watch the Shaq um, Steel movie? Oh, it's, a, <laughs> it's it's pretty hilarious. And what's weird is it's actually somewhat faithful to the comic, just like the Watchmen movie. <laughs> you said that you were a fan of the Steel characters comic. Right? Uh, I am a fan of yeah, I do like the Steel character, but the but Shaq, Shaq movie is a is, is, is a piece of shit. That, yeah, yeah. I mean, one because it's Shaq and he can't fucking act, mm. um, and two because it's like goofy and it's trying to uh 
it's trying to mix the more serious like elements of the comics with like this Shaq goofiness. I mean, the one of his uh, partners in the Shaq movie is the was the guy who played Shaft, and it, they play that for laughs. Um, so we probably need to give some perspective here, and don't worry, Gregor, we're getting into books here in a minute. He's, we're talking about comic books, are we not? Yeah, well, and movies, yeah, uh, but but. We, we were talking about this waiting for you, and so we'll kind of transition out here in a little I bit. Mean, I don't mind talking about other things other than books. Okay. Um, still would as long as they're things I like talking about. Okay. Well, are you personally more on Team DC or Marvel? Oh, Marvel. Me too. Yeah, for sure. And there was a time where I would have said DC, but their their track record with movies other than Batman, certain kinds of Batman movies, sucks. The, uh, the the Christopher Nolan uh, Batman movies, you know, are like up here, and all these other incarnations. <laughs> ben Affleck is worse than George Clooney as Batman. Yes or no? Um, um, I would say I no. Don't... Yeah, no, no. Batman and Robin is still the worst Batman movie, even though ben Batman v Superman is up there. Long as Batman, he looks like he's like he's, he's chubby. In that he looks Batman. like the uh, he looks like the Dark Knight Returns version of uh, Batman, but not grizzled enough. Like the Frank, Ma- uh, yeah, like the Frank yeah. Miller version okay. of Batman. So we need to offer some. There are people who may uh, be watching now, or may come to this later on, who don't know the full story of the Snyder Cut. Shocking, I know, but you know, I mean, who knows? It could be family members. It could be, you know. Uh, you know, uh, readers. So, who, who so have you follow. seen that then? Or is that what you're saying? You've seen a Snyder cut or has not been released yet? Yes. No, I have watched it. Yeah. Okay. okay but, so yeah. What's the deal with it? Give us, the, give us the okay. deal and then give us so your thoughts in, about it. In 2018, uh, Snyder was originally pinned, you know, uh, signed on to direct justice league. And what happened? Something happened with his daughter. Uh, no, his son committed suicide. Was it his son? Yeah. Uh, he he relates. Well, then somebody related something back about some something happening between crew members and Joss Whedon or something, right? Well, Joss Whedon was brought on to complete the film because he couldn't complete it because of his son committing suicide. Okay. Yeah, and it had since come out that uh, Joss Whedon. I don't think he's act- he was harassing anyone, but he inveterately cheated on his wife. Apparently. Hmm. So did that have something to do with his son Snyder's son committing suicide or was No, it- no, it had nothing to do with it. It was just it was just like he got me too in, in the process. It's like a tangential type of thing. Mm. We okay. but Oh yeah. yeah, Static Shock, that's a really underrated character they need to that's bring back. That's a milestone character, right? That DC kind of absorbed, inherited, right? I don't know. I think he I don't know if he was originally a comic character or if he was originally like a uh, DC animated universe character. I think he might have been originally like DC Animated Universe, if I remember correctly. Um, I just know DC bought Image, Wildstorm, and Milestone. And uh, I feel like Static Shock might have been in the Milestone. I think he's uh, really thinking hard about that. (laughs) But... um... It, uh, but yeah, he's having problems with his computer overheating. Yeah, so. <laughs> I know. So, did, so has he seen both the original Joss Whedon cut and the Snyder cut? Yeah, he did say he saw the theatrical version, and okay. he said he, he didn't think the Snyder cut was much better. Yeah, I, I've not si- seen either of them. I mean, I'm not opposed to it necessarily, but I'm also not in any way itching to see either of them. Yeah, I'm, and I don't I've, know which one I would even look at, really, to be frank. I've made my um, uh, my my distaste for Zack Snyder pretty well known. So yeah, I uh, guess you're not going to see the Snyder Snyder cut. Yeah, I mean, I, I you mean, know, I don't dislike yeah. him to the degree that you do. I don't necessarily dislike him per se, but I think that uh, he is. He he has his strengths, and he's got some very um, uh, glaring weaknesses as a filmmaker, in my opinion. So yeah, and I just looked it up. Yes, Static Shock actually was originally a milestone media character. And is that what is that just something that DC absorbed at one point, like they did with all the uh, like the question and all those those characters? Yeah. 
it's not the same it's not the same uh cache of characters though right it's a totally different ip warehouse or whatever well they uh they were just basically a, a, a yeah um apparently like uh milestone was like big on um uh minority writers and minority characters um but then you know they couldn't sell enough comics to stay afloat so they sold to dc yeah i never heard of that i mean i've heard of static shock which was a cartoon at one point right yeah it was part of the dc animated universe okay so what what do i do with this uh just point point it into the uh into the fan vent and blow What is it? It's a straw. Like if if uh, if it's dust that's collecting in this in this on the fan, then mm-hmm. that will clean it off and hopefully you know solve the problem. Or okay. if not, it'll be a temporary fix to get the fan to spin. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> but um, oh, he's talking about you're talking about computer fan. I'm, I'm looking at his. Yeah. I'm looking at his. Uh, you know, his room. Yeah, he's not his doing coke. fan. I was like. What? <laughs> What are you talking yeah, about? Yeah, no, he's not doing. He's not doing coke right now, not yet, <laughs> at least. <laughs> but um, yeah, that's a good. Yeah, that's one thing they should do. They should make a new Steel movie. Um, they actually, actually, that's one thing with Justice League. It was a wasted opportunity to do uh, a Reign of the. Well, actually, they could still do that. They could do like a a series of Reign of the Superman movies. You know, have um, right. Steel. Uh, um, I think the Eliminator is what he's called. Um, the cyborg Superman and Superboy, they can write them in. That would be pretty awesome. The Eradicator, that yeah. was his name. Eradicator. Yeah, I th- he was like Never a. Heard of that. He's like a basically like an evil clone of Superman, if I remember correctly. Um, he's like something that the, his computer in the Fortress of Solitude came up with uh, when Superman died. And he sort of came back wrong. He came back as like way more aggressive, mm-hmm. and uh, that's the Eradicator. So, are um, you a DC person over a Mar- over Marvel? Comic wise, yeah. Obviously, the movies. Um, uh, I'm basically just tired of Marvel movies. So, but they're definitely better than the DC movies, which right. are mostly shit. Yeah, they're mostly bad. Yeah, the Marvel ones are consistent, uh, generally, generally consistent. But I think that uh, it, it appears to me that the, the likelihood is that their uh, reign is over and that Endgame is the capstone and that anything comes after this is probably going to yeah. be weak. You know, I mean, I okay. think that that was probably true even before this COVID-19 bullshit, you know, uh, you know, kneecapped them or whatever. Right. But yeah. I think that, well, you know that that's going to that's going to be kind of like the death knell to them is because they, they, there's no momentum uh, and they, they're not having because of what they looked like they were doing was that they kind of knew that they needed to figure out what their footing was after end game. And then their new slate just seemed like throwing everything at the wall to see what was going to stick. And then they were going to try to figure out based on what actually became a hit, you know, to, to determine what path they were going to go down, you know? Yeah, well, it didn't seem like they had a plan for the next phase. I guess is what I'm getting at. That's true. Well, maybe they did, but I think, uh, like you said, COVID nineteen uh, kneecapped them. Uh, right. But I mean, Wandavision seems to be doing well, and uh, oh, so actually, does, that's uh, like the worst. Pr- that's the worst <laughs> thing I've ever seen in my entire it's life. Not good. Yeah. No, it's but, like the, it's I mean, really one of the worst things I've ever seen ever in my entire life. It's so <laughs> insultingly it's, terrible. Yeah. I'm not saying it's good, but it seemed to be. Oh, no, you're popular. not. I'm just telling you that. Yes, it appears that right. It's doing but, well, uh, but it's got to be fake. Right? I mean, you know, and they've got uh, what it's was it? Falcon robot. and the Winter Falcon and the Winter Soldier. That's yeah, that starts uh, soon, I think. Yeah, and you know they're gonna miss the the perfect opportunity to make Flag Smasher a hero like he should be. Is that the guy from Stranger Things that's gonna play Flag what? Smasher? Or... I I don't remember. Okay. You're saying he should be a hero? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, well, he is a hero. Oh, I thought he was <laughs> and, a villain. And, in the but they comics. keep right. Well, he should be seen as a hero, but they write him as a villain, even though he's clearly oh, okay. a hero. What in the I comics? Yes, they write him as a villain. Yes. Yeah. Well, then he's a villain. Then I mean, 
But he's saying flag that he smash. should be a hero. Yes, Flag Smasher should be I a mean, hero. I'll let you. I'll let you have Anarchy <laughs> as a vigilante hero. But I mean, if he's if the guy's written as a villain with mal malicious intent, I mean, I don't know how you. I mean, I think you're you're trying to spin the narrative. It's a, well, they they're they're using Flag Smasher as a you know a foil to Captain America for propaganda purposes. When in, in that story, Flag Smasher is the real hero. Come on. Captain America. No. Captain America is not a villain. He represent he 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 stood against Tony Stark with his privacy invading bullshit in Civil War. Man, you think Tony Stark was the right guy in Civil War? Come on. No. <laughs> anyway, uh, before before it dies again, you know, uh, knock on wood. Uh, so we need to explain and give context for the the uh, Snyder cut thing, so people know what they were talking about before I can you know, smash this thing to bits. So, uh, I guess they use this, the, 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 the suicide of his son as an excuse to, to remove him from, uh, justice, the justice league picture. And I, mean, I think uh, he did it voluntarily. I mean, his son died, right? I mean, I think it was a workaround, right? I don't think it was like an excuse to get him out of there. Okay. Well then why, has Snyder so passionately stood with this release the Snyder cut thing then anyway, I mean, there's, a, there's like a, some kind of a probably just, just, just to sell something, a different version of it. Probably. Okay, I don't so, know. Right. Okay, I don't well, care really. Whether he, yeah, whether he did or not uh, uh, want to go, Joss Whedon inherited the project and, you know, Joss Whedon knows how to grease a, a corporate wheel, you know, uh, real well. So um, he, gave the, stu the, the studio a, a working, you know, uh, Justice League movie uh, with probably more there, up to their, you know, preferences, and it was released, you know, the y the Whedon version, okay, and then all of a sudden, what, like a year or two later, uh, uh, Jason Momoa, who plays Aquaman, and Gal Gadot, who plays Wonder Woman, just started tweeting out, released the Snyder Cut on Twitter, and all of a sudden, this thing catches major steam, and they decide, okay, let's release the Snyder Cut. It seems awfully manufactured to me. Doesn't feel organic. Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, that's, I mean, yeah, I would agree with that. That's the case. Yeah. If anything, they were experimenting to see how social media could, you know. Uh... Yeah, it seems totally manufactured. It does not oh. seem organic. It seems oh. like a bunch of a hooey. Yeah. Uh, and I feel uh, like you're going to say something. What? Yeah, I. Um, it seems like it's a mix of the two i think they're probably um i don't think the studio had much interest in the schneider cut i don't know if they i mean i don't know if they had much faith in it but i do think there probably was like when they saw that there was enough of demand for it they thought well okay let's try this i mean we fuck everything else up <laughs> so so okay so it may or may not be hooey right so what is the difference between the two cuts well, well, one, one thing, is like what, like an hour and a half, two hours. The other, the other one is four hours. The other thing is a four oh, really? hour walking train wreck of disastrous proportions. I'm serious. I don't know how any, anybody can knock the Whedon version after I sat through that. And there are people who are saying, I've watched the four hour version more than once. I've watched it six times. What? I mean, that's probably a I, robot. Even in a, a I mean, I assume that. I assume that one of the advantages it has is that it's consistently Schneider's vision, which, um, it, you know, it, you know, as not good as that often is, you know, is at least consistent and not just, um, you know, this whole like a uh, um, like in the theatrical version where there's all this like somber shit about Superman dying and then all, th them trading these goofy ass weed and esque lines. Right. So. One thing that I was on their side on was like, I don't know why they decided that Steppenwolf would be a better main villain to carry the 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 movie than Darkseid. Because they're, because they're stupid. Steppenwolf is like this, uh, Darkseid's like a uh, lame, cranky yeah, he's, he's or like, some shit. He's his herald or something, right? <laughs> they'd, be better, kind of thing? they'd be better off having Granny Goodness as the main villain. <laughs> so... 
I mean, first, I mean, I don't know what is he. What even is is a, is a Steppenwolf? I know that it was originally a '70s rock band, but what is a? Well, is a, like a that's wolf the name of an it? album as well. I mean, it's a it's a novel as well, right? But I don't know what yeah. it is. Dude. I'm guessing maybe it's a type of wolf that lives out in the the step S T E P P E, maybe right? I don't know. You know that like a play open plane. Oh yeah, yeah, that, I know what you're talking yeah about. that yeah it is. It's a a, it's a canine subspecies indigenous to Central America. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I mean, why they thought Steppenwolf would be more captivating of a villain to carry the movie than Dark Side. Because they thought they were so I, good that it was just going to be a lead up to the big, giant, you know, Dark Side movie, right? They, they just, you know, think that they're going to, you know, you know, just really wet your appetite with this one right and your people are you know, they're going to build up the anticipation for the next one where dark side appears mm-hmm. i'm guessing that's you what know. they were going to do with the rest of the original theatrical cut is try to cut it into a sequel where they actually do fight dark side right yeah which, he doesn't um, get as much screen time as i pictured either to be honest who which, dark side oh he's actually in it yes Oh really? And his CGI isn't totally finished, so he doesn't look as lifelike as say Thanos did in the in his complete rendering. You know, I mean, Steppenwolf like, looked pretty shitty in the theatrical cut, from what I could tell. Steppenwolf looks a lot different in this one too. It's like his armor is all thorned and jagged, like razor wire. Mm. Um, but but it doesn't look like it would actually hurt if you poked yourself. Right. On it. So it, it looks like CGI. And that's a lot. That's a problem with inherent with CGI. I think is that ever since they got away from like Jim Henson studio puppetry and and you know cra- human craftiness and like you know right. sculpting, I think that they they seriously made everything look less realistic when they got away from that stuff. But right, you don't notice it as much with Marvel effects as you do with this shit. So Dark Side, uh, uh, well, the whole point is that Steppenwolf in this one is a, is a more of a bit player, but he volunteers to come forward and un- and 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 be the unity to claim the three mother boxes uh, from Planet Apocalypse that like uh, give them power to take the Earth or some shit. So and, it's like the exact same yeah plot as the uh, Stones. Infinity Stones and all that. But but not carried as well, and that's another thing is that, um, <laughs> wow. you know how Tony Stark or Iron Man uh, has uh, these for uh, these ominous dreams and visions leading up to uh, mm-hmm. Infinity War of Thanos for like six years, right? Right. Well, now Batman is having visions and dreams of a. a oh Batman. God, that was one of the worst parts of Batman v Superman. Yeah, where, Bat, where Bat, uh, Bruce Wayne has a dream within a dream about uh, they a fucking out dark side invasion. They can't right. say that they did not flat out steal this from the Iron Man arc with Thanos in in the the Marvel shared universe. Oh well, yeah, I mean it's so did, shamelessly obvious. So did okay. Lois Lane have anything to do with Dark Side, like they foreshadowed in Batman v Superman? Yes, and. Believe it or not, I think Lois Lane's press pass is in Bruce Wayne's <laughs> war. Uh, I, th- I think that they're lying. Oh, he, did, he just decided to go through uh, Lois Lane's underwear drawer and decided to grab that as well. <laughs> I think the implication is that Bruce and Lois have have like a, you know. Uh, oh, for God's sake. An affair. Like a side fling or something. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, Why? Great. They're just throwing everything at the screen with this, and and like all these people who, I mean, I like I, I whose opinion I trust. Suddenly, it, it's kind of wavering with me because like I'm seeing them praise this thing as a masterpiece, a major victory, and it's like it's not, it's not what you people are saying it is. It's horrible, and 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 Joker is shoehorned in. Okay, at the very end, wearing SWAT gear, and Batman is saying that one day he'll kill him, which is against Batman's code. Okay, to begin with, and uh, Joker and Batman have an uneasy alliance, and it's like we're at the the tail end of the movie. Well, yeah, so I mean the, things that won't may not even ever. I mean, in the in the Snyder universe, apparently Batman has nothing against killing people. Remember, in Batman v Superman, not only does he kill people, he uses a fucking gun. Okay, well, you can't do Kingdom Come then. 
<laughs> I would rather see a Kingdom Come movie than this. I would rather see a Super Friends movie, even with Marvin, Wendy, and Wonder Dog. That oh, would be better than the Schne than what the DC movies are doing right now. Dude, Kingdom Come was the greatest, most realistic DC story I've ever read. I liked Magog. They should have done way more with Magog going forward. But now they just use the cop out. Oh, Kingdom Come happened in an alternate universe that was destroyed by Perpetua and Anti Monitor number six. Jesus. These timelines are horribly co incoherent. They don't know how to restart reality the way Marvel does. And <laughs> anyway. so Obviously, in uh, fucking the, uh, DC movies, there is no fucking timeline. They don't know what they're doing. But there yeah. is that's the problem is that now they're 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 kind of like, the phrase that this is the nightmare timeline with Bruce Wayne having these visions of a of an evil reality where Dark Side's you know uh, uh, you know army wins and overtakes the Earth and there's dead superheroes laying everywhere. And, and like they're 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 calling it the nightmare timeline, K N I G H T mare timeline. Um, it's like can so, we like can we get more in the Joker timeline? That movie was actually good. It was. Oh, yeah, it was so good. Um, but uh, and 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 get this: the same scene where Batman and Joker are having this uneasy alliance. It's the Leto Jared Leto Joker. Yeah, but he looks yeah. like the Joker from Gotham. Which was fucking another train wreck. I'm seeing a pattern here. With I mean, in the from what the screenshots I've seen of him, he looks better than he did look in Suicide Squad, which looks like a a hot topic DeviantArt kid drew his yeah. own like fan version of the like Joker. A, right. It looks like he has a skullet in this one instead of like a flat top. If I'm if if I look like he, I thought he just had long hair. It, it looks more I, like a skullet to me, but it's blurry. It's intentionally blurry. So, because, I remember one, uh, one press photo. Does he have an eye patch? He, does he? I, I don't I think so. Up. I can't even keep and, up with uh, it. It's so all over the place. I don't know how people can praise this as a great movie. Here, here, one, okay, it's long hair. It is long hair, but I mean... In one, uh, in one photo that was like a publicity photo, he looked like Jesus for some reason. Hmm. It's like, why did you? Do, why are you doing this? It's, you already turned Bat Superman into a Jesus figure for some fucking oh, reason. Yeah, I thought it looked like he had an eye patch, but he's just got a hair flying no, into it. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's just, uh, it's just it's, uh, the one the eye is blurry. Yeah, yeah, that looks better, but, but um, yeah, that definitely looks better than uh, you know the, the horrible I, Suicide Squad one. Yeah, but I, uh, I've heard that his performance isn't isn't that great. It's like just I'm pretty sure the only time he shows up is at the very end with this thing that and and in the same scene when Joker leaves it's like Martian Manhunter Manhunter shows up out of random and introduces himself and I mean it's just all these setups for things that may not ever happen it's it's really disastrous it, it reeks of rush job, and I don't know how people... I think people just wanted to see something different because they're bored. And, does, and, uh, yeah. does, Jer does the Jared Leto Joker say, we live in a society? We live in what? We live in a society. Does he say that? I don't think so. Why, what's the... Zero out of ten, will not see. Thumbs down, five thumbs down. What are you saying? I don't understand. What, you don't know that meme of like pictures of the Joker with just the words, we live in a society? Next to it, I uh, don't. No, I've never understand. seen that. I don't understand. That's a huge meme. What does it mean but, though? Like, it's it's like it, it's making fun of people who would like take pictures of the Joker and put quotes on it that are supposed to be like edgy or insightful, but they aren't really saying anything. <laughs> like, we live uh, in a society doesn't say anything. Right, okay. it might sound deep. <laughs> that's the tone that one of his monologues would have. Yeah, okay. But um, then they actually worked that into. Uh, the Joker movie and it actually worked well. Huh. Everything worked with the Joker movie. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, oh, look at it. He's, he's, oh, wow. That, that, yeah, wow. What are you looking at? I was looking at Jeremy's face. Looked like he was frozen oh. there for a second. Oh, okay. So now he, but he wasn't. It's my, 
being perplexed at how this movie is getting all these accolades. And it's, I think if people weren't, I mean, I think it's fake. It's just like that, you know. I don't like, know if it's uh, fake. A lot of people are saying they really like it a lot, just on Facebook. I mean, people are saying they like that um, WandaVision show too, and that's got to be fake. It's got to be robots <laughs> saying that boredom and being Dang. restless, wanting something to invest your time in, because a lot of people are still having but, to, you know, stay home and shit. Um, but but I do that, recall a number of people saying they like Batman v Superman. I'm just like, what are you talking about? What did we watch the same movie? It's like I saw it with a friend of mine, and he fell asleep while watching it. It was so bad. Oh, by the way, Lex Luthor is in this too. But I'm telling uh, you, it's just like it... juggling a bowling pin and a salad bowl, and, <laughs> and, and it just doesn't work. I mean, is it the uh, is it the same like Mark? It? Is it the uh, same uh, Mark Zuckerberg Lex Luthor from Fat Man TV Superman? That little shit with the red hair, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Is he bald in this one, at least? Yes. Oh, he is. Good. And Deathstroke's in it. Uh, Why? I mean, it's just, they threw everybody everything at the wall they possibly could. It's horrible. Did, did Zach know what he was doing? Did, did he saying. think he was making a miniseries or something? I think that's what like, they're, he's trying to, because it's on HBO Max. Like, oh, uh, yeah. If, like He's if, probably angling for, they're probably testing did, waters for a, an ongoing mini a series like, or something. Yeah. Did nobody stop him and say, "Like, dude, this is, this is gonna be this is, scale it back." You're not the Russo brothers or Stan Lee or uh, uh, you're not Kubrick, Gun or yeah, or any of these. I mean, it's just the funny, uh, you know, it's you know, just the, decadence is all it is, right? It's just a sign of decadence. They don't they don't have any care at all for the the, cri uh, the craft and the art of storytelling, right? I mean, well, it's just decadence just would at going least nuts. be. Decadence would at least be uh, like uh, visually and aesthetically interesting. With this, it, Schneider's vision is just like way too, um, way too uh, downbeat for that. Well, I'm not necessarily talking about decadence in a artistic, uh, you know, frame, but you know what I mean as far as self indulgence you know, to, might be a better term. Yeah, maybe maybe that's better. Yeah. Here's the thing, and yeah, I go back to this a lot because when I hear about director's cuts. And, and how I usually end up seeing what the, the studio preferred, you know, and then the director's cut, we get things later, you know, we get later and it's, or this is restored, or this is how the director originally intended it, and 40 extra minutes and it goes in a completely different direction. I think that a lot of times directors do have to be reeled in because, you know, uh, if they have anything left over on their budget, they will go nuts with all these little side paths that that are self indulgent, okay? Like the the uh, the Cabal cut of Nightbreed. I haven't seen it, but just the fact that it has less Doctor Decker in it, and that they have time to have Ann Bobby sing a country music song in a bar, just tells me that I, I'm going to stick with the original version of Nightbreed. You know, uh, where shit actually happens and the monsters, you know, go to war with humans, you know, and whatnot. Well, uh, I mean, I'm I'm with you, you that know? sometimes it's probably cool to have a director's cut and i mean it's, it's sometimes you know the 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 directors need to be reined in and sometimes the studios are dumb right but i, I, mean, I can't david lynch's inland empire and i see the same thing a total mess that that i know, disagree with that i think inland empire inland empire is a great experience i think mulholland drive is his magnum opus i think inland empire was just i would agree with that but I, st I still think inland empire you i don't think you can really compare the two i think uh Inland Empire is far more of a, uh, uh, I'd say, experience than it is like a narrative movie. Right. It didn't I'm really not, I've not seen the entirety of, of it. No. Well, I felt like Inland Empire didn't really have any kind of personality to it. Instead, it was David Lynch being self-indulgent and having fun testing out the uh, the digital video format. Is that what he is? That what it is he's doing now? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Like the rabbits were cool and uh, there were some other interesting elements. But for the most part, I feel like when David Lynch has to keep it somewhat, you know, um, down to earth, you know, like like by one, you know, tethered to the earth by one, you know, uh, anchor even, you know, it's enough to for him to pull it off. But um, I, I go back to this over and over and this is the latest example. Sometimes the studios do know what they're talking about. You know, 
Um, I mean, sometimes they do and I mean, sometimes they don't, right? But, I mean, you can't say that, you know, the director's but, cut's always it, the worst cut, well, right? Right. You know, well, one of the best things that uh, I heard in regards to that is um, it was someone who uh, – was like uh, doing a review of like a video game or something, and they noted that um, when it comes to auteurs, there are people like um, Stanley Kubrick, who was a genius. There's a fuzzy butt. There's a fuzzy butt. Um, huh. <laughs> but uh, there are people like uh, Stanley Kubrick, who yes, did do things like make people do like three hundred uh, takes of the same scene, and that can be done by a uh, auteur with a specific. Uh, vision, but it can also be done by an incompetent idiot who has no idea what they're doing. Right, or a sadist, or both. <laughs> yeah. Well, Kubrick was definitely a sadist, a, a sadist yeah. too. The way he yeah. treated uh, uh, Shelley Duvall on, uh, you know, The Shining was pretty um, reprehensible. Right. So I don't like the idea. I mean, I generally don't like this fifty different cuts crap. You know what I mean? Like with the uh, Blade Runner, especially is like the prime example. You know, like nobody knows what that movie, you know, it's like everybody's seen a different version of the movie. How can you have a coherent conversation about it? There's eight different cuts of a movie, you know? But I, uh, I heard that, um, like, I think an example of that where the studio was like dead wrong was the, um, was the, with Brazil. They wanted to do a, a cut of it where the guy's dream was actually the ending. Oh yeah. I mean, it's terrible. Yeah. That would have been stupid. And, and right. Terry Terry Gilliam's original ending is glad that that stayed. Um, yeah. Terry Gilliam's cut of what? Brazil. It's Brazil. Oh. Yeah, I've, I have not seen the either version of Brazil. Or uh, look at the look at the. Well, I don't know. Was the was the original cut after, actually ever released? I mean, the one you're talking about, um, the studio cut. This, um, I think it, it um, had like a limited release, but. Um, I actually don't know. Yeah, I kind of think it um, was. I think it was like a battle behind the scenes that was, you know, yeah, kind of thing. I can imagine that. But um, yeah. like, you know, what should really, really scare you about the Schneider cut? Like, make you piss your pants, terrified, you know, and and want to stock up on food and, and ammo <laughs> and uh, hide down in the basement. That Affleck was still Batman in this. Yes. N no, the, it, I mean for the future. Mm. Uh, it means that Schneider might get his auteur license back, oh. and he really wants to make an adaptation of The Fountainhead. Oh, wow. Head for the hills, ladies and gentlemen. What is his connection to that? Uh, what does he, he see? He just likes it. He, he loves Ayn Rand, apparently, because of course he does. Yeah, I mean, I just don't see how that could be really good. I, I, it's like Schneider has like literally never uh, directed any dramas unless you want to count Sucker Punch, which I don't. Um, All right. It, and it, I don't. If you've ever read the Fountainhead book, it is literally just a bodice ripper romance with a lot of like pro capitalist bullshit in it. That's what yeah, it I've is. Not read it. I've not read it, so maybe it could be good. I don't know, but I mean, I, I doubt it. I mean, it just seems not like really. it's. You know, I don't know. It just seems like when you're, you're, you're when you're doing something that's so heavy-handed on the messaging that it's probably going to be shitty. You know. Yeah, I, I'm it. trying to imagine like that book in like Zack Snyder's uh, style, and I, I just can't picture it. Like about, I can imagine him spending like I don't know half an hour on the demolition scene. That's, that's I, I've not read it, so I don't even know what that means. But oh, there's a scene yeah. where uh, a guy, where the ar main architect, is mad because the main one of the main characters who's an architect is mad because uh, his vision for a building was compromised. So when the building gets built, he sneaks in and demolishes it. Oh, uh, okay. Holy shit! What's the matter? What's going on over there? Huh. Hey, you okay? Damn it! What happened? He's probably nothing. burning. He said nothing? Nothing! Huh. <laughs> okay, he's got something going on over there that's uh, embarrassing, potentially. Maybe he shed himself? <laughs> shed himself? I don't know. 
<laughs> yeah, Jeremy shit himself on the stream. <laughs> Jeremy shit himself live. Jeremy shit it out his doo doo ass. Yeah, he, he's sharding <laughs> on the internet. <laughs> yes, uh, I, I hope you uh, all clip that, ladies and gentlemen. Put it up yes. on your own YouTube pages. Oh, for sure. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, so you have have you seen the Justice League movie, like the theatrical cut one? Is did we talk about that? Have you seen it yet? Unfortunately, yes. Okay, I've not I've not seen it. It looks so bad that I I just didn't watch it. I mean, this <laughs> looks terrible. Bad. Yeah, but, it's a confused mess. It's it doesn't, and of course, like you, like Jeremy mentioned, the villain is bullshit. It's just stepping yeah. off this like fourth tier oh, yeah. villain well yeah and, and the effects for that look just terrible i mean it just looks it, really bad you look yeah. like a video game from 2005 yeah yeah i mean it just looked awful i mean as far as the effects for that character yeah i didn't i had no desire to see it I, I i may have had even less desire to see well let me take that back after i heard about more about uh wonder woman 1984 and saw like the opening scene, you know, you know, more, the more I saw of it, the least I wanted, the less I wanted to see it, you know, 1984, but the first commercial they had for it made it look at least intriguing, you know, but then the more that they exposed of it, the, 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 the more it looked just ter entirely terrible. Have you, have you seen that Wonder Woman 1984? No. <laughs> yeah. No. I, mean, I won't, I won't see that. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna bother with that. It's just like, you know, the first yeah. one was was decent, and but as soon as the like reviews started rolling in for Wonder Woman 1984, everybody hated it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it looked. I mean, everything that I've seen of it looks just amazingly bad. Yeah. Like they had a apparently the villain is a Chitara, which is not a bad choice, but the CGI for her was just oh, it's awful. Yeah, I saw snaps out. Yeah, I saw some of that. Yeah, it looked terrible. Yeah. 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 It's, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think that, I think that these people that are making these films are just so far removed from reality that they have no idea what they're doing. You know, they live in an entirely different universe and have no route to the real world. And they just make this completely nonsensical bullshit and they I mean, don't even know they're doing it. Right. They don't even know that they're making total crap. I mean, maybe part of it is that they have a, a hand tied behind their back because I'm pretty sure the studio is telling them to do this and that, and you know that they don't control the budget for the CGI and so forth. Yeah, I mean, it's I guess it could be potentially some of that as well. I mean, I think it's you know, I guess they, they, it, there's a, a whole confluence of things that are uh, impacting the, their ability to actually make a coherent film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I th yeah, uh, let me look up who actually directed the Wonder Woman movie because I actually don't know. It was the, what, the same woman who directed the first one, but she was a writer on the second one. Oh, <laughs> let's see. So that's allegedly oh. part of the problem. Huh. Yeah, so um, Patty Jenkins. Yeah. Um, and yeah, she directed both, so pff, I, I don't know, maybe... Uh, one of the uh, cats pissed on the bed. That's what, I, that's what that was, damn it. Oh, oh. <laughs> Fuck it. Oh. I know which one, too. He's out of here. He's out of this room. Uh. <laughs> huh. I, I, liked it. I liked it better when he shat himself. Hey, Phoenix, yeah. how are you? I think, hey. I think you all brought up a lot of troubling concerns about media. What, my yeah. cat gets in the bed? No, no, no. <laughs> Yeah, that's well, a very pressing concern. <laughs> so is, uh, so is yeah. the fact that uh, Zack Snyder may potentially get to make his adaptation of fucking the fountainhead i don't think he will actually get that i mean maybe for like uh netflix or something he might get I mean, the money to do it they, there they let him make fucking sucker punch so <laughs> yeah but somebody that was should have off. stopped yeah i, I don't and know yeah i mean have, yeah that that movie should have been should have been uh strangled in the cradle it was so bad yeah, sucker punch yeah, yeah, yeah. It had some it had some good parts, but generally it was really terrible. Yeah, I mean, but the good parts were just kind of like, oh, that's a cool special effect, right? I mean, you know, yeah, I mean, pretty like, much. That's a, yeah, I mean, it was just it was like a, a you know a demo reel for cool special effects that would be cool if they were actually in a good movie. You know, yeah. 
I'm yeah. I'm pretty fried from uh, thinking about what even makes like quality art nowadays. I think you're taking the, that rejection way too personally, dude. I no don't rejection. What are you talking about? It, it was. It wasn't even I a big deal. Bring that up. Yeah, it like wasn't even a big deal. It just happened. And yeah, I, you fake book it about happens. like how you don't. No, that that's because of my. That's because of just stuff in my life. Okay. Okay. Yeah, like I know because I made the quote about like being in hell, but it's because like with just my life being the way that it is, you know, sometimes I end up in darker moments and my mood dips. And the best way that I express it is through like, it's kind of like mythological language that I've kind of alluded to sometimes. Like it's not, it because it's a way of like dealing with the feelings instead of just like pretending that they aren't there. Yeah. Like finding a way of creatively expressing like how you feel without it being like just a rant or like just yeah. like I, I try to make it poetic in some way. Um, yeah. What, what Phoenix is talking about, I'm pretty, it's, um, uh, I think Scorsese put it the best. It's the idea of making uh, a work or a cinema or cinematic experience versus making content. Right. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't necessarily disagree with what Scorsese was saying. You know, and but everybody jumped on his ass for it. You know. I mean, I know what it's, you're talking about. I don't know if everybody else does, but basically. No, I, I don't have a context for that. Yeah. It, I guess Scorsese basically came out and said that like the Marvel films aren't cinema. They're more like a, akin to a uh, amusement park uh, experience, a spectacle, uh, not necessarily a cinematic experience where he's trying to draw a distinction between uh, like, like you said, uh, Ben, like a, a complete, you know, artistic, like a, like a complete, what a singular artistic vision, right. Rather than something that's uh content that is, uh, what thrown together to please, uh, you know, uh, various de different demographics to get the asses in the seats, uh, more of a, you know, a, a almost the film in itself is a marketing, uh, is marketing rather than just the, you know, the marketing outside of it gets people in, you know? Well, I, I think that, um, like, I, I really I really worry about, like, the idea that these kinds of stunts make art less accessible for people. Like, what what, what do you mean specifically? Well, I'm trying to think of how to explain this. Like, I, I actually, I've heard people describe it very well. Like, there's too many superhero movies. It seems like a simple statement, but what comes out of that is, like, why is no one, why is no one in a position to do something else, something that isn't a franchise or... And and granted, I'm not asking that. I'm asking that somewhat rhetorically because I think the answer is like it really shareholders what people yeah. want to watch. But I'm I'm wondering about the distinction of like art versus um, you know, this stuff that continually gets produced. You know, and it's not even that it's bad. It's just I I don't know. I think I think after a while it becomes really empty because no one like wants to you know uh, take risks on any kind of content. But then that's kind of what I'm saying is the difficulty is that. You know, like you could work at your craft, but that doesn't mean that, you know, like things would turn out the way that you expect it to. Like the idea that because I'm reading a book right now on like writing and it seems that like this is part of the difficulty with being a writer is that there's a lot of cynicism about it. Like, you know, that it's more important that you assimilate into culture instead of like defining your own culture through like your art. And I think that some of that is intentional because I think most people feel that their art isn't necessarily like going to be as engaging as a Marvel movie. And I, th but I think that's the confusion is like people are still making good art, but it's just that it doesn't usually, at least when we're talking about like film, it, it doesn't usually get like recognized, I think, uh, because we have these like, force prescriptions of what's supposed to be good or at least what's marketable and and i think a lot of it is because just the cynicism about well you're making art no one's making art you know like that kind of thing so well i, yeah, I, I want to just take uh, a step back real quick and say i'm not taking anything away from the actual like you know artists who are hired to put these things together right like these guys that do the graphic design and the all the various different you know elements of these films are, are masters at what they're doing right like but you know uh the it's you not actually, you actually think that that's interesting because that's what i was trying yeah. to figure out too you think yeah. that they actually like do a good job at it then 
I think that, like, yeah. Or like in terms of the, yeah. Like the costuming and stuff or, okay. you know, yeah. uh, you know, uh, the design of what the, uh, what do you want to call it? Uh, the production design. A lot of these things are, are just fantastic. Right. But there, there's a lot of them are empty, you know, as far well, as. Here, here's, a way, well, here, here's a way to put it too, is it's like, why do we have this model surrounding like the only way that you can succeed as an artist is to sell a million tickets for a show. Like that to me seems to set the standard of what we actually value. And I think that's why these things become really difficult because as you're saying, you do get talented people actually making good things, but it's in a context that is driven by market like market um, incentives. And I just don't think that you can, this is always the, this is always the problem is that people do actually justify like this kind of idea because they say that, you know, people are still making like people are still succeeding doing art, but I think the difficulty is it's like, yeah, but what does that mean for people that don't necessarily fit into that kind of marketing incentive? And I don't think that we should look at it in terms of like, you have to like sell a certain amount of copies of a book or something, because I just don't think that's the point, but that's the way that we've structured the whole thing. Okay. But um, well, if, one you of the- can't move that, if you can't make that kind of, uh, you know, uh, track record for yourself then you can make movies but you don't get the budget you want that's how it works i mean well, that, that's that, i mean and even that could be somewhat reasonable because it's like dude at least you can make a movie like yeah. I, i'm definitely not like being too critical of anything in the sense that like i'm glad that i can do what i i'm glad that i can write like i think that that is always going to be the most important thing i'm just i guess I, i've mentioned this probably before too much but i just i do find it hard with like the the pressures that you feel just from like you know, like, you know, for me, so, you know, I, I'm finally back at work after the, after the, the pandemic and that feels good, but it's like, I'm only doing these things because I have to. And like, it just like messes with me sometimes. Cause it's like, I'm glad I'm doing this and that there are these things happening, but I do really care about my art too. And I just don't know how to make that like viable. Have you, yeah. Have you um, heard about what's <laughs> going on with have uh, any of you heard about what's going on with uh, with Tom Six with his new movie, uh, Yonania Club, or I think it's called? Wait, wait, the, the guy who did Human Centipede? Yeah, have you heard what's going on? No, with his what, what is he trying to make? Oh yeah, that that well, yeah that that movie looks great. What's going what? on with that? He can't get any distributors to pick it up. It's wow. like the people who uh, did the Human Centipede; they aren't picking they it up. Uh, nobody is. No thanks. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, is it's it, not as fast. Is it, is it the, yeah, go ahead. Well, apparently it is. It's uh, it actually Content does look related. a lot better than uh, yeah, than the um, than the um, than the human centipede movies, but uh, nothing's better than human centipede movies. <laughs> but apparently, what's going on is uh, like I guess it's more socially conscious, like it's about a club of like upper class women who literally masturbate to people's uh, misfortunes, which includes yeah. like atrocities, uh. And things that is, like that. Uh, there's a term for that German. Uh, what is it? Yeah, shout, shout and Freuden. That's yes. um, that's is like, that what it is? yeah, that's um, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, yeah, it's extreme form of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, he apparently, because of the content and because of the social messaging and all of that, he can't get anybody to pick it up at, to to distribute it. And that's and, pretty you know, sad. He, he can't, you know, obviously he can't afford to do it himself. He can't get Netflix to buy it. He can't get any streaming services to buy it. Um, and he obviously can't just put it on the internet for free because he has investors. So right. he's kind of like an, at a uh, at a crossroads with it. Well, he needs to well, talk to Drew Stepik. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's I a good example. If Drew <laughs> Stepik, if Drew, if he, I, I doubt that Drew has the budget to actually be able to pay <laughs> A reasonable price but if he if he did that would be badass yeah i mean i i feel like that's a good example of kind of because I'm, I'm definitely not saying that like you know it's not worth it because i i do think it's worth it and and like the sacrifices are fine it's just that i think the way that we talk about it gets skewed because there are a lot of pressures well i mean you know. but you're you know you're letting you know i think you're somewhat making the mistake of letting this outside world determine your your uh, measure of success, right? Well, I mean, yeah, no, and that's fair because I, I really yeah. struggle with that because, like, I realized that, like, I, 
like even though like I, so if we make the distinction of like intrinsic versus extrinsic like i think i very much am focused on like intrinsic aspects of things but i think and and granted i'm not saying that i have this figured out but i think what's interesting is sometimes when, when we talk about these things like i realize why am i so influenced by these kinds of things and i actually don't know what the reason is because it doesn't actually motivate me in my daily life um it, it, it doesn't and so it's confusing that like you can still internalize things that you don't even believe if that right. makes sense well yeah, yeah i mean because you're yeah. you're entirely steeped in the milieu of it right i mean it's hard not to yeah. uh be you know to think that way when when you know the entire culture in which you live thinks that way right i mean your yeah. your, your, art, your artistic um uh, vision or product have have no value unless somebody could see that on netflix or if it's in an actual bookstore right i mean that's generally how the culture that you're living in thinks of it right yeah well no and, and uh, Gregor, i've actually been like really interested in your approach because it seems that like you have a very late actually you you and ben like you have a very laid back idea of like what the art is like you and and like the fact that you're willing to do these things and not be influenced by those pressures is pretty cool because like I well, like I'm not saying I'm not entirely influenced by it. I mean, I mean, yeah. genuinely, I try to write a book. I mean, I I try to write a book that has the same level of I don't know, like you know, I, I wanted to write a book that propels somebody through the story, right? Like a pop fiction book, but with content that you're generally not going to find in a pop a pop fiction book, right? So, I am somewhat influenced by um you know what is considered to be the uh what the norm of fiction construction nowadays which is to write something that propels you through the book right so i'm not entirely um you know well, but, i mean all you're, doing that. With, but all you're doing with that is just increasing the accessibility which i think is completely fine like you right. do want people to be able to connect <laughs> you know um <laughs> Hey, am I still uh, picking up? Do I sound uh, like... I assume wow. that your cat's fuzzy butt <laughs> is muffling the, uh, the microphone. He unplugged it, yeah. Is it uh, sound all right? Well, you sound pretty muffled, so you might want to plug that back in. Uh, get down, Charlie. Honey. <laughs> well, I want to watch fuzzy. that show with you, Frank. <laughs> My husband is too big. Yeah, that's, coming, that's what it's... Um, you know, that's I'm coming what, to Jersey what, to watch that with you, Frank. Yeah, that's what we were um, kind of talking about between, you know, um, uh, work and content. Like, a show like that, that's just going to be content. Um, you would think. But, and, like, the thing with Netflix is it does give an opportunity to, uh, like, uh, various, like, more artsy films that may not have been seen otherwise to be seen. Right. But right. most people are not going to see them because the algorithm on Netflix is not going to recommend it to them. Right. You have to like actually dig to find those kind of things. Yeah, that's true. Like, uh, I actually didn't learn about this until now, but, um, what about now? Orson... Hey, that sounds that sounded good. good. Okay. Can't see you, but it sounds good. <sighs> yeah, but that's actually... fine. I'm totally fine with not seeing you. <laughs> I actually didn't learn about this until, uh, until this year, but back in 2018, um, Netflix, in association with um, some other people, actually finished um, Orson Welles' final film and released yeah, I it. Yeah, I just read and, about that recently, too. I want to see that. And it's like, this happened back in 2018, and like, even though Netflix tried to push it, there was like no interest in it. There was no hype. It was like, this is a man who was playing, considered... Are you playing the, the YouTube live stream, like, with the volume up? Phoenix? Um, um, if you are, can you turn it down? I didn't know. I I forgot that I had that open. Yeah, just turn okay. it down because you can no, still hear it. Off. Okay. No, it, I closed out of it. Okay. Yeah, I was but, surprised yeah, that was, I not hear heard about that at the time too, Ben. I was like, what? That came who, out. Yeah. Yeah. This was a man who was considered one of the greatest uh, actors, filmmakers in American history, and his final long unfinished film comes out, and there's no not a peep about it. It's it's bizarre. What do you think the reason is? It's uh, I don't know. It's it's uh like we like I said before the idea of uh content versus work and there's just so much content that even Netflix trying to trying to push this like nobody who wasn't in the know 
knew about it. I had a guess. There yeah, was- I didn't know about it until like a week ago or something, right? Like, it, it's amazing, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you said that was back in 2018. I had a guess yeah. that yeah. was supposed to be coming on like an hour ago and they never showed up. I don't know what that's and, – and Regina or Ann – I mean, I know Regina's pretty yeah. consistent at like – but but I mean, I figured Ann would have dropped in by now unless she'd get bad reception in, in uh, where she is right now. But anyway, Did go ahead. to the guest? Yeah. I mean, he, then, he gave me the thumbs up that he would he would be here, and uh, it's been an hour. <laughs> so, uh, who was the guest? Well, I don't want to say until. Oh, I thought I thought you, I thought Ben just said. Okay, I'm sorry, I was nope. chewing. Type it. Type it in the private chat. Yeah, no, I I find all of it fascinating, and you know, I I definitely don't want to okay. be a downer, but I I think that there's a lot of interesting conversations to be had about it. Because, like, I, you know, I, I think that ultimately the creation is the creation of art in any way, I think, makes it makes the world, I think, more tolerable, which is like actually probably a quote. Um, and it, it does make it better. And, you know, I think that's why people do it, because they find meaning in it. And that's the point. You know, I, I don't know where a lot of these pressures come from, but like the art itself is really great for the most part, I think. So. Yeah. And, you know, where most of us here obviously are, are writers. And even though like our fiction probably uh, Phoenix here, I'd say yours tends to be more literary, whereas uh, Gregor um, is definitely more on the, um, uh, I'm trying to, uh, I guess, um, quote pulp side of things. Um, and I, I like to think my work is like somewhere in the middle. Um, yeah. But I think the, one of the things is like American culture just doesn't uh, value writers very much. Like, um, mm-hmm. Maybe if we, uh, I don't know, maybe if we all lived in France or something, we'd be able to make a semi-decent living, but we don't. You, th- you think it would actually be better in France? Well, France, actually, you know, they, writers, you know, uh, they have a, much more of a literary culture there. You know, they... Uh, Since the 1400s, uh, at least. Yeah, definitely. You can see why um, Anne would want to live there. Um, and, you know, even, even and like a, a lot of the, quote, like, literary stars become like actual like mainstream celebrities in a sense like even like michelle welbeck um even though he's a a lot of people find him repulsive but um why well because he's very his books are very um pessimistic and very uh angry and very ugly that's the h-o-e-l-l-e-b-e-c-q or something right yeah okay I mean, his yeah. first book is basically about a uh, computer programmer um, having a mental breakdown over like 150 pages. So I'm curious, what do, what do you think Americans value in art, just in um, general, or if they do at all? But well, right now we we value a lot of spectacle. I think. Okay, that's fair. You know, with the Marvel movies and such. No, and I find that interesting because, like, I think the culture does influence what we actually end up writing. You know. Um, in interesting ways. I think some of which might even be like inadvertent and indirect. Cause it's like, if, if for instance, if like you're like working in America as a writer and like, we've kind of established that part of the culture might include like valuing spectacle. It would be really interesting to think about what that means and what you actually end up producing. Like how it, how it, aff- how it affects like what you actually write. Yeah, I think with a lot of like mainstream writers, it makes them write with an eye to, um, you know, get, having their work made into a movie. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. It like, becomes it becomes like the goal, right? That that you want to write a book that is going to be um, attractive to the gods in Hollywood to turn it into a film, right? It's almost as if it's a uh, what a stepping stone to the real thing or something right the real goal you know which is yeah. kind of sad in my opinion i mean i i personally think that if anybody's truly serious about writing a novel that they should try that their goal should be to write a novel that cannot be filmed right that 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 the they take it full advantage of the of the conventions of the novel and the and the scope that you can uh, have in a novel, and, and 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 try to write a novel in such a way that it it cannot be experienced wholly it, it adapted into another form. Like House of Leaves is a uh, one rare example, I think, where it not only came out, it became like a hit. 
Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, I would say that that's a pretty a pretty good example. Uh, I don't think I particularly want to read it, but I I would say that yes, they that you could not really probably effectively adapt that to film, and, and you would lose a lot of it in the translation. So. So I know I know there are a lot of branches to like horror fiction and like where it ends up going, and like I realize I've mentioned Stephen King a lot on this show, which I don't do intentionally. But I've been thinking about like this like I think you do it intentionally. I do it intentionally, yeah, because I don't care. Well, I think it's because he's like, um, you know, he was such. Some people consider him appropriate. Yeah, yeah. um, In a way, he is, but and but he also I think. The way reason he managed to get how where he is is because he's like one of the few like rags to riches stories that actually is seems not bullshit. Yeah, yeah, he yeah, actually did like genuinely be true. Yeah, I mean, like he lived in a fucking trailer, barely making right. ends meet when Carrie got published. Uh, yeah, right. that, and even that was inspiring to hear about. Well, I was just gonna say, you know, because yeah, there are different branches of horror. Uh, but I, I mentioned Stephen King because I think he also, speaking of balances, he has that rare balance, at least for me, not all of his work, you know, but some of it where it's like, you know, I just read Lord of the Rings and I was like, I can't do this. I ended up reading it, but I was like, I don't know if I get this right. and because because the language was so dense and just what he was doing with the words and uh, the, con- the uh, not concepts because it wasn't philosophical, but. But yeah, like he was doing all of these things and I realized, you know, I'd actually rather read Stephen King. So it's that weird balance of like entertainment versus like yeah, entertainment and brain candy versus like wanting something a little bit more in depth. Like I, I enjoy Stephen King more than uh, something like Infinite Jest, right? Like Infinite Jest influenced me a lot, but it's not as enjoyable. Um, at least the first time around. I mean, they say to read it again, but which was the point. But I just, I find that interesting that in this balance, it was like, oh, like it's because it's actually interesting. Like, well, I mean, one I think, of the, yeah, go ahead, Ben. Uh, one of the interesting things about Lord of the Rings is while it was, you know, popular when it was published, like in the late 30s, early 40s, I think, yeah. um, it was, it, like I said, it was popular at the time, but it didn't like really take off into a cultural phenomenon until the hippies started reading it and fell in love with it. Right. Okay. Well, and that's kind of what I mean is like, you know, I respect these books and I, again, I really believe that. The point is to expand your range to see what's out there and that's what i love doing but i also realize that there are certain books that have done it more for me than others and that's just weird for me to think about because i kind of want it to be more explorational but there's just some things that resonate with me more and i don't know why and i think that's kind of the puzzle it's like someone was once berating dostoevsky and then i and then i thought of your connection ben of oh but they're american too so of course they don't like dostoevsky <laughs> like not just because he was Russian, but because his writing was Russian. <laughs> so, and it kind of makes sense, honestly, because it's like, yeah, I don't know if I have time for Dostoevsky. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of this one meme that I saw. It was like, um, French writers, I will die for love. American writers, I will die for freedom. <laughs> Russian writers, I will die. Yeah. Right. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is funny. I mean, I've, I haven't read any of the major Russian writers. I've only read, like, science fiction books or yeah. fantasy books that were written by Russians. You know, like, um, oh, what's that one? Uh, Roadside Picnic. Roadside Picnic, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. About, that. about the uh, the alien, like, episode that... Um... Yeah, there's, like, this alien territory on this on earth right that's you know kind of like i mean it's been taken over by aliens or polluted by aliens or something and you know and they send expeditions in there or whatnot and it's all weird and Road people get mutated written with the idea that some alien force you know would like come through an area and not even know that they had damaged it for right. other life forms because they're they're so much they're so uh, alien right it's just yeah. like it's not even you know, it's <clears throat> it's like not even they don't even know, right? There were nothing to them. Have you? Uh, they just passed you, through and polluted this area of the world, right? So, I mean, that's a great that's a great book. Uh, it was made into a movie that I've not seen that looks like, as far as like visually, absolutely stunning. Uh, and I think a whole bunch of people ended up dying uh, because they filmed it in all these like industrial wastelands in Russia or something like that. <laughs> what was the book? What was the movie called? Did you say it? 
picnic at hanging, picnic at hanging rock there was also a stalker movie with stalkers what i'm talking about okay well yeah. i thought picnic at hanging rock was what was based on roadside picnic but yeah and stalker stalker is what i'm talking about that's the one that's that's based on roadside picnic okay. yeah and that's a good that's a good novel and then uh i've read um a couple books by this husband and wife team uh one's called the scar but it's not you know i mean it's just mm. a not the China Mieva one, but that was a very good book, you know. So, and I, and it's one thing that I think that like uh, Edward Lorne, when he was on here talking about reading a fantasy book, that the the underlying culture is different than your own. It it, it, it makes it more enjoyable, more interesting, right? Like it's not uh, based on you know ancient Western civilization underpinnings, right? It's based on Russian you know uh, historical underpinnings, right? And they base a a fantasy built that on top of that makes it even more fantastical, I guess, and more, more interesting. So, uh, I, I, uh, I very highly recommend, uh, the master and Margarita. That's a really great book. Is that a fantasy novel? Uh, it's, sort of, it's a sort of fantasy. It's more magic realism. I'd say okay, it is. So about, like, it, it does have fantastical elements in it, but it's not yeah. like, uh, okay. It's a, I mean, it's about the, uh, the devil going to Moscow to throw a party. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I have it on my Kindle. I've not read it, but I think part of it's because it's like one hundred thousand pages long or something like that. It's, it's, it's massive, is it? I think it's only like three or four hundred pages at the most. It's not very uh, long. I, I thought it was like a thousand pages, but maybe I'm wrong. No, that's a pretty reasonable length. Oh, okay. All right. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll take another look at it. So, because I did. I mean, I liked what what Russian work I've, I've read. I, I I think I tried to read um, one of the Dostoevsky books, but I, I just couldn't get through it. So, I mean, it's understandable. Yeah. Another another one I'd recommend. It's more of a like short story, but uh, Anton Chekhov's um, "The Night Before Christmas." That's a really great story. Um, it's a um, it's basically um, about uh, the devil going to uh, to a small village in Russia and uh, stealing the moon, and uh, ah. It, it causes a massive snowstorm and in between this and then there's like a romantic story about you know a guy trying to find the perfect present for his uh for the girl he's in love with and so he ends up like capturing the devil to um uh you know to get him to uh cooperate with him to find the perfect present so what collection is that in um, I actually didn't read it in a collection. I read it as like a uh, chapbook single that the oh, okay. New Directions put out. You could probably find it like that. Okay. And what was the – wait, you mentioned two books? Okay, Master and Margarita. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah, the only other Russian book I can think of that I read was uh, Tolstoy's The Kingdom of God is Within You, which is um, sort of uh, religious and political theory. Um it was a heavy inspiration to uh, Mahatma Gandhi, so it's probably worth reading on that grounds. Um, okay. I did try to read War and Peace, but um, when I tried to read it, um, I barely got through it before it was due back at the library, and then I couldn't, uh, and then I couldn't renew it because it had a hold on it. So I kind of gave up on it. Uh, but, I did okay. buy, but I did buy a copy, so I am going to read the whole thing at some point. Yeah, I've got it too. I I bought it not that long ago. In fact, so I was. For some reason, I thought well, it was. It seems like a lot of people say it's like the one of the best novels ever written, or a month the best, or something, right? So I was like, okay, well, let me see. You know, depending on who means. you talk to, depending right. on who you talk to. I remember well, right. there's um, there's a uh, Lewis Black um, comedy routine where he's uh, talking about the tax code, and he's mm. he um, mentions uh, how long the uh, the tax code is, like it's thousands and thousands of pages. Uh -huh. And he says, if I wanted to be bored by this much unreadable Drek, I'd read War and Peace four times. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I have no idea. You know, I'll, I'll give it a whirl, right? So we'll see if I can. If I can yeah, I did. It, you know? I did like what I read of it. It's you know, it is a lot of like, um, you know, uh, concerns about how the uh, upper class of Russia lived and things like that. But uh, mm -hmm. it's kind of interesting. Right. I think I think War and Peace is definitely worth reading, but again, I think it's the whole thing of like what's actually interesting. I mean, it depends right. on your criteria for reading is, and like if you know, I think many people do like exploring different things. I'm sure Gregor, yeah. but I think I would say that it is very dense. Um, right. Would you expect? 
but I guess I'm more intrigued by the idea that like I liked that book a lot when War I read and Peace, it. you said? Yeah, War and Peace. But like yeah. I liked it for different reasons than like the Talisman or some fantasy novel. Right. Right. It's right so interesting. But yeah, I mean, I'm 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 enjoying uh, you know the La Morte Arthur, but it's not like I don't enjoy it for the same reasons that I enjoy a Clive Barker novel, yeah. right? You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. You know, or like, you know, like I mean, and I've set it aside, you know, for last week or so because I'm, you know, more intrigued and in other books that I've you know gotten into take me away with them, right? You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. You know, and I generally prefer a narrative that that sweeps me up and takes me away with it. Right. I mean, that's, that's part of what I love about books is when you find one that genuinely hooks you and you can't wait to return to that world, you know? Yeah. Yeah. The, <laughs> I mentioned before that I really enjoyed Ulysses. Um, and I, I like, a, like a, you kind of mentioned, like I, I definitely uh, enjoy those for much different reasons than I enjoy like Jim Thompson. Right. But I actually can like uh, find, um, uh, literary books that I could compare Jim Thompson to. Um, like it's it's probably because I read them in a uh, very close to each other. But um, I actually found a lot in common with uh, Jim Thompson's themes in uh, The Killer Inside Me, and with uh, Richard Yates's Revolutionary Road. Both of them were very heavily focused on the, um, you know, on this uh, uh, pull that a lot of people in the mid in mid-century America felt between uh, what was expected of them, Puritan values and things like that, and what they actually wanted out of life. And right. the difference is uh, Richard Yates explored it through a, uh, a family drama, basically. And wait, wait, by uh, Tai Pei? Tai what? But I mean... Uh, no, 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 no. Tao Lin did write a book called Richard Yates, but Richard Yates is an actual like author <laughs> who wrote books. But uh, and and Talon is very different. Um, the uh, and you know Jim Thompson, like I said, he he explores the same themes except for us through a sort of like quote crime cult. noir. Yeah, yeah, crime noir. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> it's funny because I actually listened. I started listening to this podcast called Death Sentence, which is a uh, podcast about um, uh, uh, books and metal music. Um, huh. And they actually did a review of. Uh, Talon's um, Talon's um, book trip, and they really hated it. Um, at one point, they said, "I really hope that Talon uh, takes so much acid that he turns into uh, that he turns into a, a glass of orange juice and gets knocked over." <laughs> <laughs> hey, so uh, hey, before I forget, Jeremy. Out? Yeah, yeah. You added about ten books by a single author today on Goodreads. Somebody with the last name, last name Ripley or something? Who was that? What was going on there? Do you know what I'm talking about? Vaguely. I do remember them having the last name Ripley, but I don't remember what they wrote. Oh, okay. I thought it was like somebody that you'd read a book by them recently somebody and loved it discovered. so much and that you just added 10 books, right? Right. No, it's just someone who had some really cool um, you know, titles, and I'm just now discovering them. They are a playwright. I know that much. Okay. Um, and apparently they've been around since the nineties or late eighties. Okay. Um, I thought it was something where you read something and you loved it. And you were just like, I'm adding all the books by that person. And I wanted to hear about it, but it doesn't sound like that's the case. Right, okay. Right. Maybe. I, no, I don't think I did. Okay. So sorry to, to derail it, but I kind of, uh, you know, I was trying to, re you know, remember to ask you about that so we can get back onto whatever <laughs> what we were talking about before I fucked it up. Yeah, what were yeah. we? What were we talking about? We were talking about what uh, lowbrow and highbrow stuff having similar themes and being equally as enjoyable. Is that what you're getting at, Ben? Yeah, that's um, yeah. kind of what I was getting at, um, and it's sort of why you know yeah. Jim Thompson has kind of been like rediscovered as like one of the greats when when he was first being published. He was um, you know kind of dismissed as like a dime store and subpar like a uh, right. Hammett or um, Chandler. Yeah, it's like really, Philip K. Dick in a way. I've really so, been thinking about that yeah. too. Like, yeah, Philip K. Dick is a good example too because it's like maybe the point isn't always to like try. Like, because I think there's a lot of value and merit in just enjoyment. 
you know, I mean, you're spending time writing your stories, like you may as well enjoy them, you know, like, I, cause I was thinking of my, a class I took on, uh, it was early American literature and like the books we read were like popular back in the day. Like they, they were basically lowbrow, which is nuts. It's like, uh, it's like what Bukowski has written on his grave. Don't try. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I think that goes against my inclination, but yeah, no, totally. I think that's the goal. That's the guy. Oh, cool. Yeah, and who's, who's Jim Thompson? Because I actually hadn't read anything by him. Uh, he wrote The Killer Inside Me. I think that's his most well-known work. Um, the Grifters, um, Pop 1284, um, uh, Savage Night. Um, I really highly recommend like any of his work because he's really great. What kind of... I didn't mean to derail from Philip. It, it's, it's, crime, it's crime noir. And it's real yeah. stripped down prose, oh, right? Like, you know? a, like the killer inside me is about a uh, small town sheriff who's secretly uh, a murderous sociopath. Okay. Hey, Jared. Our, yeah. guest is, our guest is finally here. Hey, what's going on? Everything okay, man? Yeah, man. I, uh, I just got a uh, time got away from me. I had to. Uh, was at the grocery store, so uh, yeah. Sorry about that, bro. Okay. I I have to ask you, um, how did you how were you able to get the rights to reprint Sweet Evil? Uh, actually, I I don't know. I really don't know how that came about, but uh, Charles Platt's agent just got a hold of us through uh, social media, and uh, I asked if we wanted to do it. We didn't. We weren't looking to do it. Just kind of kind of happened they hit us up and uh we did it that's kind of amazing it's kind of amazing to me because sweet evil has been like a white whale for me like i had not been able to find it anywhere i tried like a you know looking for pdfs i tried like interlibrary loans there was just no way to get a hold of it yeah i mean once you know once uh the guy brought it to our attention uh uh mark watts is the guy's name uh you know, I, I did some research into the book and I found out what kind of a, a white whale it was actually was. And, uh, you know, it was, it was pretty cool. So, uh, yeah, so we were happy to do it. And uh, I think we plan on doing a lot more books that are out of print like that. That's pretty great because I did manage to get a copy of his other, uh, I think it's his most infinite, in, infamous uh, book, The Gas. The Gas, um, yeah. Yeah, I got the uh, Savoy Books version of that. Yeah, I mean it's a cool book, you know, very uh very apropos for the time it was written. Uh it's been updated a little bit, you know, just a few minor tweaks, but it's, it's the same story. Uh it just just reprinted uh slapped a brand new shiny cover on it and went to town. That's pretty awesome. I've I've got it on Kindle and probably gonna try to get the physical version soon and I really look forward to reading it. Yeah, man, we, 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 we appreciate it. Uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. Uh, I'm really happy. And, and you know, I'd heard uh, through the grapevine that, that other people had approached him to, to reprint it in the past, and he never wanted to. So I, I don't know how he got our name, uh, but it just it worked out. That's real. Yeah, that's uh, pretty awesome. And hopefully it, you know, gets – a bit more attention with uh, the people, the same kind of people who had been looking for Charles Platts out of uh, out of print work like that. Yeah, yeah, I'm hoping uh, hoping it catches on. Uh, it's it's a bit slow at, right now, and you, right now it's just hardcore uh, uh, book collectors that are really showing a lot of interest. But uh, I think as uh, time goes on, it'll start selling, and people uh, people will dig it. So. Um. Hmm. Well, we know, obviously, you rolled out a new design for the website, and uh, there have been several new releases, um, but you also teased that you may have a special announcement for us tonight. Uh, which, what do you want to start with? Well, uh, the special announcement, I was sworn to secrecy, uh, so I, I can't really say anything about that. Uh, it's just over the next few months, uh, you know, we're starting up a, a new project, and uh and I, you're just gonna have to wait on that one. So uh, okay, the new website. Uh, we just decided to uh, just to 
take our fate in our own hands kind of and just start selling ourselves on the on the website really that was the uh that was a purpose for that uh try to get off amazon's tit a little bit yeah well i'm seeing this uh apparently you you have a a, a wrath james white and monica j o'rourke offering that, now no oh, that's yeah, we, an older one yeah well, that's, that's yeah man we've had that for a couple of years now what did my this was the one that you uh you had trouble the most trouble with on amazon isn't it yeah that was the one uh, amazon banned actually banned the uh the ebook it was originally titled rope burns and they had a amazon just had a huge problem uh we had it up for pre-order uh then they canceled it and then banned it and put us in pre-order jail for a while for, for offering it yeah we were we were banned for doing pre-orders for a year so uh yeah but uh yeah so that's that's still only available as a as a is a physical copy on Amazon, which we're we're looking to get a uh, to fix fix Are pretty quick on our possibly uh, looking into distributing the ebook through Godless or something like that. Yeah, now Godless, I I was already supposed to you know upload all my stuff for Godless, and if Drew's listening, I I'm sorry, dude. Uh, but yeah, we're gonna we're gonna throw our stuff on Godless as well. Uh, give that a shot. Uh, really like what Drew's doing, and. Uh, so yeah, we're gonna give that a shot too. But it'll be available. The, we got ebooks available on our website as well. Show the show the new site, uh, Jeremy. Yeah, yeah, show us the new site, oh, Jeremy. Yeah. Thought I was. Yeah. Yeah, you were just showing that one book. Yeah, like that's all we had was one book. Yeah, and it was three years <laughs> old. New, uh, there's a new splatter western, is there not? Where is that at? Yeah, it's uh, it's on there. I don't know if we have it in all the. I haven't figured out really how to update the website real well yet, but it's in there. It's a uh, shadow of the vulture and it should be in there. I just haven't put it in the old fancy. Uh, oh, there it is right there. Sweet. Yeah. That, that's sort of, that's sort of like a, a counter splatter Western. It's a, uh, it's, it's, told from a whole different perspective than the normal splatter westerns so it, it's it's a lot different from from the rest of the work um so in that one you, you everybody's just gonna have to it's a very short read it's only 108 pages uh, but regina is is an excellent author and uh she she puts a new spin on on the western so uh i hope everybody enjoy that uh it's it's told from the uh from the viewpoint of a uh, uh, Mexican female during the times, uh, during the, uh, the, the war, Texas Independence War, and everything, so it's really cool. Uh, you first time author? Who me? No, Re Regina Garza Mitchell. Uh, she, I believe she's published a lot of shorter uh, fiction under a pen name, and I don't, I'm unsure what that pen name was. But this isn't her her first rodeo. This is her first rodeo with this kind of uh, content. So, uh, so other than that, I I'm not sure what she's put out before because I haven't really looked it up. Uh, actually, Ryan Harding is the one that uh, clued us in to uh, Regina. There's Sweet Evil by uh, Charles Platt. Yeah, on that cover, we tried to uh, we tried to keep that '70s pulp feel to the cover. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I really like the old cover. I mean, admittedly, a lot better than our new cover, but we didn't want to just just throw the same old cover on there and, and re-release it, uh, which we had the opportunity to do that, but we just decided against it. So, Richard Raven, I've never heard of him. Uh, his. What is his real name? I forgot what his real name. Yeah, he, he's the, he, he's been off the grid for a while. Uh, I think he had some health issues or something. But yeah, the, we've got that one from Richard Raven. He was also in our uh, in uh, and Hell Followed anthology. That's how we we came across him to begin with. So, how long have you been doing fulfillment through this site? Man, about a week now. Okay, so it's brand new. Yeah, it's been crazy too. I mean, uh, we had the initial 
burst of uh, activity, uh, which had me scrambling for stock and everything because I didn't really expect it. Right. But uh, yeah, everything's coming around. Yeah, uh, it's it's kind of a good, good problem to have. Yeah, yeah. It, it's pretty awesome. It's a good problem if if you. It, luckily, we had the stock pretty close to being here, but uh, it would have been a total nightmare if I didn't. I didn't because Amazon's really not. We they're they're really good on shipping the uh, the retail version of the book, but when you're ordering author copies and everything, they they like to take their sweet ass time. <laughs> Are you burnt out on uh, Western Jet? <laughs> Man, I've got no comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, uh, what were you going to say, Phoenix? Oh, I was just looking at Breaking Bizarro. It looks interesting. Boinking or breaking? Okay, breaking. Yeah, breaking. that's got a great cover. Yeah, boinking. All yeah, is that one? Is that one? Uh, is that an anthology then? Uh, so the boinking like, or breaking? Breaking. Breaking is an anthology. They're both anthologies. The uh, the boinking oh, is the other one. Yeah, I guess I missed that one. Well, that one just came out uh, a couple of months ago, and that's oh, like okay. a, it started out as really a joke on Twitter between uh, <laughs> Danger and uh, Brian Asman, okay. and and the, I was reading the uh, the tweets, and I was like, man, that because they're like, man, somebody ought to publish that. Uh, it's just a literary parody of uh, a porn parody on some uh, classic literature. So, <laughs> so we've got Pinocchio, <laughs> Edgar Allan Poe, Burkowski, Alfred Hitchcock, uh, uh, Alex DeLarge from Clockwork Orange, Pennywise from It. Uh, is that Rocky Horror right there? Right I can't even tell. That's uh, Frankenstein in a wig, isn't it? Yeah, it is. What's the difference, right? And who is this right here with the shotgun and the towel? That's Hemingway. Yeah, that is him. Okay. And then you got uh, um, Patrick, Patrick Bateman, Bateman, I think, from American Psycho. Yeah, that, that one right there looks familiar. I don't self service scene. Yep. Oh wow! And who is that right there? I can't uh, even see that. Is that a creature from the Black Lagoon in a cardigan sweater. It looks like it. It's, well, an evening dress, but yeah, yeah, something like. So I mean, it's it's really it's it, this is just all dark humor at its finest, right there. Uh, <laughs> I haven't read a lot of those <laughs> those stories, but because uh, Danger and Brian are really the driving force behind that book, uh, they did the editing, uh, and we basically just uh, provided the platform for for them to get that book out. So yeah, Pinocchio's that's... big dick energy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> lie to I mean, me, baby. Alfred Horsecock. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's a uh, yeah, that's Christine Morgan, uh, Alfred Horsecock. So that's that's pretty funny. Uh, it's it's got some uh, it's got some stuff in there that's for sure. Hmm. But and the, and then the uh, breaking Bizarro it was it's just a uh, you know sort of a mashup uh, bizarre horror really. Uh, yeah, that's, that's that's one of our older titles, and uh, admittedly the formatting on that one is fucked up. So, you know yeah. after after reading it, uh, you know going back and take a look at it again, all the. Uh, all the indents are like triple indented and it's just all over the place. Well, that's one of the ones we'll have to go in and reformat. Luckily it's not selling a whole lot. So. <laughs> so what, what's, I'm interested in the process of um, more from the publishing side. So this is your own website then? Yes. And uh, yeah, I'm curious about uh, how you put the books out. Uh, how, how, you know, like, uh, well, I, I'm, I'm fascinated field. by like independent, yeah, how ind independent and like band, different right? publications. Well, um, how we do it, really. I mean, we're still, you know, on Amazon's fucking long titties uh, yeah. because we, we just order straight from them and and sell sell from the website. Uh, oh, okay, basically. But yeah, you said they, you're trying to get out of that, huh? Yeah, we're trying to get out of it. We're we're trying to figure a way to do print runs instead of the print on demand eventually. Right. Uh, and it, this is just the first step of trying to, uh, trying to break that. It's like an addiction, man, because it's so easy, <laughs> right. you know? Yeah. And, uh, so are you fulfilling your own eBooks though? Yeah, we do our own eBooks. Uh, I don't know how Amazon's going to feel about that because we still have some on, uh, Kindle unlimited. Uh, so we're kind of rolling the dice on that and see what, you know, how that goes. Oh, but yeah, that, I just, I like, I like the idea of like putting out your own, your own publication press. Like that's, that's impressive. 
Yeah, the uh, like the ebooks are we we have uh we sell them in both Moby, which is Kindle, and then the uh, EPUB formats, which is iBooks, and mm-hmm. and you, they that would also go on Kindle. And I think actually uh, Amazon's going to go to to an all EPUB format here pretty quick as wait, well. Wait, so. how, what? Yeah, at least for the uploads, right? Like they they won't take an upload in Moby format after some point in time yeah correct reason. yeah Wait a minute, but but the ones that were previously done that way will remain right yeah 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 i mean you the the consumer probably won't notice much of a difference right it's it's just people uploading stuff right i Which always is, upload should PDF be a big anyway, deal so. what's that i always yeah. use pdf to upload so <laughs> oh well i mean it's epub i mean it you know like as far as the, my process won't change very much other than just the final step of, you know, converting yeah. HTML to EPUB, you know. So. And, and we and we we have a our formatter. She always gives us both both versions, an EPUB version and a Mobi. So it, I mean, it won't change for us at all. I mean, we'll just carry on. Yeah, I wonder. I don't know why they're doing it. It's going to be. Uh, my guess is they're doing it in such a way. The, the reason they're doing it is somehow going to screw somebody, right? So I'm not. Right. I'm not sure exactly what it is yet, though, right? Yeah, so. who, somebody's going to take it in the ass for this, and I don't know yeah. who it is yet. Right. Oh, but Bezos is just wringing his hands, going, "I, you know, I've got them where I want them." You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Gonna, Probably. So gonna, yeah. He's going to make sure to squeeze every quarter he gets until the eagle screams. Yes, that's it, man. He's going to fucking take every bit he can. He's got a yes. divorce to pay for. You know? it's, that's true. Yeah. And my guess is that maybe they're going to be like, okay, homegrown Mobies aren't going to work on Kindles anymore. Right. And you just have to upload an EPUB and then they change it into some proprietary format that only right. works on a, you know what I mean? It's probably something like that. Wait, yeah, wait, 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 wait. But that it's totally there, fuck up our business model there. If they do wait that. a minute, though. I've right. got like 5,600 and some books on Kindle, and they're all Moby format. Those will remain, right? I mean. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I don't think that's going to change. Sure. I'm guessing that I, I wouldn't be surprised if they tried to make it harder to be able to sideload your own like, yeah. Mobys to right. the Kindles. Yeah, right. That's what I'm getting at, yeah. They're going to have it up, too. They'll have the DRM fucking settings so fucked up that you just won't be able to do it. And yeah, because now you yeah. can tell them not to DRM your stuff, but mm-hmm. my guess is, you know, who knows. But what is it about, I missed some of that, what is it about the DRM that makes things, because it sounds like the issue is ownership, right? So people don't actually own the, the copies. Correct. Right. Yeah, if you exactly. have your DRM checked where you want DRM rights, they're, they're mm-hmm. buying the book, but they're basically just renting it. You know, right. I mean, it's still the licensing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's kind of fucked up. And we never realized that a lot on when we first started out, what that DRM box meant. Oh my we God. Just, you scared me. Well, cause I, I wondered because uh, I actually, Corey Doctorow, I don't know if you'd heard of him, but he was, he, he was yeah, um, in science fiction and he was saying that I can't remember which one it was, but I think you were supposed to uncheck the DRM box because then people could just do, they could distribute your books however they wanted, but how that was good for like actually sharing the work. Is that true? Is that kind of what? That's we, true. We, okay. Yeah, that is true. So then I guess I was just trying to follow the logic because um, I think that it's a good idea to be able to actually be able to share your work and not have to worry about the... Well, yeah. I mean, if somebody buys my book, I want if they want to switch platforms, I think yeah, that right. they should be able to easily convert my book to an EPUB to exactly. read on a Kobo, right? Yeah. And, that's, you know, and, and, you're, and you're saying now they can't do that because they well, changed... No, no. We're speculating. We're speculating. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, we just, we just, because Bezos is a repugnant lizard person, we just assume right. the worst. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. He doesn't have good intention on it. Believe me. How, um, right. How much? How much? Um, how much interaction? How much did you uh, uh, have to do with this release here, "Cruel Summer" by Wesley Southern? How I, I, how much did I have to do with it? I guess it yeah. depends on what your thoughts are, right? You're going to throw flowers or rocks at them. Did you, <laughs> right. did, you help edit it? did you help edit it, or did you? I mean, have you read it? Uh, no comment. No, <laughs> <laughs> no I, I mean, I, I've, I've skimmed it. Uh, this was a Thunderstorm Books uh, hardcover release at first, and uh, Wes approached us and he wanted a paperback version, and uh, we're just like uh, we just greenlighted it as is because you know pretty much everything that uh, that Paul does over at Thunderstorms is gold, so we figured we couldn't go wrong. 
So is he in any relation to Nate Southern? He is not. Okay. You know, I always try to put him in the same uh, same boat, but he, he's not. He's no relation. I don't even think they know each other. So I uh, I, I finished reading uh, Cruel Summer yesterday, um, and initially I was pretty captivated. But I don't know, man. I, I don't think. Uh, I think it lost me at, at a certain point when it didn't introduce a supernatural element. Um, and also, uh, uh, there was like a deus ex machina type thing going on at the end that, that really felt like it was... And and I don't know, man. It's it's uh, I, it's good to have character villains that you love to hate, but this guy was really, really repugnant. Um, and it's like... I don't know, man. The, the book just lost me at some point. Damn it, Charlie. Well, I mean, uh, understandable. And uh, again, I have no comment on this uh, on this book whatsoever. Uh, mm. No, uh, but yeah, Wes was Period. worried about Wes was worried about how his character was going to be taken in this, and he was uh, he was a little concerned. I mean, it's it's not for everybody's reading pleasure, I guess, but uh, a lot of people dig it. And one of these days, I'm going to get around to reading it as well. But today is not that day. So this guy uh, named Hoyt uh, <laughs> is, is kind of dragged along to uh, this this vacation in uh, this little ho you know podunk Florida town uh, that's like a notorious tourist trap yeah. uh, with a character named Melissa and her son Pat Patrick. And uh, he kind of, you know, browbeats the boy, calls him pussy boy and whatnot. And, and it's like he'll he'll turn on the charm and then throw like a side insult at both of them. And it's just he vacillates, you know, back and forth like a, a, a total bipolar uh, minus the excuse on his part, you know. Sort of but, like the stereotypical douchebag stepdad. Yeah, yeah. I mean, at this point, it, it, it really, they really need to change it up because it really is. I know that they still exist just because they're cliche doesn't mean they don't exist anymore. But it's really starting to read like old hand in literature now. Um, it, it's almost like they're going to have to reinvent the wheel, authors are at some point, and give them a redemption arc just to make it not so cliche. Um, or, or, or maybe they do one last good act. You know, some or something because I'm really getting tired of seeing the the stereotypical, you know, evil stepdad with not a, a shred of redemption in him, or not even a shred of you know any kind of good qualities. Uh, right. It's just I'm so tired of reading about it. But there's something that happens at the end where it delves so deep into the supernatural that I mean, it just felt like a different novel by the end. And so. I, I liked it initially, but I don't. I felt like it lost me at the end. Uh, I, mean, I thought it started out with a man becoming a shark. <laughs> okay, again, that that was last week. I was like in the throes of, um, you know, uh, like, well, that's supernatural. What's more? What's what's the other supernatural element that turned you off? Because I mean. Oh, I mean, you're all butthurt about spoilers since, you know, now that well, Zach... doesn't sound like I want to read this one based on how you're trashing it. <laughs> the publisher on this program. Damn! <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, hey, I mean, that's cool. You went I, from being like, I think you should be able to review books however you want, to now you're sounding uh, like Zach with the spoiler thing. Uh, so I don't know what to say, how to answer that. I totally uh, approve of, let me know exactly what you think about the book. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that's cool. There is an there near the end. There there is uh, uh, an element. Well, for second, another thing that I bothered me is that there's a major character that is only introduced in like at the like halfway through the book, and I felt like it wasn't like well planned. It felt like he was just kind of dropped in, you know, like through a trap door and found himself in the story, uh, even though he was an ex boyfriend of the uh, the mom. I felt like, uh, th yeah, that character was really forced. Um, right. if he had been mentioned at some point in the beginning. I don't think he was, but it, it would have been more cohesive. Passing. But also, so, huh? uh, he was just mentioned in passing, and all of a sudden he was a major player. Yeah. Uh, and I liked the character, hmm. but 
it just felt like, I mean, it was too late to introduce him by the time he got around to introducing him. Right. Well, goddamn, you know, I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> That's all. You know, it's, it's, it's no, uh, I would yeah. encourage anybody, you know, who hears this to read, to read it for themselves and judge, because it has quite a bit of a uh, five star reviews and very few, you know, middle of the road to two star reviews like, like mine. So, the overwhelming, you know, um, you know, impression is that, you know, it, it's, you know, the people who bought it through Thunderstorm, you know, uh, when it was limited edition or, you know, that they, they really like, uh, you know, they really liked it and wanted to buy it through Death Said, you know. Uh, so, I, I mean, the overwhelming impression is that it, it's a, a good story. And I th- like I said, I thought it had potential to be. But that's my opinion, and and I, I would encourage anybody to read it for themselves before they judge. Yeah, that that's a great opinion, and uh, I agree. So, uh, I mean, and as far as negative, you know, one star reviews, if I if uh, if one star reviews do do for Death Said what they have for Dead Inside, I will take all of them all day oh, long, yeah. fucking and every day. Chandler Morrison, he <laughs> is really on to something oh, yeah. because either people love it and think he's like reinvented the wheel with, you know, five stars or, or it's like one star. Like, uh, I don't want to really de- to go talk too much about this is what a lot of them seem to say. They seem to yeah. say, I don't want to delve too much into what happens here, but, but it's fucked up. <laughs> I mean, apparently Chandler Morrison found a way to tap into one extreme or the other. Either you love it and think it's, you know, off the charts insane or you, you you hate it and think that the guy should probably you know be <laughs> in the investigation right yeah and uh, you know you know somebody was asking me about film rights for that book I'm like well uh, I don't think the FBI is going to allow that I mean <laughs> it's uh but yeah that is one now you speak of books that I've read that is one I definitely have read and you know I don't see people's and I don't like to say negative reviews but they're they're less than stellar reviews on uh, the content and everything. I can see where they're coming from because it is some really rough content. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think, I mean, his writing style was pretty much impeccable. And he he told a good story. And I, 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 I'll stand behind that book until the day that the FBI comes and kicks him in the door. <laughs> <laughs> I do wonder... I did wonder if there was there's some still some residual bad will over what happened at the Bizarro event with him. No, I mean I don't think that not I, with uh, not with like the scene, but with readers who find out about him through the blogs that were talking about him. I, I think that there is going to be some bad blood only on the few individuals that were really driving that hunt, you know, and uh, because I mean that had that had some pretty pretty big repercussions throughout the whole genre, you know, that whole incident, because it changed, it, it changed a lot within the genre because it really, it I don't want to say the a perception of the entire community. Yeah. yeah. And, it, and it almost, and I don't want to say eliminated, but it did it. Deadite has been silent since that, that happened. You know what I mean? There's right. been nothing, nothing coming out of there. Uh, so it, it effectively eliminated an outlet for a, a lot of authors. Yeah. Those authors were always about topping each other with the gross out contest. They finally found their their limit. Yeah, I mean, they finally somebody finally topped everything to where they could nobody could go any further. Right. Without, well, know. and and if he would if he would have done that same uh, live reading at say KillerCon or something, it would have been a whole different. Uh, Whole different ball game. I don't think you would have had the uh, the outrage that was uh, manufactured uh, and over it. You just got to choose your audience. I think I've said this before, but I think part of it is that uh, Chandler Marson was a bit of a newbie to the whole thing, so yeah. you know people didn't really know him like that. So they, you know, weren't really prepared to see him do something <laughs> extreme like that. Right. And, and 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 in his defense, he was really. I mean, he he got approval to do this, so there was it was several layers that that he went through. He didn't just decide, right. you know, I'm going to do this and really fuck everybody's head. So, 
uh, it was all much to do about nothing. If I mean, if anything, it, it created a platform for him to sell a lot of these books. Right. So. Right. And he seems to be, you know, comfortable with, you know, who he is and what he's doing now. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. On, you know, his absolutely. Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he is. He is how he's always been, you know, and always will be. I mean, he's a great he's a great author and uh, he's not going to let one book define him. You know, he's going to he does different things and he's just going to use it as a as a learning experience. He he may change the way he does a little a few things. Uh, but overall, he is Chandler, and he'll remain Chandler. Hey, what's you know, up, Regina? We got two people on here that's in the that's... same body. Yeah, it's weird how that works that's... when you're an author. It's. Uh, did you mean to do a face reveal here? <laughs> yeah, well, I've got a symposium lined up tonight, and I talk with my hands a lot, so I figured it would oh, okay. probably be for the best in explaining the plot of Book of the New Sun if I was able to... <laughs> visually articulate as well as verbally articulate. Jared, so. uh, are you familiar with Gene Wolfe? Read any of his work? Uh, negative. Uh, I bet you would actually really like his, his work, especially some of his horror titles like Peace. I have many of his books oh, lined yeah. up here because I'm like ready for it tonight. But Peace is like very solid, very insidious sneaking horror that like just kind of comes out of all the woodwork of the novel, like as you read it and it like, you realize gradually that it's not literary fiction, it's horror and it's really good. Right. And I'm really wanting to, I want to gravitate more towards, uh, towards books like that. You know, I want to get away from the, just the shock and awe of extreme horror and, uh, you know, move to something a little, and I, and nothing against extreme horror because I love it. And that's what, you know, our bread and butter is, but, I mean, I want to just be accessible to a, a wider audience, and you know, a lot a lot of people, the extreme moniker, just kills it for a, a lot of readers. When they see that that moniker, they're automatically not going to read it, no matter what what the content is. Right. Hmm. So. So you want to expand to just horror in general for now, at least, but just as the yeah, we do umbrella. Yeah, we do, and. and and, then, and that's part of uh, you know the the announcement I was going to do. Uh, I'll go ahead. There's going to be another imprint coming out, and uh, it's going to be more focused on uh, on literary dark fiction uh, as opposed to extreme or you know a lot more hard boiled crime noir. Oh. Uh, so there we go. We're hitting uh, that effort. Phoenix, or what? Uh, Phoenix am, has to be uh, sorry to interrupt. Phoenix has to be heading out soon. So. Uh, Thanks a lot yeah, for coming no, on, Phoenix. Thanks. Yeah, there's no hurry. I was just, I was, well, I was trying to keep it discreet. Uh, no, it's interesting <laughs> to everybody. <I'm> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no worries, Ben. Uh, yeah, no, it's fascinating. I and I do want to tune in later as well. I wasn't leaving just yet. It was just more, so I didn't just sneak out. Oh, sorry. Like, <laughs> like I do. No, you're good. You're good, Ben. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. By the way, uh, Regina, have you seen the Snyder Cut? No, I just no, watched that. I've been horrible. hearing. Uh, oh, is it? I see. Here's the thing, man. It's like the, in that four hour period of time, I could easily just be watching the ring cycle, like yeah, yeah, yeah. Valkyrie, you know, the guy, the guy, the guy, the, guy who wrote, uh, the guy who wrote the music for the ring died recently, didn't he? Or, what? Uh, what? Somebody, somebody. <laughs> Okay, not yeah, the Mike ring. Cycle oh, you're talking about James ring. Levine. You're talking about the conductor, James Levine. The conductor, yes. not Wagner. Yeah. Okay. No, no, no. Yeah, you're talking about James Levine. Okay. I was like, Jeremy, you got died this year. Rick Wagner. Wagner just died. Oh my god. <laughs> 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 the news. But no, yeah. but I just I just sat through that slog fest this morning. You know, I, just, I was like, <laughs> sorry. Oh dude. my god. I was like, what have I done? You know. <laughs> <laughs> What what slog fest? Like, the Just Snyder like, cut. Snyder cut. Oh, oh, yeah, so you've seen it? <laughs> yeah, I watched it this morning. As a matter of mm -hmm. fact, Joker, and then Ma Martian Manhunter. Oh, I mean, I mean, oh wow. Okay, so I sat through four hours for y'all to introduce two characters like that <laughs> at the very <laughs> end, it's, and yeah. they stole the whole thing from Iron Man having these premonitions and visions of Thanos for six years. And they do that. It's the same thing with Bruce Wayne having these premonitions about a, a, a different timeline where dark side takes over earth. They, I mean, it's shameless, like theft oh. of what? 
It was horrible. I yeah. mean, I really, I was like, oh my god, you know. And <laughs> I think, uh, I think people was... were so excited because uh, are so excited about it because the theatrical cut was such a confused piece piece of shit. <laughs> and it was, it was fucking bad. Yeah, basically, Zack Snyder said, "Hold my beer," you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's like I said, you know. It's like I said earlier. The worst possible thing to come out of this is that it'll be super successful. Zack Snyder will get his uh, auteur license back, and he'll be able to make his passion project of adapting the Fountainhead. Yeah, <laughs> aren't, aren't, we, aren't we just aren't you just so fucking excited? Zack Snyder directing an adaptation of Iron Man's The Fountainhead. One thing he did get right, Again, I have 2026, baby. Yeah. One thing he did get right is that Dark Side should have been the villain instead of Steppenwolf. Steppenwolf. Oh Who cares God. about Steppenwolf? Why did anybody think that was a good idea for him to carry a <laughs> main villain? Steppenwolf, the cranky uncle of Darkseid. Darkseid is the guy you throw down with, uh, the guy who, who like rules uh, the planet Apocalypse with an iron fist, you know. And, and it's it's just Steppenwolf should have never carried the film as a villain. They probably wanted to save it for the sequel because after the first version, the people were gonna be clamoring for a sequel where they fight right. Darkseid. Mm, yeah. So. Uh, Jared, did you have any announcements pertinent to Death's Head Press that you can unveil? Because Regina's worked very hard on this author spotlight coming up. And oh, no, don't don't interrupt him for me. I'm interested oh, I, to talk about You're not interrupting press. anything from me because I'm just like winging this shit. I did, not, I did not come in with a plan at all. So I'm just like just throwing random words out when I, when I can. Really. But, uh, did you have any kind of like announcement or anything that you could share? Like uh, upcoming authors or, or what we got coming up? I mean, yeah, I thought maybe you might have some, might be able to talk about something. Uh, yeah, what's the hot you know, goss? John Wayne, commun John Wayne communal, maybe or. I mean, John Wayne. I mean, I was just hanging out with him the other day. Uh, no news on that front. I mean, he's doing a splatter western. We're coming out with like a second season of splatter westerns where there's going to be a whole like different vibe to the uh to the splatter westerns but uh yeah more westerns i'm really excited about that uh so i mean really we do have a new ryan harding book coming out here pretty quick i don't know if you guys have read uh the the book he put out reincarnage it's like a 80s slasher type book some of it yeah well we've got the sequel to that uh coming out and uh, we're re-releasing uh, Reincarnates One uh, with a bunch of bonus features. Uh, we're doing a, we've got a, a, a Keen, Brian Keen novella, brand new novella, vampire novella uh, with two reprinted short stories that is going to be coming out. And we got some Matt Wildeson, uh wrote a book uh, who is uh, used to be on the uh, horror show with Brian Keen. So he's a, uh, he's a pretty good dude. Uh, called Melancholia, uh, so that's our that's a really our new author that's really coming on the scene. Uh, the rest are pretty much uh, the stalwarts of uh, of extreme horror right now. So, uh, and of course the westerns. And you know, like you know, Jeremy asked me earlier, am I sick of westerns? I I mean, no, because you know I love what the <laughs> the public wants to read and all. But yeah, I'm tired of talking about them. I mean, absolutely, <laughs> yeah. because uh, I want to. I want to talk about new things. Uh, what about a line of Giallo novels? You know what I'm, that is? No. Italian <laughs> crime I, I, noir. No, they're like Italian, like uh, Italian uh, slasher films, right? With a certain aesthetic that is like almost like. An operatic yeah. or something like uh, I, Deep uh, Red or uh, what's another Stenholm? Suspiria, phenomena, kind of. I am writing this down though. There was no plans up until now, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, I mean we're gonna try to be doing. You know, we're gonna try our hand at re-releasing some uh, out-of-print novels. Uh, 
you know, like I said, Mark Watts is going to help us out uh, with that. And because uh, he's, a, he's a huge collector of these uh, these out of print books and hard to find books. So he's been uh, hinting around to me that he might have a few more authors interested in reprinting their stuff. And uh, and we'll probably get into that. Uh, I'd love to do a bunch of uh, hard boiled crime. Just a series of that. I, I, I love that shit. Yeah, I like that, uh, too. Yeah. So just, just some that, you know. I just want to do something different, man. You know, I'm just like, that's it. A, a maybe, lot of the- uh, maybe you should, uh, maybe you should try to work something out with Stephen Graham Jones. He's written that he wrote something for a uh, broken river books when they were on the, the big crime, uh, you know, wave, you know, crime noir wave. Uh, I don't even know if they're a functioning press nowadays, but Stephen Graham Jones, you know, he's, he's, good about working with publishers on exclusive well I, i've hit Was, um, Stephen Graham, i've hit him up a couple of times and in, in, you know to a lukewarm reception about mm-hmm. things so uh, i'm gonna let that one lie for a while and uh and we're gonna put a pin in that one and come back to it so was uh, uh was jay david osborne's new book put out through broken river or was that something else i don't what what new book is it it's not black Tom, gum, right? tomahawk i think yeah, Tomahawk's what it's called. I don't think it's out yet, or is it? Is it out like today or something? It seemed like it was coming out this month. Yeah, I don't know, but should have asked Chris that last week. He would have known. That's yeah. another guy. If you can get an exclusive going with uh, that, that guy has lived some genuinely fascinating, you know, uh, adventures. Who? Who are you talking about? Chris Newsom, uh, okay. who was on last week. He uh, lived in. Uh, South America with a tribe uh, in uh, in in on on the Solomon Islands for a while. Yeah, wow. Yeah, I don't know if you've read his book Private Midnight, but um, that might be you know something uh, the type of like noir you'd probably be looking for. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I mean, go, go ahead. ahead. I'm sorry. I was just gonna say, Ann, are you okay? Yeah. You I, I you you scare the hell on me sometimes. You said. You're hiding from someone. <laughs> We're all hiding from someone. Um, <laughs> yeah. Mostly ourselves. Right. But you know, the new imprint's going to be, we're going to do a lot of nonfiction. I mean, our first release, I can, I guess I can, I'm probably not supposed to say anything, but I will. Hmm. It's, we're going to do a, it's going to be music industry related. And it's, it's actually a coffee table book of uh, the photographic history of, uh, of the Metro venue in Chicago. Uh, oh, neat. So, uh, we're going to do a lot of f- photography books. We've got we're working closely with a uh, with a major uh, music photographer who wants to. Uh, he's got his entire archive that he wants to put out in books, and we're going to help him do that. So, wow. uh, yes, yeah, so it's, it's it's a whole different. Uh, it's 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 not an imprint of Death's Head Press. So I just want to get that. For the record, now it's it has, it's in no way, shape, form, or fashion even associated with Death's Head Press. It's a whole different, uh, whole different venture. So, I can't say the name of it yet, but uh, right. it's it's myself and uh, who a guy who is a, a basically a rock star is uh, is my partner in this, and he also writes horror, and uh, so we partnered up for it. And, nice. That's all I can really say. About I feel it. like I should know this. I'm, I'm sure I'm dropping enough hints where not, you should probably <laughs> figure it out yourself. It's not the guy from Guar. He's dead. No, nah. it is not. Huge, huge death metal band back in the day. Uh, and uh, I mean, you're I, just like dying to say it. I mean, you're not, <laughs> you're not looking am. for Jeremy to, to guess, are you? Because I mean, uh, that, it'll turn into yeah, you know? yeah, that ship's already sailed. I think. I don't think Jeremy's going to guess. But <laughs> okay, but he, yeah. no, I wish it was kind of cannibal course. Yeah. No, but, no. But a band of, uh, around the same uh, same kind of genre. You know what I mean? Extreme uh, <laughs> gore. And uh, but anyway, he, he, the the guys are really aside from the music, he's he's a really good dude that uh that puts out he, he put out pretty quality work as a writer as well. Uh, he was published in that one book that you happened to show earlier that used to be called Rope Burns. He's got a story in there, so uh, 
There, oh, no, that's all. Right, Wrath James White is not in a. Dead no, it's not him. God damn, it's not him. All right, Jeremy, <laughs> what are you taking tonight? God damn, <laughs> what am I not taking? He's, he's huffing cat piss. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, we we gotta. Uh, Ann, are you at a rave? <laughs> yeah. We yeah. gotta catch up with Ann because apparently her life is. Uh, in danger once again, and then Regina has worked really hard on this presentation on Gene Wolf. Uh, anything you want to close out with, Jared? Of course, you can hang around as long as you want. But no, nah, man, I just appreciate y'all having me on again. I like coming on and just shooting the shit. Uh, you know, talking yeah. about talking about shit other than westerns was really refreshing. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, not that I don't like. I just want to put it out there. Not that I don't like westerns, everyone, but uh, it just gets. When when you get invited on a place to talk about the same thing over and over again, it just kind of kind of wears on you. So. Yeah, yeah. And, it sounds uh, like we got some exciting projects in the future. We do have. I'm really excited, and I can't wait to really expand on it a lot more, and and you know let everybody know what else is going on. I just you know I the guy I'm working with, we had just decided to keep it undercover until we had something to say, really. So uh, until we had something to show, Sean Wayne Communal, he's the rock star, right? And it is not. Oh. But <laughs> shut up. Close. <laughs> that a is it Phil and Take a, <laughs> take a, take one of the pills. Whatever, whichever kind of pill makes you shut up, take that one. Take take the red <laughs> pill. But anyway, I appreciate you guys having me. Oh, that makes sorry you talk I'm, too much. Yeah, thanks, brother. Sorry, Good I was late. And, yeah, no uh, problem. And keep fighting the good fight. You know what I mean? Yeah. And. Uh, that's about it, man. Nice seeing yeah, you thanks again. Thanks a lot for coming back. Yeah, thanks hey, for coming No in. problem. Y'all have a good evening. You too. You too. So, and uh, we're... Uh, okay, that was Jared leaving, right? Okay, yeah. Before yeah. we before before we get started uh, on this epic uh, second edition of the author spotlight here, uh, where Regina talks about uh, Gene Wolf. And are you familiar with Gene Wolf? Yeah, yeah. How much have you read by him? Uh, very little. Um, a very long time ago. But, you know, I'm interested to hear it. I've Shadow. just been hmm? having a couple of technical difficulties here. Um, well, namely, like, I can't get... It looks like you're at a rave with all the colors on the screen. Uh, well, those should be gone now unless, you know, my internet's frozen up again because I'm, I'm, um, I'm outside now. It's just... I'm probably going to do mostly listening and not much talking because I can't get reception in my apartment and it's just windy as fuck outside of my apartment. So <laughs> I will be uh, probably muting my mic and walking to Target to see if I can get one of those windproof mics for my phone. Okay. Everything okay? okay? Are you, are you out of any kind of in imminent danger? Yeah, I'm just, you know, so, I'm, she'll I'm be okay. She, she'll be okay. She has the uh, Trump 2020 knife. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the uh, knife equivalent of a John Kerry bumper sticker. Yeah, and and uh, you got Stumpler's like aggressive affection too. Yeah. Yeah, he's a, he's a pretty good guard cat. But yeah, I just. It's the same old, same old, you know, the neighbors still may or may not. I mean, definitely not as bad as uh, uh, our, our last week's guest's actual proven murderer neighbor. But I, sh I have another apartment that is in a gated community and only costs about $50 more a month lined up for the 1st of April. Uh, of April. So basically all I have to do is survive the next 12 days. Well, now, wait a minute. They might, they might have something to say about you having two cats or something though. Right. Or, or who knows I with the dead communities they have, they can make up their own rules. Well, the thing I is the, 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 the anal retentive measures they take are calling all your references and my my lane lady in Chicago just loved me, so you know I I was I was good to go on that, and I was really glad that they actually called my references because of, of course these assholes didn't call anyone's references, which is why it's a building full of psychos. 
<laughs> well, I'm glad you're getting out of there, and, and you know, maybe Jeremy will not try to take that to help help away from you anymore. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, Regina, I'm really interested to see because to see what uh, kind of homework you've done here. Uh, yeah, I'm very interested in Gene Wolfe. I've only read one book by him, but he seems like a fascinating writer. And he seems to, I don't know, I'm interested in, the, in the, what, you hear, hear what you have to say about him. And I'm most interested in reading us, more by him. Most of us know him from his Shadow of the Executioner <clears throat> or Shadow of the Torturer. Torturer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's that's when I read the first book in that series. But he was yeah. he was prolific up until the end of his life, yeah. pretty much, right? Yes. Yeah, he uh, was nominated for and received over 160 awards, like just total across all these different platforms. I think he got the Locus uh, Award like nine times, and the Nebula several times, and wrote 30 novels and just over 200 short stories have been published and you know it just he is a phenomenal author who has done so much for literature but before i even touch his writing uh, an important fact that you need to know is that without pringle without gene wolf there might not be any pringles in the world what so yes yeah you worked at png yeah. yeah, man. He, he worked at Procter and Gamble for most of his career, and he was an industrial engineer. And he developed uh, the machine that cooks the dough used to make Pringles potato chips. So you can thank Daddy Gene for that. And I like it. I like to, you know, point out the fact that the Pringles guy looks a lot like Gene Wolfe, which I'm sure is a complete coincidence. But he's definitely got the mustache. Right. So, <laughs> but um, I I love Gene Walsh so much. He is a really important author to me personally. Some of my like earliest memories involve going to the library with my father, and my father would always um, uh, get like sci-fi titles like H.P. Lovecraft and stuff. But um, he often spoke about Gene Wolfe, and then he would often, uh, he went through a period of time where he was reading Gene Wolfe. <laughs> yeah, see, yeah, there's a very <laughs> close similarity there. Um, and so I remember, like, going to the Columbus Public Library and him getting on Green's Waters when I was, like, 10 or 11. And him, he would tell me a little about the plot. And so, like, as a child, I guess Gene Wolfe's stories were kind of, like, almost fairy tales to me in a way. Which is interesting because then you go on to read these books and he works a lot of like fairy tales in the books or like peace, which again is like this is if you only read one Gene Wolfe book in your whole life, make it peace. It is so good. And it is just stories within stories within stories that are never fully finished because it's just about kind of life and we'll get to kind of peace later because that's a whole nest of rats that's like totally different and it's it, i think it's the novel that's like most championed by neil gaiman who just loved gene wolf and was was very close friends with him until the end of gene wolf's life so um if you like neil gaiman be sure to read peace by gene wolf um so <laughs> I've got a whole biography open in front of me that I wrote. I've got sources. I've got everything. And in fact, if you want to check out paintedblindpublishing.com, there is a five-part essay series about Book of the New Sun, breaking it down uh, using Jungian symbolism and um, alchemical uh, symbols. So check it out. Very interesting, very in-depth. This is going to be more of a general retrospective of Papa Jean's work. So, uh, interestingly, I noticed during my research there are some discrepancies about Jean's birthday because the New York Times got it wrong somehow. Um, and I had Dwayne, who's like really into genealogy, go back and check the birth records for New York around that time. And lo, he determined that Jean Wolfe was in fact born on May 7th, 1931. And he was born in Brooklyn, New York, to uh, Emerson Leroy Wolf, and his mother's name was Mary Olivia Ayers. And they were um, uh, a salesman and a, 
uh, diner manager or owner, I guess, um, respectively. And it seems interesting uh, because I I have always identified Gene Wolfe as like a very Catholic author. Um, but he wasn't raised Catholic. He converted to Catholicism, I believe, after the war. Um, and so after being born in Brooklyn, New York, his family shortly thereafter moved him to Texas. And he spent his childhood as an outcast for reading sci-fi and all this stuff. And he uh, pursued engineering for a while, but he ended up dropping out of Texas A&M because of bad graves. And because he dropped out, he got drafted into the Korean War. So he fought in the Korean War, and his recollections of the war are uh, in a book called Letters... I think it's Letters Home or Letters to Home by Gene Wolfe. If somebody has a copy and they want to part with it, um, shoot me up at reginawattswrites at gmail.com because I really want a copy very badly and I will buy it from you. Um, so uh, after the Korean War, he came back, he returned to school, he um, got a mechanical engineering degree from the University of Houston, and he had really bad PTSD. And he said how, you know, he would just like the typical veteran story. He would drop to the floor at the slightest sound. And my grandfather was also a veteran of the Korean War. And I know he struggled with a lot of his experiences and didn't really talk about it necessarily. Um, so I feel like a lot of connection to Gene Wolfe just like on the whole with my paternal lineage side of the family. It's very interesting to me. Um, so one of the ways that he like worked through this obviously was in his writing. And in fact, book of the new Sun is, uh, largely influenced by his desire to write a story about a man going off to war. But he also cites a lot of other influences in book of the new Sun that we will get into, uh, later. So he married his childhood sweetheart in 1956, Rosemary Dietrich, and they would remain married his whole life. And uh, she would eventually die of Alzheimer's in 2013, I believe my notes say, yes. And it affected him very hard. Um, he was a pretty much a lifelong sufferer of heart disease, which, you know, he was a kind of a big guy. Um, so that probably didn't help his condition, um, suffice it to say, but whatever. He's a veteran. He probably had chronic pain. Probably eating was just a joyful thing for him that <laughs> was pleasant. So I, I can't really fault him. And he lived a long, good life eating food that he liked and, and going on cruises and stuff. So that was great. So after college, he worked as an engineer uh, while married to Rosemary, by which point he had already converted to Catholicism. And they, I believe, pretty shortly into their marriage, moved to Illinois um, at which point, uh, Jean and Rosemary started to have kids. They had like four children. And so Jean started to write on the side and he, uh, let's see, it took him eight years before his first story of the dead man was bought by a cheap girly magazine called Sir for 80 whole dollars. <laughs> so <laughs> this was not an overnight thing. Um, and he worked for Procter and Gamble until 1972, at which point he became the editor for a trade journal called Plant Engineering from 1972 to 1984, at which point he retired and became a full-time writer. So this is pretty much during the course of the publication of Book of the New Sun, because it, well, the first, the first we'll, we'll talk about that in detail, the first five books of the series. Um, came out from 1980 to uh, 1987. So in that span of time, it, the book started to do well enough that he was able to retire, which is so nice because you can just then become completely obsessed by your work <laughs> and, and completely lose contact with reality. And you can just go. So that's what he did. <laughs> and he just wrote his ass off for the rest of his life. And, you know, I, I've heard people criticize some of his later books as like not being as good or not being as interesting or whatever, but I disagree. I think a lot of his later titles are stupendous. Uh, there are doors is an interesting one. That's um, I feel like it's starting to get a little bit more attention in his oeuvre, but it is um, 
just kind of like, I wouldn't even call it speculative fiction. I mean, it is, but it's like magical realism and actually appropriate because there's a weird doll in it, which we'll talk about that more later. And um, it's it's interesting. It's like very much about like the soul's relationship with kind of just like the feminine ideal and sexual energy and uh, like love and just all of these different things. He He's like really, it's interesting. I feel like there's a lot of rhythms between Richard Wagner and Gene Wolfe in terms of they both have like a very intense, very like, morbid Catholicism, I guess, which is what I relate to, and um, how a, a lot of their themes explore kind of the um, the Catholic uh, tension that is just constantly existent because, you know, it's like women are beautiful and sex is beautiful and sex is a gift from God and the feelings that we feel are things that we're being made to feel for a reason. And even our mistakes are being made for a reason, but it causes us this angst and it's this like really intense spiraling, just like, you know, it, it goes on forever. And this is why these men spend their whole career doing it. It's just a really, um, intense subject. And again, that's also sort of where peace comes in. Peace. Let me. I, so I'm going to try to talk about this book in as spoiler free a way as possible. And I, I, it's really hard. I feel like the more you talk about peace and the more you read peace, the more you want to talk about it. I've look, I, I have hand annotated my copy and I don't know if you can see it. But yeah, I've put, got, hey, uh, Jeremy, put Regina up on the screen. Yeah. There, hey, the, oh, there I've, you are. Yeah. No, so no, I've no, got no. A, <laughs> I got it, a got handwritten it, got it. index in the back of my copy of Peace. So when I'm dead, somebody don't sell this book at a garage sale. Make hmm. sure that it goes on eBay or something. It's my special, special copy. And it's just like I have gone through this book and just really checked it out. This is a, another page, too. And I love it. And there is so much like symbolism. There's so much that goes in and it just takes all these twists and turns. And there is, it is the story of a very successful man who lives in a small town who is um, dealing with sins that he will not even admit to himself. So how can he admit them to you basically? And so it is, but there's more to it than that. There's like so much more to it than that. And it's so fucking good. It's so good. I love this book. And uh, it's like I said, it's really interesting because he utilizes this story within stories, like almost Arabian Nights type device where it like, it obviously the one character, the main character is telling his story to you. And then he'll be telling a story about how he was at a dinner party at his aunt's and everyone at the table at his aunt's party decide to have a storytelling competition. And then maybe one of those stories will also contain an additional fairy tale within it. So it's like this great, just stacked narrative. And I love it. You know, it's like you get so lost in this maze that you almost forget what the book is about. Gene Wolfe was very interested in memory and consciousness and the way memory is consciousness. I mean, like when we talk about Wotan and, or Odin and Wotan, his, his ravens thought and memory, I mean, that's what makes up consciousness, right? The experience of that. So it's like, uh, I, the Gene was uh, a big fan of, of Proust, Proust, excuse me, Proust, and uh, also J.K. Chesterton, uh, who I know less about, but I believe he wrote The Man Who Was Tuesday, which or Thursday, excuse me, The Man Who's Thursday, which was that's a great a, book. Yeah, I, I really want to awesome read it, book. and I was reading about it. It just looks really good. I have not read it yet, though. Wow, I can't think of, sorry to break in, but I can't think of two yeah. authors who are more different than Proust and Chesterton. <laughs> I mean, that's funny. <laughs> I, I, I think for I think for Jean, part of Proust was, like, just 
the memory, you know, and the Swan's Way, the the big long book that he wrote, is just was like really captivating, just conceptually to to Gene, um, and that kind of ties into Book of the New Sun, which now have you guys finished? You've only read Shadow, right? The first one. Yeah, that's yeah. all I've read. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, so you remember, do you remember how Severian every five minutes, he's like, I have a perfect memory. Did you know I have a perfect memory? You may not remember because you're just a mere mortal, but I have a perfect memory. <laughs> it's like, all right, <laughs> I fucking get it. You're constantly <laughs> lying to me. It's fine. <laughs> but <laughs> have I told you that I have a perfect memory? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's like, because of that kind of like, emphasis in this whole device you can kind of already see the in the interest that he has in memory and book of the new sun um but then he also kind of uh, this is the worst part of the story and i hate it because he throughout his life was working on a series um uh called latro in the mist or latro in the mist and it's about a uh, a mercenary who is traveling for through greece um, and then I think later Egypt and he, it's basically like Memento, but set in ancient Greece where this mercenary has interrograde and retrograde amnesia. And he is, is writing down his narrative, which is, I presume the book you're reading in this scroll that he is carrying with him. And then it's like a journal format, kind of like book of the new sun where Severian is writing to you as a reader. Um, the same thing with Latro and the Mist. And he uses that device a lot. I'm reading Fifth Head of Cerberus right now, which is really fucking good, by the way. And um, it also utilizes that device where, um, you know, you're, you're being spoken to very directly by the character. So also, you know, again, Peace has that. So it's like he just uses that again and again. And it's a, it's a very effective device for him. So... I can't fault him. <laughs> but what makes Shadow and Claw and um, see, so I actually, I'll tell you what, Sword of the Lictor is probably my favorite of the tetralogy. It's so good. It's really, uh, it has some of the coolest scenes for sure. Um, and there, there's just a lot to commend it. So if you can plow back in, I, I had a thing too. I, so the, let me tell you specifically about how this book came to be. What happened, what had happened was um, Jean was writing a short story called uh, The Feast of St. Catherine, or the, the, the Feast of Holy Catherine, which um, is talked about a little bit early on in the book, because that's the original conceit of the story, was it was going to be about a man who is part of a torturer guild who um, uh, takes mercy on one of the prisoners there and uh, falls in love with her and gives her the means with which to kill herself, to put herself out of her misery. And so in Jean's original envisioning of this, the man was going to then like um, be like punished vaguely somehow and you know how early outlines are and he was just like it's gonna just be like and eventually Severian's gonna be the leader of the guild and he's gonna receive a note from this woman and it's gonna say that she's still alive and it's like what, what does he do about that that was his premise for the original short story that he started and then suddenly he had like a 40,000 word novella which is the first half of uh, of the shadow of the torture. And he's like, okay, well, <laughs> what do I do now? So instead of, you know, flipping right to Severian being the leader of the guild, what he ends up then doing is having Severian be punished by being exiled. And so the real story is about the exile of Severian and his rise to the level of Otark, which is the self-ruler of of their society, the Commonwealth, which interestingly enough, Commonwealth is the term that is used to refer to fairyland, kind of. So uh, that will come up again 
later. Um, also, I just want to say too, now, I know that Mr. Neil Bimbo cannot be watching this live right now because he has a life and can't listen to me talk about Gene Wolfe in a symposium for like three hours. So <laughs> I understand. I appreciate that. But in the future, when you are here, Neil, I just wanted to do, do, show off this shit. This is a, an awesome book for any Gene Wolfe owner to have. This is Castle of the Otter, which is a, a title inspired by a typo that uh, was put in Locus magazine because an editor misheard the title uh, uh, Citadel, or at the time, Castle of the Oturk, which they heard Otter. So Gene loved the typo, and so he made it the title of this book of essays, which are primarily about Book of the New Sun. Um, and it's awesome, and it's a great source for it, anybody who's interested in Gene and, and his positions about things. And there's a big, long, very thorough index of words that he uh, appropriated for the series, because it's also important to know that this man did not just do what fantasy writers often do these days and create a bunch of silly names and words and shit. He just took words that existed but words that are very obscure and like he uh, obviously yeah, he repurposed was, or not repurposed but he took a bunch of archaic words and, and yeah. used those instead yeah well, that's really cool yeah man yeah. i love that aspect of it it like really enriches it for me and i, yeah, I strive likewise. to do that yeah. yeah i think that that's one of his his greatest thing i got really pissed when i was doing research for this because i'm scrolling down to it now pardon my hand so I was looking at his entry in sci-fi encyclopedia. And of course, Gene Wolfe was very influenced by Jack Vance, etc. You know, these uh, Jack Vance wrote The Dying Earth, which is a series of uh, novels which are set in a far future that's like, you know, it's so far future, it might as well be fantasy. And he, it, Book of the New Sun is very similar. And, um, uh, the sci-fi encyclopedia article I read about Gene at the end said um, something about how uh, it's possible that he never had an original thought in his life. And I was like, what the fuck? What? That's very harsh. Um, but and then that's I, in like, an really... encyclopedia, allegedly, right? I mean, it's... I mean, yeah, that's, yeah. yeah. I, I was like, that's extremely fucked up to say about this man who contributed so much to sci-fi, in my opinion. But I thought about it, and it's like... You know, in a symbolic way, what he did with the Pringle is, like, perfect. Because, of course, the potato chip already exists. But what is the Pringle but a refinement, a space-age refinement, no less, on the Pringle chip, uh, on the potato chip. So I thought that was very interesting when I kind of thought about it that way. Um, but they had this quote, what does they say? They say, setting aside for an instant his control of language, however florid it may seem, um, <laughs> and his intensely applied control over structure in general, and the paced revelation of story in particular, it is possible to claim that Wolf's importance for the field lay in a sponge-like ability to assimilate generic models and devices, and in the quality of the transformations he effected upon that material. So, you know, they agree with me. The, he is like the Pringle machine of science fiction. Literature. So, I mean, who wrote this entry in the encyclopedia? Some yeah, it kind of sounds like a bitch. It, yeah. Yeah, it, it kind of sounds like an ex. Like yeah, somebody exactly. dated yeah. him at some point. Yeah. <laughs> no shit. Yeah. 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 <laughs> also, his dick was small. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And Pringles don't <laughs> taste good anyway. I prefer yeah. corn potato chips. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, I, I could just talk about Gene Wolf for years. He's so fucking great. And it's like no matter what angle you approach him from, He's interesting, and um, uh, and, and what he I was love... kind of like a writer's writer most of his, I mean, uh, entirety of his career, right? I mean, it wasn't he never really got real popular as no. far as from general readers, right? No, yeah, yeah, yeah. they call him the right the sci fi right writer's writer, you know, right. and it's like yeah. this. It's so sad that it's like that because I feel like he really has influenced so much of sci fi that it's frustrating to me. 
that more people don't know about him because he's so great and he's so like prescient. I mean, like, let's just talk about. Okay, so one of the th one of the reasons why I thought the the Commonwealth being named what it is is very interesting is because um, Jacques Vallée, who I know was brought up on the show before, ha has discussed in many books um, his uh, his perception based on the data that um, things like fairies and angels and maybe Bigfoot and certainly UFOs and aliens and all of these things are like a spectrum of the same experience basically <clears throat> is what his data indicates. And Gene Wolfe has been writing about this shit since this book at least, <clears throat> but also before, you know, um, it's like he, he just, he, so, he, what's so, uh, God damn it. There's so much good shit in Book of the New Sun, you guys. I am so glad you're letting me do an author spotlight because I feel like I've got some people captive so I can talk to them about this uh -huh. shit because, so there are some aliens in Book of the New Sun and they are like, they, they, they're like bit characters almost, um, because they don't show up very often, but when they show up, you tend to pay attention. And what's great is one of them speaks in verse. So it's like you don't even notice it at first. <laughs> and then it's like you realize it's in blank verse, which is awesome. And um, so these characters are talking to Severian like they know him pretty much from the outset. And as the book goes on, as the, the tetralogy goes on, what you realize is these aliens... As we go forward in time, they go back. And so they've already met you in the future when you're significantly older. And they're, you know, that's the first time they met you. And now this first time that you meet them in the past, um, they are meeting you for the last time. So, so this is the like, entire reason you're you're using a camera today. A little bit. This is there's so much. There's gonna be more. If you let me get into like the fifth headed Cerberus and the holy trinity thing that's going on, you're gonna see a lot of this. <laughs> so we'll see if we get there. But these fucking aliens, man, are dope because then wasn't it like two years ago? Um there was some study that came out about how some physicists had written a model to predict that there might be a uh, basically a parallel dimension where time flows backwards like that. So that was just like two years ago. So that was fucking interesting. <laughs> he predicted that shit. And then um, fulogen, which is a type of fabric that's like uh, darker than black, which is the coolest shit, right? Super goth. And um, it's, it's, it's sick. So that, of course, is, you know, Vanta Black now and all these other, like, blacker than black paints and, and, and pigments that they've, they've come up with. Um, so it's, like, just all this stuff that he has just foreseen is really awesome, but also alarming. Because his picture of the future is what he calls a do-nothing future, where he is talking in a, a Castle of the Otter essay about how um, he... Uh, is showing in Book of the New Sun what society does if people do nothing about things like climate change or overpopulation or war or famine or, you know, it's like if we don't take care of ourselves or each other or the planet, this is what we get to look forward to is regressing to like a, like a Roman society, basically, <laughs> where we don't even really know what the fuck technology is anymore after it's of a certain point. Um so it's it's such a it's such an interesting premise the way he handles it specifically too because it's it is a lot like the ring cycle in terms of it is very cyclical it's he wrote after book of the new sun he wrote several other series in the universe first after the original four books of the tetralogy he wrote the earth and the new sun and then he wrote the book of the short sun and the book of the long sun and those two are on my reading list. I have not been able to enjoy them yet, but I know that they're excellent. And uh, I have heard nothing but just the most glowing praise of them. 
And I also know that they deal very heavily with time travel. It's so frustrating. You can't read about Gene Wolfe without being exposed to Gene Wolfe spoilers, which really pisses me off because I really just want to enjoy these books. If you do read Peace, which again, I strongly recommend, you'll notice this little thing here says, with a new afterword by Neil Gaiman, okay? Don't fucking read it until you <laughs> have at least read Book of the New Sun and Fifth Head of Cerberus, especially fucking Fifth Head of Cerberus, because it has a huge ass fucking spoiler for that book. And I was like, innocent, I'll remember it for the rest of my life. And if I ever get the opportunity to meet Mr. Gaiman, I will shake his hand and I will say, Mr. Gaiman, I really appreciate the opportunity to meet you because you ruined Fifth Head of Cerberus for me. <laughs> because I'll just spoil I, one of his books on this on this on this show. I don't I have to read <laughs> right one first. I fucking guess. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, so I read a like, couple. Uh, yeah, uh, I think I've read Sandman a little bit, or like Death. I can't Lady remember Death. enough to spoil it. Right, there wasn't yeah, anything good exactly, enough in it to spoil. I, I think is what the problem is. Yeah. <laughs> no yeah. comment. Uh, I plead the fifth future writer <laughs> convention, Magda. <laughs> um, I, man, no, I, I mean, like... Oh, so, hold on. You were saying that it was interesting that he used the phrase commonwealth, or the, the term commonwealth yes, okay. to talk... Yeah. Yeah, why? Why is that interesting? Because, uh, because so so much of Book of the New Sun is kind of about like how um, maybe some of the race of humanity is being in contact with angels a little bit, or or fairies, or whatever aliens, fairy alien angels. I I don't know what you want to call them. I, there's a term for them in the book series. I can't remember it off the top of my head. But they're, basically they're, the fae kind of a thing. Yeah, a little bit, yeah. And just the premise that, that these things are all kind of the same thing. And so the idea, I guess, conceptually overall becomes like this is low-key being controlled by otherworldly forces, I guess, is sort of so, the but, implication. But Valet doesn't refer to this as the commonwealth or he doesn't cite anything where people commonly refer to the fae as the well, commonwealth it seemed like that's where you were going oh no well he actually i think he does he has referred to the commonwealth but i, I it was more just that jacques valet is you know kind of the the he's the only source i can cite for the theory that angels and aliens etc cetera, etc cetera, are all the same thing Oh, so, yeah. Well, it wasn't that one. Oh, the Mothman prophecy guy was big on that, too, I think. He was. Yeah, you're right yeah. about that. You yeah. are right. John Keel really was into that theory. I love The Eighth Tower. That's such a good book. Yeah, um, I want to read that. Captain Black is more metal than Spinal Tap. He's right, man. It is. It is so fucking sick. I mean, truly, it is. So when I listen to Rush, I immediately start to picture scenes from Book of the New Sun. I, like, I feel in my gut my body feels like Gene Wolfe was listening to Rush at some point, like very heavily during this process, because I just like, I don't know how to explain it. Maybe it's because to me, music is so fundamental to my writing process, but when I'm imagining works specifically, I am listening to music usually a lot, repeatedly. And I just like, I feel the rhythm of Rush and the feeling of Rush, like when I listen to Spirit of the Radio and a bunch of other things sometimes just like embedded in Book of the New Sun. So yeah, I feel like if you like heavy metal and that goes for also the, the, the comic book and the cartoon, definitely. If you, if you like the aesthetic of heavy metal comics, you'll fucking love Book of the New Sun. If you like Aeon Flux, you'll love Book of the New Sun. Actually, there is a really funny essay in Castle of the Otter where he's basically talking about how he was jealous of other authors at sci-fi conventions because uh, they all had people cosplaying as their characters and he wanted characters that people could cosplay as. And he was like, well, what's a really easy thing that people can do? Well, men can just take off their shirt and put on a mask and wear a cloak and carry a sword that's like, check, everybody will want to be that lazy. And so that's why he like partially, or it's why he claims he designed Severian that way. Um, so <laughs> there's a lot of really funny essays 
man, I'll, let me tell you, I got Castle of the Otter. Oh, I was devastated. So Jean died um, on, what was it, April? Yes, it was April 14th of 2019. And then let me just double check my fact here because I forgot to write it down. Uh, the Notre Dame fire happened uh, the next day on the 15th. And it's like very thematically appropriate and sad because of course he was such a devoted, intense Catholic for his adult life that like, it was just like, I'm glad he didn't have to see that. But oh, yeah. you have a more powerful symbol of what just <laughs> happened. It seemed ordained somehow. Um, so it's like, but what I, I like, I was in horrible mourning. I didn't hear until the day after the Notre Dame fire that Jean had died. And I was minding my own fucking business. And my boyfriend comes down and he goes, I'm sorry about Jean Wolf. And I just like stopped what I was doing and fell, fell apart. It was horrible. And, um, but I got on to like Etsy, I think the next day, cause I knew they had rare books sometimes or I like looked, maybe I just Googled for the castle of the otter specifically. And I found this copy for like fucking 15 or $20 on Etsy. And so I instantly grabbed it. I was like, there's no way I can't turn that down. And then I'm glad I did. Cause I was looking the other day and it's like a hundred dollars now. Amazon, but yeah. I'll tell you what, people don't fucking pay attention to the books they put on Amazon, so if you just stay on the lookout. I got a copy of The Consumer for like $15 or $20, and that book is over $100 easy if you want it now. So it's like, just, just look. Sometimes booksellers don't even check, and they make assumptions, and they're wrong. <laughs> so. what, what, is that like... Is that the, does that wow. tell the actual price or the like the worth of a of a any specific book? Is that what you're talking <laughs> about? The consumer? Or? Yeah. Oh, oh no, the consumer by Michael Jura, the book. Oh yeah, the, the that wait yeah. a minute. You don't think that's who uh Jared was talking about, do you? Michael I Jared. was fucking wondering. I like wanted it to be Michael Jura, but I don't know if it is because I don't know. I wouldn't Well he doesn't do death metal. Yeah, I wouldn't call death him metal. death metal. But I, don't I know, wanted it. It kind of reminded me of that. If I'm, I know. Well, I like cop and all the early no wave stuff. Definitely yeah. is very greed, holy money. Fuck, screw is one of the best songs ever written. Fucking fight me. It and is so good. Was, the consumer was better than uh, some like professional horror author collections. Yeah. Uh, the, yeah. yeah. The fucking consumer is excellent, and then I have another. I have a more recent collection of his called The Egg, that he sold before one of his newer albums came out, and it also looks like really fucking good. But I don't think I've had a chance to read it yet, except for like what? No, there were a couple of stories I did get a chance to read in there, and they were like. You know how the, the stories in the consumer are. <laughs> it was, yeah. So it was like, it was still kind of like, okay, I, I need to be in the right mood for this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the consumer, if you um, aren't ready for just how fucking dark and nihilistic those stories are, they'll really punch you in the face. Jesus. Yeah, it's really, it's like, it reminds me a little bit of Junji Ito or Shintaro Kago, too, just in terms of like the really like bass like low vibration aesthetic where it's just like that well it's like his music you know his, that low kind of long droning note structure i've seen swans live three times and michael Jura live once and i saw michael Jura live in the uh uh it's i think it's just called the old church in portland and it is like it was such an appropriate experience. He's like such a cool dude and so down to earth. And his music is to me really like deeply spiritual in nature. And I, I know it is to him too. And uh, it's just it's so great to get to see him live. And it was like just to see him in the church. It was like ha. But my he signed my copy of the consumer for me, man. Let me That's tell you awesome. this fucking story. Let me tell you this shit. Okay. So this is like my favorite story of all fucking time. So far, anyway. <laughs> so, man, I can't tell without smiling. I went to the Crescent Ballroom show in Phoenix in like 2011, I think, maybe, or 2012. 2012 sounds right. And 
So I took a Greyhound bus up and I stayed by myself because I was living in Tucson at the time. And uh, I uh, stayed at this like seedy fucking dangerous ass motel that was like <laughs> literally two or three blocks from the venue because I knew I was going to. Yeah, I knew I was going to stumble back drunk as fuck, and I just wanted it to be easy. <laughs> so I, I got a coupon, though, attached to my, my ticket when I printed it out from the overpriced Ticketmaster website. That was, It was for a free burrito at the venue that day, and I was like, cool, I don't want to pay for fucking lunch. So I'm like, I go, I go to the venue, and I happen to have my copy of The Consumer in my purse because I'm going to read it to get myself amped up for the show. And, oh, man. So I, I order my burrito, and I sit down, and I'm trying to read the book, and I'm wearing – I'm already wearing my little Swans T-shirt with the filth teeth on it. it just says Swans and it's horrible teeth from that cover that's just so great. And I'm, like, eating and reading, and then – Michael Girard just like walks out in his cowboy hat, which he's always wearing a cowboy hat in pictures with journalists, but he always wears it when he's not performing. And sometimes when he is performing, it's just himself or I think with angels of light too, probably. But so I, I was like <laughs> eating, trying to like look at him, but not look at him. And then like, <laughs> I think I put the consumer away because I didn't want to look like I was just some kind of try hard and just like <laughs> minding my own business, like feeling my palms start to sweat and all the spaghetti is falling out of my pockets. And I'm like, <laughs> oh my God, I can't, I gotta leave. There's beans in this burrito. I didn't mean to order it with beans. I didn't want it. Like, I just, I need to go. I can't eat. And so I like, I get up, I, you know, I pay. I pay for my drink or whatever and I get up and I'm like shaking and I I leave and there's like this little because he's like come and gone a couple of times while I've been eating and he's like farted around and talked to the bartender and I've like just totally ignored him <laughs> and then I'm leaving and there's like this little enclosed patio area right off of, of the, the bar area and I'm I, I start to kind of walk down the street a little bit away from the venue and all of a sudden I just hear hey you can't wear that shirt around here and I turn around and it's Michael Girard standing on the other side of this enclosed patio and I'm all like flustered and hot just thinking about it and I like my brain shut off and I was like I know and I ran over it and I was like I love your work so fucking much. Like, truly, my, again, just like with Gene Wolfe, my father introduced me to Swans at a very early age. So this was music that was, like, already very familiar to me. But I got into it in a more personal and conscious way when I was in college for the first time. And then, uh, like, three or four years later, I'm at this, you know, show. And, and I he, like, calls me over to him. He calls me over to him. And I was like, will you sign my copy of The Consumer? And he's like, sure. And so he's like asking me about myself. And I'm like, oh, man, I'm a writer. And I think you're just a great writer. And, and you know, I just like, I see bleh, all the spaghetti came out. But it was great. He was so <laughs> wonderful and gracious and nice. And I'll get up in a minute and bring the book over so I can show off the autograph because it's cool as fuck. But it was like, it was just such a nice experience. And he's such a, he's like, you can tell he's just a really genuinely cool dude. Like, in a very, like, soul deep way. Who's, like, obviously very troubled because we're all troubled because he's a, we're humans. But it's like, damn, he is like, you know, just, it's it's really inspirational when you see an artist who's like so gracious and cool and down to earth and will do things like that. And then I got to talk to two of the other people who were on with swans at the time, uh, 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 Christoph Hahn and uh, not Thor, but I did see him having a beer at the bar. Anyway, damn, I wish I could remember the other guy's name, but Christoph Hahn uh, kept trying to hit people up for weed. He was like, 
Does anybody have any weed? This is a medical state, right? You know, and his little accent. It was, it was hilarious. It was great. It was such a fun night. And then the fucking show, they just knocked it out of the park. It was phenomenal. It was the, you know, honestly, the only concerts I've ever really been to have been jazz and classical concerts and like musicals and then swans i don't I, I, and like a couple like a velvet underground cover band when i was like 16 or 17 so it's like swans is like for me is music and live music and i just i love michael shabbat so let me go get my book i'll off. did you ever get to meet gene wolf oh i wish i wrote him a letter once actually um and <laughs> he uh, never did respond, but Neil Bimbo got him to friend him on Facebook, which is very cool. So here's my. Let's see. Yeah, see, it was 2012. So it says, M. Jira, thanks, Magda. I love you. And it's like, <laughs> I love you too, Michael. <laughs> Magda? Yes. Can I, yes. This is a bit of a discretion, but um, you know how um, Henry Rollins ran the, um, um, the, the, the imprint that put that out? Um, a friend of mine who used to be a stripper actually met Henry Rollins. Um, uh, she used, uh, while she was working at a strip club, um, she um, happened to have a book of like poetry that she wrote, and she gave it to Henry Rollins. And um, it, he said to her, what am I supposed to do with this? <laughs> and, and she said, I don't know, maybe you can jerk off to it. <laughs> because I guess he uh, <laughs> writes a lot about jerking off in his work. And, you know, she, uh, you know, he apparently said to her, get away from me. <laughs> and <laughs> she walked away for a minute and then just marched back to him and said, no, I put a lot of work into that book and I really wanted to give it to you. So you, right, so you take it. And he just said, Put his head down and said, "I'll read it." <laughs> Good, fucking ass. Yeah. I hope he felt bad. <laughs> Why do people get like that, man? <laughs> well, I've never heard a Henry Rollins story where he wasn't an asshole. I thought Ben was gonna like tell a like man bites dog story where he wasn't a dick, but no, no it was just another. Dog bites man, and around his asshole. <laughs> I mean, I can't knock him. He did do a lot in, um, you know, publishing works like, uh, oh, you know, the him. consumer, <laughs> and you know, helping to bring, uh, you know, uh, Hubert Selby Jr. to the forefront in regards to his work. But uh, yeah, he he himself is. He sounds like a real dick. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, these people are always dicks. It's like, you know, okay, this is, I won't go too much into James Levine, who you brought up earlier, Jeremy. That was so funny. Um, but it, what wasn't funny was his death. I found it very sad. But if you go and look in the subreddit for opera right now, there are all these people who are just like, good, I'm glad he's dead, good riddance, blah, 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 oh, well, Why? anyway, yeah, you know, cool. these Boy. people are really shitty, and it's like, <laughs> that's funny, <laughs> that's great, really, really <laughs> great. Apparently, Danzig is a bit of a dick, too. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that, and that, you know, you're not allowed, I, my father and my godmother claim to have gotten thrown out of a show one time, because they were like, putting all their hair in their face and then going around like this and going on doing <laughs> dancing. Da, 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 da. And then, you know, eventually they just got thrown out. It wasn't good. <laughs> but, His, uh, um, Danzig's appearance on uh, Aqua Team Hunger Force is really funny, though. Yes, yes, with the pool. <laughs> I'm, yes. I'm going to lay in this with the demons for the sacrifices. <laughs> Oh. Yeah, that's the best episode of that well, show for sure. Were you finished with the Gene Wolf thing, or was there a little more to that? Or oh, I'm still. I could go. I'm just going in all directions. Um, okay, cool. I do have uh, some more about Gene Wolf specifically. Um, which let's see, we've got his writing advice in Castle of the Otter, which made me laugh, and I feel like it is good stuff for uh, young writers to read. So, let's see. 
Um, he says three rules if you want to be a writer. First, don't. If you can stop yourself <laughs> from writing, you are not a writer. But you may not be a writer even if you cannot stop yourself. So that's his first <laughs> All point. you'll ever meet are cheaters and liars. <laughs> yeah. So rule number two is read. No matter how long, or no matter what you may long to believe, you cannot become a writer without tens of thousands of hours of reading. You cannot please the master until you have been a master and know what is pleasing. And then rule three is write. Writers do it. Would-be writers do not. Just as you can't learn to swim without floundering around in the water a lot, you cannot learn to write without writing. Harlan Ellison tells his would-be writer audiences that they should write a short story every day, 365 little stories over the next year. Is Harlan grandstanding with a piece of ridiculously exaggerated advice? And so, you know, you can see just in that how disciplined he was and how serious he was. And he has a collection of short stories, which I forgot to bring upstairs, um, called uh, The Isle of Dr. Death and Other Stories and Other Stories. And oh, I yeah, I've seen that. That gets yeah. recommended to me all the time on Goodreads. It's really good. You should check it out. Definitely. Um, it's really long, though. So for me, it's one of those short story books where I just... I, I really have to be in a mood for short stories. God, every, so, every time somebody mentions Harlan Ellison, I just cringe because Harlan Ellison is part of one of my biggest regrets ever. When I was working, uh, at, the, when I was working at the Chicago Reader, I reviewed like a new uh, book of his short stories. I forget what it was exactly, but he really liked my review and he called me at my desk and left a message about how I was the only person who got what he was trying to say, and it was just wonderful, and he thought I was a great new writer, and he wanted to talk to me, and he left me his phone number. Oh, uh, yeah, and I was so excited, but I am so autistic that I have a terrible time using the telephone. So it took me a couple of weeks to get up the nerve to dial his number. In the meantime, Somebody who had access to my desk who didn't like me deleted all of my messages uh, with with his phone number. Oh man! Yeah, uh, so, man. Yeah. Wow. So it's it's pretty amazing that uh, two people on this program have some sort of direct contact with Harlan Ellison. <laughs> You know, he liked you and he hated Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, you know, appropriate. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's about, it's about the consensus. Ooh, ouch, that was brutal, dude. Did you, <laughs> Everybody you loves Ann. Everybody loved Ann. Nobody loved Jeremy. He yep. told me that I, I should read all the Sherlock Holmes uh, books because it would teach me ratiocination and logic. Um, and also to get the fuck out of Tennessee, that little oh. like piece of green construction I mean, paper. Like, when was that? Uh, when was that that he wrote that? At the tail end of the of the thing, and it was this little little strip of green construction paper that was like folded around the bottom of the letter itself. It's like he was getting all like I don't know, second grader creative with it or something. <laughs> I mean, that might have made sense back when he was younger, where you actually had to, like, go to New York or whatever to be able to have a writing career, but that's definitely not the case anymore. Yeah. If anything, you want to stay the fuck away from those places because you can't afford to fucking live there. Right. Yeah. I'm not going to dig it out again right now because uh, she's in the middle of this with Gene Wolfe. But, uh, yeah, basically, you know, I, think he, I think he appreciated me writing him, but he played up the whole... You know, geez, it creeps me out when fans do this, you know. Uh, he played that whole angle with it and said, Jesus, Prince that. Michigan. He said, Jesus, Prince, Prince Michigan, why me? How do they find <laughs> What, what did was... you do? Send him a voodoo doll of yourself? Like, no, <laughs> I just gave this I mean... spiel about, oh, life is so confusing and I don't know what to do. <laughs> I don't want to write, but I don't know what it is. And then, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, you really picked I the right guy to go to with that. I, know. Yeah, I mean, no I don't know shit. if you've ever. <laughs> God, you were just looking to get hit. 
<laughs> I don't know if you've ever read his uh, G- Zeno Genesis essay, but you can s- see reading that essay why he'd be a little cagey about fans writing to him. Yeah. I, I'm not familiar. Yeah, it's, yeah it, I, some I, of the stories he has about you know bad fans are pretty uh, pretty disgusting. Man, I I just I I'll never be able to think about Harlan Ellison for the rest of my life without just feeling intensely guilty, stupid, and oh my God, why am I like this? And why was the telephone <laughs> invented just to torture people like me? And you know that's when I get in, that's when I get into the real deep like. The entire universe is just a conspiracy to get me personally <laughs> and the end of the self pity pool, you know, like you can paddle around in there. For the did, did you end up uh, the person who erased the message? Did you end up killing them in your girl detectives novel? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. So what, what he, he revisited um, the, uh, that whole universe with the Severian later on in life, did he not? With what the litany of the Long Sun or Book of the New Earth or something? I was yeah, actually so. <clears throat> <laughs> no, yeah, that's okay, Anne. There's oh. um, he's got several more series uh, that he ended up writing uh, in the structure. It's uh, Book of the Long Sun and Book of the Short Sun. And they're both set in the same universe, and they're each four books long. And each of the novels is like Book of the New Sun, uh, presented as a manuscript that's written down um, by the protagonist of the book. Um, And so it's, again, it's like this very close and very intimate relationship um, with, uh, I believe the first character that we follow is like a priest. I've just barely started Book of the Long Sun, but it's very thick um so i have to really take time to read it and his prose is very dense one of his influences was definitely uh nabokov and it really shows because it's he has a very similar very poetic style um that's also just very rich and very you know dense language and and that snotty fucking sci-fi encyclopedia article um called it florid and, you know, I guess he, he, there's not necessarily a slur in and of itself. So I'll let them say that it is sometimes quite florid, but so are some of the most beautiful hand signatures. So, okay. Gorgeous. <laughs> I mean, it's like. Uh, I probably should have, like, specifically marked some sections of peace that um ah oh man i just it's like i open the page and i just immediately get sucked in here this is actually kind of a good uh essence of his descriptive power return to the world i remember that cover that as his portrait uh the giant on the cover of return to the world is, is gene's portrait painted so, i guess clean so, shaven though right yeah it's clean shaven but it's him there's a fact for you. So this is from Peace, <clears throat> page 106, if you're following along at home. Between this paragraph and the last, I went to look for that foyer and for my knife, too. Have you never thought as you read that months may lie between any pair of words? Unfortunately, I made the mistake of trying to reach it by going through the house rather than going outside and around. I knew that that was what I should have done. But it is raining, a gentle spring rain. And though I would not mind getting wet, I had a horror of looking behind me and seeing the uneven trail of my crippled legs sinking into the soft grass. As it is, I feel I have been disobeyed. There is a Persian room with divans and carpets and wall hangings of embroidered silk and scimitars on the walls and huge stone jars. I know because I have been in it. But I am certain I have never told Barry Mead I wanted any such thing. If he or anyone were alive to hear me, I would be in a rage. As it is, why should I rage, and how can I? Barry's dead bones will not shake because I stamp on his grave, though my own would. I have a Persian room, hookahs and curtains of beads before latticed windows overlooking. Could it be Shiraz? I might as well enjoy it. I am sure I can find it again if need be. 
The door to the corridor opposite the picture of Dan French is giving me the box, whatever it was, a silver cigar lighter or something. When I was Dan French giving me the box, whatever it was, a silver cigar lighter or something when I was 50 on behalf of the employees down the corridor and through my Aunt Olivia's solarium with a smell of thinner and the little glasses of brushes and the drying palette, the fourth or fifth door, I think, on the right. <coughs> so, like, if you're following along, um, I, I like. Uh, Gene Wolfe loves memory and is very interested in memory. So maybe a good way to think about the book Peace is to familiarize yourself with a concept that I believe was recently discussed on the show while I was not here, which makes me sad because I love the concept of memory palaces. I think it's an incredible rhetorical tool. I, I fucking love to use it. And is it... Who wrote did we talk about memory palaces? Yeah, we did. <laughs> it's ironic that you have to ask. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You guys, we're talking about it, and I came in afterward, apparently, and I heard it mentioned, and I was like, ah, I missed it. No, I, I've vague, I, I vaguely remember. Yeah, it was with uh, Chris. Uh, okay, yeah. Um, but but what, what is it? What is it exactly? It's like a, an, an exercise in thought, right? It's a mnemonic device. It's just a mnemonic device. So it's like, you know, my very eager mother that just served us nine pizzas. What the fuck is it? I can't remember. But oh, yeah. it's 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 like a mnemonic device, but it's one that you picture it, like, it with just like symbolic imagery. And King's play to... King's play chess on fine green silk. Oh, okay. Which one is that? Right, but that's, you, uh, but you... that's for biology. Okay. Like it, it, how you kingdom, uh, phylum, uh, oh, I can't yeah, remember all yeah, of them. yeah, uh huh, yeah, but it's like, but you you do it in three dimensions and three dimensions in your brain by yeah. creating an actual place, right, to right. store things, right, store images associated with what it is, what it is you want to remember, wow, right, yeah. and there's a flow to it, so you like flow through the series of tableaus that you've created for yourself, right. and Cicero's original uh, conscriptions for the memory palace were that it should be um, uh, filled with like very shocking and like memorable and very like clear and imagery, so like things that are like just very absurd and very like easy to right. remember. Like I remember one of my friend's addresses by imagining him uh, juggling uh, the numbers of the address uh, in billiard balls while standing on a flaming car with the street number of the vanity <laughs> or the street is the vanity plate. That's one of my, my tableaus that I have in my memory palace. And, you know, so it's like, and it's one of those things where it's the more you use it as a tool, the better it is. But if you neglect it, then it just, you know, it's not going to do anything. Nah. It's like a form I'm, of a little, I'm a little scared of that. I'm pretty sure my memory palace would turn into a haunted house like that. <laughs> that would be pretty. That's actually, that's a, file that one away for uh, a story idea. Yeah. How old that's a good that one. Concept? Because I, I, I first heard of it when, uh, uh, in relation to Stephen King's Dreamcatcher, he used oh. that experiment to kind of outwit the alien who can read minds uh and it, it, it it's also he i think he references another book that came before dreamcatcher uh called the memory palace of matteo ricci or something mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what is this is dreamcatcher dream the one with the shit weasels yeah yeah <laughs> well some, uh, somebody just made a reference to C cicero so yeah, Cicero, and it was before Cicero. Cicero just like wrote a more streamlined kind of memory palace guide, whereas um, this was an existing rhetorical tool that was taught to uh, young politicians and other people learning rhetoric in Rome. So it was like a formalized method of remembering. And also it's like there is some association with like... It, <sighs> It's almost like in Dune, where um, the humans are like trying to make their brains into a computer, and yeah, the so, yes. yeah, yeah, and so there's like you're supposed to basically divide your memory palace tableaus into like a series of units based on position in like a zodiac, 
and mm -hmm. then uh, have a corresponding symbol based on the zodiac because of course these are this is like their life so like you know I don't know if it's the ram then you might have like someone disemboweling a ram and their intestines are spelling the name of your your friend's I don't know, their birthday, your friend's birthday. <laughs> I don't know. You know, it's whatever you need it to be. Um, right. So it's a, it, but it, it's, it's a very old device and it became, uh, then also it had a renewal around, I think like the Renaissance and kind of the enlightenment period. And then all of this is contained in a very good book called the art of memory by, Fra Ugh, I'm not going to do that to you. The art of memory <laughs> by Francis Yates. Um, which is a really good book and it really goes into that subject. And I, again, haven't completely finished it yet. I'm about halfway through, but it's big and long. And it's one of those things where it's just like, it's, it's just a lot. It's a lot of research and it's a lot of historical stuff that's really interesting. But, you know, I'm there for also just like the tools. Right. So it's one of those things. But, if you um, read anything by Jeffrey Ford, he he uses the Memory Palace. Um, I don't know if I have. He well, uses he the Memory the... Palace in, in a certain way, right? In one of his books, it's this uh, trilogy, the physiognomy, the physiognomist, or physio the physiognomy is the first book in a series, and there's like a trilogy, but they're all very loosely tied together. But Monstro City, he wrote that, right? Okay. No. That's Jeffrey Thomas. That's okay. Jeffrey Thomas. Jeffrey Ford wrote, you know, the physiognomy. The physiognomy? And, yeah. Yeah, okay. or, yeah. I don't know how you pronounce it, but that's how I pronounce it. But uh, and then uh, the beyond is one of the sequels to it. And then there's a third book. But I think that's the first place I've ever heard of the ever heard of the uh, concept of Memory Palace is from a, you know reading about those books or him reading about him talking about those books. But they're all they're all very good. And if you like Gene Wolfe, you would like Jeffrey yeah. Ford. So yeah. Totally. I will definitely now, check him out. I do want to go over several books that I finished this weekend before Gregor uh, does duck out. And I don't know when that'll be, Gregor, but I know you probably don't want to stay till midnight like before. So uh, do we want to start approaching the later years of Gene's career where it was like, um, I don't know. You said that the book, some books people said he, he got less creative on. I guess that would be Wizard Knight and stuff like that, right? No, Wizard Knight is highly acclaimed. Wizard Knight was really highly acclaimed and people really loved it. And in fact, that is also like very high up on my list of books to read. No, there, um, I think like Pirate Freedom was kind of lukewarmly received a little bit. Not quite as, it's a pirate novel uh, that has sci-fi elements and is awesome and sounds great to me. And uh, I think I bought it for my father and he said he enjoyed it. So, I mean, people can go to hell, I don't care. And um, oh, he's got the Sarpy Channel logo on the front, so he sold out. <laughs> oh no, that's interesting though. It would be nice to see a Gene Wolfe property on television or anything else. Um, there was one I can't remember. Was it an Evil Guest or maybe Home Fire? There is one that was set on a cruise. And people were, like, very snotty about it. And some of the receptions that I saw um, and just kind of saying, like, well, you know, this is his life. He's just an old man going on cruises now. And it's like, well, fuck you. He, you know, well, fucking people are going to write about what inspires them. And he, uh, he can go to hell. To me, all of the, the novels that he wrote, are very interesting and I want to read all of them. His final novel was Interlibrary Loan, which was never finished. And again, if you go and look at these fucking reviews, um, it's all these people who are like, this just, this ended so abruptly. I, I just don't understand it. It seems like it wasn't finished. And it's like, well, fucking, <laughs> yeah. Because he died. Yeah, and that's what yeah. kind of happens when you keep writing till you die. Yeah, that was, that was responsible for the Regina Watts tweet that came out like last year at some point where it was like, just remember, every novel you write is practice for the next novel you write until the last novel you write, which you'll die before you finish it and people will call it abrupt <laughs> and give it one star on Goodreads. So, I mean, I, I, I understand. Camp. 
I understand why people get frustrated with that, and part of that is the fault of like the uh, estate deciding, oh, this novel's half finished. Put it out anyway! It's that, and they didn't give him any kind of foreword or anything like that, I guess. So it's just like they didn't properly communicate the situation. And so people are like, I just don't understand why it's so abrupt. And it's like, fuck oh, you, you know? Yeah. And, and like the okay. complaint about him being an old man on cruises. Well, I'd like to see your millennial ass or whatever yeah. fight in Korea. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> You, you millennials have, are never going to be able to. We'll, we'll never be able to retire. We're going to have to yeah. keep working until our heart fucking pops and we just fall face first on wherever we're working, and then they'll well, just drag us out and eat us in a dumpster. Gen X will have to do that, but no one will notice. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, basically, everyone stopped caring about you uh, in after nine eleven happened. Actually, they they stopped caring about us after the condom broke, but. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, but yeah. Uh, Regina, was, you, oh, go ahead. It, it, it was. I was kind of interested in a tangent you seem to be feeling out earlier um, about uh, Wild being kind of a kind of a victim of his. Well, a a victim of his own, you know, verbal brilliance. And be a victim of the lowest common denominator. You know, people. You know, so, uh, 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 you know, I, it's been a long time since I read him, and I, I yeah. don't even remember what book it was. But you know, from what you're saying, he he might be going slightly over the heads of certain readers. So. <laughs> Yeah, I, I totally agree with that assessment. I mean, like, for instance, with Book of the New Sun, like, it is reveal after reveal after reveal after reveal. You know, it's like you can very easily go into Book of the New Sun thinking you're reading a fantasy novel. And yeah. I am not even sure that if you went into that novel with that perception, I don't know if you would realize that it wasn't a fantasy novel until a reveal that I think is a, like halfway through the second book because there's a oh, fuck. Okay. Ah, uh, there's no, don't go into no, it. It's I won't, bit, but there's yeah. like some really good shit. There's some good, good shit. And if you have already invested the time in book one, you need to read the rest because it is so ridiculously good in there, but they're like, it's very, you know, so I think people can be forgiven for thinking that it's a fantasy novel, but I think also too, I mean, there's so much about like, there is like so much Kabbalah in this book. It is insane. Like it is, it really goes into some really deep shit. Um, like very quickly and just continues to get deeper and deeper because it's very interesting in Kabbalah if you're at all familiar with you know like the Madonna thing with the red string throw it out Kabbalah is a very old and very interesting form of occultism and it's just a model of consciousness like the eight circuit model of consciousness that I've talked about before and so I feel like uh, it's very interesting that Severian, uh, it gets thrown out of the guild for practicing an act of mercy because the tree of life is divided into pillars and the one pillar is severity and the other is mercy. And so it's these two aspects of the divine that are being like constantly explored and tested and combined and confronting each other throughout Book of the New Sun. And so it's like it, very interesting. And then um, there's a lot like in Earth of the New Sun, he like specifically references uh, 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 there's a, a Sephiroth on the tree of life called Yasad, which uh, is like really important to like the it's it is the connection to the divine, you know, and so it's um, it, but there's a there's like a specific place in Earth of the New Sun called Yesod. And um, it's it's so interesting. It's it's like very like specifically he's 
following these ancient symbolic traditions. And he talks a lot too in Castle of the Otter about how dense with symbolism Book of the New Sun is and how just like, you know, he like just, he thought all of this through and he talks a lot about the um, poems that he opens the books with, you know, and how he chose those and, you know, just uh, the levels of symbolism in this book are just excellent. And, you know, it's like, I, I feel like a perfect reading companion is Carl Jung. Um, <laughs> you know, these two books are really good places to help you kind of understand. Uh, start with this one and then hit up this one. But um, maybe later, actually, I feel like hit up Aeon after you've done some digging around, maybe read The Mysterium if you can get your hands on it. My cousin actually sent me a text message of him holding a copy of The Mysterium that he finally broke down and got. So it's like, good job, Ethan. <laughs> Welcome to being incredibly and enjoyable at parties. <laughs> but <laughs> feeling cool. <laughs> so, so, it's like, you know, the young ant symbolism and dream yeah. wolf novels. It's like, that's nice. I'm going to go get another drink. I'm going to mm -hmm. come back never. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, most yeah. people have yeah. never heard of either person. Yeah. 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 You know, that kind of gets under my that kind of gets under my skin, though, because, like, due to this um, lowest common denominator just sort of filtering all the really smart, complex, interesting shit out of, you know, what gets carried to the next generation in the culture... You know, there's there's nothing wrong with uh, Vonnegut. Vonnegut's enjoyable, right. but it it really annoys me that um, because Vonnegut is so much easier to read and can make dumb people feel really really smart, that that's what that's what kind of came my way during adolescence instead yeah. of what well, I mean. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. So yeah, it's, goes, it's kind man. of so it goes. It's, it's kind yeah. of you, you kind of um I think you mentioned like Madonna getting into Kabbalah. Um mm -hmm. but you know Kabbalah is like was like this, you know, ancient esoteric Jewish uh, mysticism and it used to be that uh, you know Kabbalah was something that was only taught to like the most experienced of uh rabbis like older mystery. Jewish men. And right. yeah, now all of a sudden it gets uh it gets dumbed down into this uh into a slightly more respectable form of Scientology for celebrities. To, yeah, it was just like a new up. age bullshit thing is what they were trying to sell it as. I mean, with the Madonna stuff, but it's obviously, I mean, yeah. ancient and, and, and very interesting. Yeah, and I'm fascinated as a that. And as a result, you get that one, uh, you get that one movie that Guy Ritchie made that was apparently like a Kabbalah through a crime story. <laughs> it was really stupid. Oh, I've not heard of that, but. I can't remember Errors what it's called, but it's pretty Errors dumb. Of the human body, maybe. What? Errors of the human body, maybe. No, it's not. Let me see if I can find it real quick. The snatch, is it? Um, no, I, I think that was like his first movie. It's like, okay. um, let's see. <laughs> we got to We got to let Regina finish, but after we find that out. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry I keep interrupting. I just, I just, I'm, I'm waiting for her to like finally pump out the final wisdom. <laughs> sorry. Uh, and Jane, well, Jane Wolf. He was the, very the, prolific. Revolver, yeah, the, that's what it was he called. He was very prolific, uh, and it's okay. hard to say. I, I do have a final piece that I'll read from him after I've finished rambling because I feel like this piece really <laughs> exemplifies where he's coming from in all of his works. And it's like, you know, it really to me. But, um, uh, I, it's interesting, you know, uh, a lot of people are being more influenced by Gene Wolfe all the time. You know, you've got, uh, who was the fellow who wrote Armageddon and, uh, dead astronauts and oh, a couple um, of Jeff, Vandermeer? Jeff Vandermeer. Yes. Jeff Vandermeer is very influenced. I think by you, Gene I think you mean annihilation and not apocalypse. Yes, annihilation. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I saw those books come through the library all the time and I still don't remember their names, but their <laughs> covers are very striking. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, Jeff Vandermeer is very influenced by Gene Wolfe. You know, obviously I'm influenced by Gene Wolfe. Neil Bimbo, friend of the show and hopeful audience member in the future is, uh, uh, you know, influenced by Gene Wolfe. 
Neil Gaiman is influenced by Gene Wolfe, and Neil Gaiman is influencing young readers all over the world all the time. So it's just, you know, Gene Wolfe is the true literary grandfather of sci-fi for this generation, whether they know it or not. And I guess that's the final wisdom of Gene Wolfe. And like all, I'd also like to give a shout out to Gene Wolfe in this era of ours for dying a nice old Catholic man without any sexual harassment controversies. Thank you, Gene, <laughs> for not doing anything <laughs> to anyone. <laughs> and there are, by the way, I've heard that there's some like just general, like it's like, you know, you'll, you'll read like a fucking Wikipedia article or a sci-fi encyclopedia article and they'll vaguely mention quote unquote feminist criticism of a piece and not really even fucking cite their source or elaborate or whatever. And it's like, you know, I, I, I don't care. I'm a woman. And to me, it's kind of like with the harem novels, you know, it's men's adventure novels. And this is just, these are the tropes. And he has a lot of strong female characters and interesting female characters. And I, in fact, got my job as a librarian in part because I had just finished reading Peace, which, you know, has a librarian character in it. And it just, the job opening came up and it seemed like a cool synchronicity. And I got it, even though I don't have a library degree. So it was like, your library sciences degree, a library degree, Jesus. See? <laughs> so, but Same I thing. still got the fucking job. We know what you mean. And we knew what you It meant. was great. It was a wonderful experience. And, and because of that job, I'm sitting right here because I used the money from that job to start Regina Hall's career. So it's like you can fucking thank Gene Wolf for this whole conversation. So thank you, Papa Wolf. I love you. And I wish you were my other grandpa. And so with that in mind, because he was such a good Catholic grandpa to all of the sci-fi community, I want to read my favorite like paragraph that he probably ever wrote. Two paragraphs, I guess. Uh, this is from Castle of the Otter. He says, What pain does do is act as a motivator in all sorts of less than obvious ways. It is responsible for compassion and a hot foot. It makes people who do not believe God would permit it think about God. It has been remarked thousands of times that Christ died under torture. Many of us have read so often that he was a quote unquote humble carpenter that we feel a little surge of nausea on seeing the words yet again. But no one ever seems to notice that the instruments of torture were wood, nails, and a hammer. That the man who built the cross was undoubtedly a carpenter, too. That the man who hammered in the nails was as much a carpenter as a soldier, as much a carpenter as a torturer. Very few seem even to have noticed that although Christ was a quote-unquote humble carpenter, the only object we are specifically told he made was not a table or a chair, but a whip. And if Christ knew not only the pain of torture, but the pain of being a torturer, as it seems certain to me that he did, then the dark figure is also capable of being a heroic and even a holy figure, like the black Christ carved in Africa. And so I feel like that's very, that's, he's talking about Book of the New Sun and the character of Severian with that. And so really ultimately what Book of the New Sun and what a lot of his work is, is a form of Catholic parable. So it's like, haha, atheist, we got your ass again. <laughs> we snuck it in on your asses there, buddy. But, so I just, I no, really, in all seriousness, I love Gene Wolf. Uh, his influence cannot be understated. And uh, you should read his work again. If you're like not into sci fi, read Peace. Um, well, I mean, he's maybe. not really even a sci-fi writer, really. He's a he's a he's, writer who happens to be using yeah. some of those toys, right? I mean, yes. it has nothing. I mean, it's really not the same. Thing. It's about the symbolism and about the memory, and I mean, like I I talked about Latro, yeah. So I mean, he's got different all kinds. Of it, he does what's right. For what is it with these fucking cunts out there? Not a single one of them can afford a muffler. Fucking get it's a life. Motorcycle people, they they do that Every because uh, fuck off. I'm sorry. They're, they're revving their uh, they're revving their motorcycles and because they're, they're trying to. <laughs> Go ahead, Regina. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh no, they that's okay. That I'm the... I'm done. I'm I'm summed up. I feel like that sums it all yeah. up pretty well. Regina, yeah, I'll be I'll be revisiting him after after this discussion. I mean, I knew much of what you 
said in this discussion, I'm not saying it wasn't worth listening to. I'm just saying, like, I was familiar yeah. with a lot of what it is that you're talking about uh, yeah. related to Gene Wolfe, because a lot of what you were fascinated uh what what fascinates you by, about Gene Wolfe is what fascinates uh, myself as well because yeah. it's just I don't know he seems to be yeah. very uh, I don't know I don't I don't need to I guess really go into it because you did a, a fine job so but yeah I'll be he won a uh, yeah um, lifetime yeah, that, award or something right yeah I think it was was it Locus who gave him that he probably he yeah a, he seemed to be yeah. one of their favorites which is a little bit odd considering that it seems like you know that's a you know godless group of snakes that run that that (laughs) well Uh, you know good writing is good writing and you can't argue with it and it's like you know that he fucking has like you know the living ship trope that's really popular in anime right now and you know i i just feel like there are a lot more properties in the world that are influenced by gene wolf's writing than we even really think about oh yeah sure yeah yeah. Yeah, but like because we said he's like the writer's writer, right? So I mean, you're getting a lot of these Gene uh, Gene Wolf tropes or ideas secondhand, right, from the people right. that are inspired by him. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Obviously. And also, by the way, this is a good one if you want just kind of a light read. Again, I haven't completely finished it yet, but it's very Pandora solid and fun. By Pandora Holland. by Holly Hollander. That's one and, of the titles within the title things. Again. Yeah. So again, he's got the protagonist who's writing a story for you. And I think this one is he is Gene Wolf, that is, is Miss Hollander's literary agent in this case, in the way that I am Regina Watts's uh, literary agent and editor. So he uh, has an introduction uh, to Holly Hollander that's very charming. And then the novel goes on. So it's a very, it's like, it's just more, I feel like it's more lighthearted and easy to get into and it's a shorter one and it's, you know, so it's like, if you want something straightforward and heavy, go for peace. If you want something lighthearted and kind of shorter, maybe go for Pandora Pandora by Holly Hollander. If you want something that's like Book of the New Sunlight, Fifth Head of Cerberus is sick as fuck. But again, do not read the afterword of peace. By Neil Gaiman. <laughs> I'm so mad <laughs> every time I think about it. Well, what did he do like, again? <laughs> what, what happened in that he episode? Had, he spoiled the, the spoiled the the book. The yeah, book. he had like a really fundamental, cool spoiler for Fifth Head of Cerberus in the afterward for Peace. And I remember like my boyfriend was asleep in bed, and I'm like reading the afterward in the dark, going, "God." Peace was just such an amazing book. I got to see what you have to say, Mr. Gaiman, because I respect your opinion. And I get like two pages in and I see the spoiler and it was like, you know, and Kill Bill when it zooms in on Uma Thurman's <laughs> eyes and dee do dee do. You know, it was like this horrible. And I immediately tried to erase it from my brain and I just couldn't get it to erase because just trying to erase it made it drive in there harder. And it just, I can't, you know, now I just know what it is. So. Penguin yeah. books are particularly oh. bad for that, where they they will have a forward, an introduction, and each uh, one by a different author or some sort of scholar spoiling the thing in a different way. Now, you want to talk about people who spoil it, but they are respected for it and lauded for it. Uh, right when you're getting ready to start the book, they're there to tell to tell you all the important themes instead of you defining you know, finding them yourself. I don't know why yeah. Penguin does that. Forces all these different introductions in because they want to put a, a <laughs> modern <laughs> author that people know in front of the on on the on the cover of the book, so they'll more likely pick it up. Oh, yeah. this is a classic. You should know what the, what it is by cultural osmosis. Yeah, yeah. it's disgusting. <laughs> yeah, um, but um, yeah. yeah, I really appreciate all the work you put into that. Um, yeah, it, likewise. Especially like compared to what I did with my J.G. Ballard one, where I just pulled up Wikipedia and stuttered through it like a complete dumbass. That was I, fucking, yeah. I um, love Gene Wolfe. And, I mean, the five essays that I have about him on Pain and Blind Publishing are, I mean, it's like probably about 50,000 words total across those five essays. So it's is, like that is, is, he, is that Izzy? Yeah, that's Izzy. He's a- Izzy. <laughs> I'm out of yeah. here. Uh, so I'll probably return to the book of the new sun is probably where I'll go after. Definitely. Yeah. Don't back up. Don't make the mistake of, of rereading it. Just roll with it. I mean, honestly, I feel like, and you'll be like, 
I was so disoriented when I went on to the second book of the the tetralogy because it's like really disjointed from the end of the first book. And I was like, is this on purpose? Like what the fuck? Right. Um so but I think it's partly because he just originally wrote first the forty thousand word novella that's like the first because it's like also let me tell you, readers who are reading Book of the New Sun, I want you to know that the first the very first part of Shadow of the Executioner is um, what they call in the industry today a slow burn. So just kind of hang out with it and get yeah. through those 40,000 words. My old boss at the window company was this Texas guy, and he always used to say about books, he says, I like to give books, I like to read the first 100 pages before I decide to put it down. Because uh, you don't know, it hasn't even started for the first 100 pages. And I was like, damn, you know, the man's right. <laughs> That's a long time to stick with the book. But I feel like if you will just plow through the first 100 to 150 pages of uh, this, you know, thousand page work, basically, you'll be richly rewarded for it. So just. Yeah, it. I might listen. If there's an audio book version, I might listen to it again. That's what I'm doing yeah. with Dune because I want to read the rest of the Dune series this year. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, I, I look on my uh, uh, library's website, and they have uh, the Island of Doctor Death and other stories and other stories. And given that Goodreads uh, keeps recommending that to me, I'm assuming the universe wants me to read that book. Yeah, so I'm gonna check oh, that out should. next time I'm there. You'll be hooked from the first story. The first story is like calculated to lure you in just by tapping into the child you were when you were first discovering your love of reading. Uh, it will like take you back there immediately, and it's so wonderful. So definitely read that book. Read the short stories in it. It's great. Yeah, definitely. And I'll definitely be checking out Peace at some point. Oh, got to, got to. Um, so yeah, you've definitely set the standard, uh, set the bar, you know, uh, for for doing these author spotlights. Now, I did want to ask, like, uh, who wants Gregor? Do you want to go next? Like next next week. With an uh, I'm, I'm, I miss this as being a thing, right? Like it seemed like I joined the program. What was it last week? And Ben was into this thing. Like I missed the missed the memo on this. <coughs> was, Am I audible again? I'm sorry. They she unplugged me again. <laughs> I, I can hear you. Muffled? You're muffled. Yeah. A little muffled. Hang on. I'll but, be um, but yeah, Gregor, it's basically just you know what Regina did and what I did. You know, you just pick a author who you're really into um you know talk a bit about their history their works what you think of their best works their worst works things like that mm. but when was this discussed because i seem like i missed what I, whenever that happened uh was this discussed before. offline or, or, or well online? i mean well yeah online i mean okay. jeremy's in tennessee i can't talk to him offline well i mean off you know online meaning this program what about now yeah you sound fine okay um, Gregor, you got a little, you got a few, a few more minutes so I can, uh, yeah, yeah. But was this discussed on this program and I just wasn't here when it was discussed? What, which part? The, you should you have, know, uh, talk about your favorite author. Or I, brought talk about a I brought it up to Ben a few days before last week's show. And, uh, he said, well, I'm, I'll do JG Ballard. And, and when, when it was just me and him for like the first 15 minutes, we uh, thought, well, let's just go ahead and do that now, you know? And, okay, uh, I got you. and he okay. just kind of did it on the spot, you know, it was, right. you know, but, but Regina kind of set the standard for future ones. Do you, would you want to do one uh, on an upcoming show? Maybe I'd have to think about it. Right. Cause I mean, you know, I, I mean, I really like Philip K. Dick, but everybody in the fucking world knows about his deal. Right. So I, mean, I have to come well, up with somebody. You know. Not if you focused in on individual, you know, books, yeah. like you went through the different ones. Cause uh, if you, if you're not going next week, I'm, I might do one on Brandon. Well, you should Perry. go next week. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to, okay. I'm going to do one on the new week. I'm going to do one on a newer author called uh, named Brandon Faircloth, who is really conceptually outstanding author. He writes a lot of short story collections, but uh, oh yeah, yeah, I think the dude's wild. He's, he, just to give you a sample, I mean, one of his collections is called "My Uncle Makes Dolls uh, for <laughs> Replace Souls in Hell." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> is that is it like creepy pasta shit? 
No, no, it's it's like literary, uh, like literary yeah. horror. You know, it's sophisticated. Like Edgar Allan Poe, if he had like a uh, a, a wider palette, you know, that sometimes flirted with like multiverses and sword and sorcery uh, wow. and magic, you know. But uh, yeah, Brandon Faircloth, that's one author I've discovered recently who is just outstanding. And yeah, and I bought a book on your recommendation. I haven't read it yet. I'm going to read it in May. Him and Thomas Kleckler are two of my favorite newer uh, authors. Kleckler's been on here before. He did that one with the awesome cover, Bound by Rights. And Subcutanea. Yeah. Vagina Face guy, yeah. And, uh, yeah, Subcutanea. Uh, Peel the Banana or something like that. Uh, all sorts of them, yeah. Okay. But, yeah, I, uh, think, um, I think at some point, and doing one on someone like uh, Octave Mirbu or Hoinsmans would be pretty interesting. Who? Uh, uh, JK yeah, Reed, think, Reasonable. He's uh if if um Regina wants another Catholic fix, uh Weasel yeah. is a really interesting case study in uh H U Y S M A N S. Well look up uh, against Thank nature. You. I think that's his most popular book. Uh, oh yes, I've seen that book. Okay, interesting. That and um La Bosse, I think is also a pretty popular one. Yeah, I was oh, supposed yeah, to yeah, I have read La Boss, yeah. I was supposed to be um co-writing uh, a sort of a biography of Wiesmall and his like sort of vacillating between Catholicism and like almost Satanism. Um yeah. but it, but it was for uh Feral House and then oh, the Feral House died. died. Yeah, then Adam died before mm. before yeah. I got to the editing stage, so that book yeah, may so. never be but but yeah. he is the world's very, been worse off since uh, Parfrey passed. It it really has. It really has. He he was filling a very important niche that I don't think anyone else is going to be filling anytime soon. No, I mean um, his his company carries on, but the people he sort of bequeathed it to, you know, he and he kind of had to because I think it was his sister or something. They just don't have the sort of uh, adventuresome spirit that he has. You know, they, I don't think they even considered keeping the Wee Small uh, on because just too, he was yeah. too extra. So they didn't even. <laughs> okay, I'm going to be sick, but when I get back, I'll talk about those books. Carry oh. On. <laughs> oh, Jesus. But uh, yeah, um, I think it would be, um, it'd be great for you to talk about. Uh, Weisman or maybe Akeem okay, Mirbu. I mean, you even the translated that. Uh, happened there. <laughs> no, great. <Gregor. laughs> Apparently, his pills had a bad just reaction. So cool. Oh man. <laughs> so or maybe cool. it's like uh, one of his uh, one of his cats pissed on his bed earlier, so maybe the smell is getting to him. Yeah. Yeah. Or or am I that unbearable that he has to take all the feed in the house just to talk to me? We- Weisman is totally- a bit. Weasman can be a bit too much. I mean, if you tried reading uh, Against Nature all at one time, it'd be like uh, binging on like an eight-course gourmet meal. Yeah, yeah. well, I, I want to read it. It sounds, because to me, like, I totally get, like, the vacillation between Catholicism and Satanism is my fucking life. And that was, like, Gene Wolfe is just, like, totally exploring that. I mean, that, you know, the section I just read about his perception of Christ is, you know, knowing the pain of the torturer and forgiving his torturers and also, you know, only being depicted in the Bible as ever having made a fucking whip, you know, for the purposes of our narrative. And <laughs> I, I feel like that is really the kind of, like, dark, shadowy, you know, I mean, he talks about the solar imagery in the titles of his books and how, like, he literally is calling it the shadow of uh, the torturer and the claw the conciliator is also a solar symbol in the book and so it's like this very you know very distinct like pattern of uh the very dark versus the very light i think like all catholics are very familiar with the weird uh (laughs) depictions of martyrs and how like just you know totally like sexually violent all those stories are Yes. And how just like incredibly hardcore and and crazy they are, especially yeah. to teach the um, kids. Yeah, I know I, that I uh, the 
Um, I know that the uh, Japanese author Yuki Omishima talked about um, in one of his books, the first thing he ever masturbated to was uh, St. Sebastian being uh, shot <laughs> by arrows. Hell yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> totally get it. It's I really not. like... If you, <laughs> Anyway, uh, well, sorry to interrupt. What were you going to say, Anne? No, no. I, well, I was going to kind of continue along that vein because, like, even just the most basic imagery of St. Francis reclining back and having ecstatic visions of the Lord, he'll have, like, the crucifix positioned in his lap like he's gotten an erection. There's, like, <laughs> Bataille. Oh, man, I would love to do one of these author spotlights about Bataille who just, like, oh, you know, yeah, I would literally no, the book <laughs> eroticism. Uh, we could... Yeah, we could try making that like a collaboration between the two of us yeah, because I could be definitely do that. Yeah, I, I love but, the um, book Eroticism, Death, and Sensuality, but, and he really sums up the whole thing that, you know, Gene Wolfe is talking about and Wagner is talking about, and it sounds like this, ooh, I'm sorry, what's his name again? Repeat for me. Wiesmore. 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 It's, like a, it, it's like a German name that's been Frenchified, so uh -huh, that's why yeah. it's so I, mm. I always pronounce it Hoisman's, which is wrong, of course, because I'm a stupid American. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, but, what I was going to say is, is that the first time I went into uh, a Lutheran church, I was kind of shocked because they didn't have bondage Jesus on the cross. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. It's like, is it really a crucifix if it doesn't have sexy Jesus bleeding? Well, no, it's not a crucifix like... if it doesn't have like, Jesus on there. It's yeah. A cross. Whenever I yeah. see no, Jesus true. up true. on that cross, I can't help but think that he looks kind of hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's got that sort of like, uh, what do you call it? Consumption victim pallor to him. Yeah. <laughs> He is losing all his blood, but it's it's he's that a, is that, got that six he's got that six pack in those and a killer beard. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the violence and and the nakedness and the pain. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's all just especially like with women, it's always linked to rape. You know, Saint Dymphna, the patron saint of mental illness and incest, who denied the advances of her father and ended up having her head cut off or. St. Lucy, who had her fucking eyes cut out when she wouldn't oh. go to the brothel or get raped by the guy who was courting her. And, you know, I, just all I think oh that I've seen a, I think I've seen a painting of that. Isn't it like a, a woman holding like a, a chalice or something with her eyes floating in it? There, you know yeah, there's, that's a very popular motif. Yep. They she put her eyes in a dish. It's a variable. Sometimes they cut them out as a punishment, and sometimes in some versions she cuts them yeah, out like, and puts them in a dish I, and offers them. Like uh, right next to me, I actually have a print of uh, Salvador Dali's uh, "The Temptation of Saint Anthony." And, oh, you know, that's got that like uh, the giant uh, naked women and everything. That's fucking cool, man. I love Salvador Dali. I have a big uh, he, illustrated he Bible would, of his. Yeah, he would be another good one of uh, someone who facilitates between uh, decadence and uh, uh, religion. Yeah, because definitely. you know he had like a lot of those, um, you know, uh, erotic paintings and such. But he, uh, you know, he was also very religious. He had a lot of yeah. religious paintings. I oh, love that. Yeah. yeah, man. No, he's great. And um, oh, what's the one that uh, is talked about in the uh, Ballard novel, Atrocity Exhibition, the Christ one? It's like the fourth dimensional Christ or whatever the fuck. You know what I'm talking I, about. I think I know which one you're talking about. It's like ah. Jesus on a weirdly shaped cross or something like that. Yes, okay. damn it. What is it? Yeah, I'm looking it up at the speed of light. Yeah. Um, There's, no. Yeah, uh, Barry Malzberg actually has a... Uh, a story collection called the destruction of the temple. Um, and it actually like, uh, uh, like some of the covers depict, uh, John F. Kennedy as a, uh, um, Jesus figure bleeding from his head. Oh yeah. That's great. Man. Very interesting. Are you feeling uh, better? They, uh, are they eyeballing you at the, at hi, the buddy. register this time? And <laughs> oh, no, 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 I don't are you okay, Germany? Are you going to be dead soon? Mm -mm. Just getting warmed up. <laughs> oh, good. You got your second win after uh, puking your guts out. Yeah. 
It's Corpus Hypercubus is the painting. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know what you mean. Oh, I thought you were saying that's what Jeremy had. That, no, it's the painting. <laughs> He the uh, the spirit of uh, the corpus hypercubus Jesus entered Jeremy and he had to vomit because it was too much. Yeah. Yep. It was just too much. <laughs> yeah, so Jeremy, what is it that you want to talk about? I'm get, I'm I'm pulling them up. Yeah. Paper uh, okay. Charlie, do not. Can you can you mute for a second, Ann? You can I'm, mute I'm, I'm trying. Try. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Okay. So, uh, I know I tried to discuss Bonestead and Feathers last week, but I didn't exactly, you know, succeed. <laughs> Basically, this, this girl named Odette uh, learned how to be a witch from her mother. And like I said before, she made herself impervious to fire, uh, which came in handy when the witch finders came for her and her family. Unfortunately, they burned her mother at the stake. And her sister went to live at the capital where the real witches, you know, professional witches, you know, hide. Basically, this this whole uh, book is by Gwendolyn Keist, Boneset and Feathers, is, is about Odette finally, you know, learning to battle the witch finders. And uh, she even communicates with uh, horses at one point and gets them to turn on their their um, their riders, which is incredible. You know, I mean, it's just a lot of uh, she's got a lot of tricks up her sleeve. And, uh, you know, I like that Gwendolyn Keist used everything available from witch lore and history of, like, say, the Salem witch trials. She didn't use any cheating plot twists or anything. She just used what was available from the whole, you know, thing of witches versus alleged witches and witch finders and witch trials. And, um, you know, uh, she paints a vivid portrait of the witch finders, basically just, you know, you know, uh, making an, exa an example out of any strong-minded woman back then they're really sleazy characters you know um even a necromancer looks like an angel a saint next to these characters um who will who will turn on their own naturally you know in order to curry favor or to get what the they, the person they want to burn you know uh so I mean, that that, I, that could potentially go on my year-end list cruel summer i talked about earlier charlie you gotta get down honey. damn it <laughs> Okay. Uh, Cruel Summer I talked about earlier. Th th these these this family, uh, you know, goes on summer vacation to this little you know town in Florida. That's a vacation hotspot, and um, and and for some reason, uh, the mom takes decides that she's going to break up with uh, the the her boyfriend. You know, when they're out on the water in a boat, and he's. <laughs> trying to propose to her yeah and naturally it doesn't go good at all which i mean that that was a really bad to, you know choice on her part as a yeah. character is kind of dumb yeah. um like i said i liked this book a lot more when it was early on uh as it progressed i started losing more and more you know uh satisfaction with the plot uh, because it veered too much into supernatural territory and all we're talking about are sharks and so for them to, you know, for him to tap into, you know, mythology of like, you know, Cetus, the shark god or whatever, C-E-T-U-S, and, and the monster hunter Perseus, I, I felt like it was reaching a bit. And like I said also to Jared earlier, there's a character that gets introduced halfway through the book and he dominates from then on. And it just felt really like reckless and out of place. Uh, so I haven't read any of Wesley Southern's books before, but I can see that he's a talented hand, you know, to tell a story. But for me, it would not be this one that I would recommend of his. Uh, I spoke a minute ago about Brandon Faircloth. Whimsical Leprosy is a really outstanding collection. This is my first exposure to him. And uh, the first story in the book, man, is really cruel with the way that the, the antagonist is able to deceive this innocent, you know, woman who's seeing her father, her long estranged father, or what she thinks is her father. And he's, you know, trying to talk her into doing this magical ritual thing or whatever, where she agrees to, you know, pay penance for him in this shadow dimension for like seven years. He's like, seven years. That's all. It goes by in a flash. And then she agrees and she's bound. She's like no longer, you know, 
uh, acknowledged by other humans as a human being. She's stuck in this little twilight limbo realm, you know, like following the commands of this shapeshifter who wasn't her father anyway. Because she then she sees her real father walk by. It's really sadistic, this Faircloth guy, uh, what he puts his characters through sometimes. Uh, so she sees her real father and tries to go to him, and he doesn't even recognize her. And then she says, it's not fair. I was tricked. You deceived me. And he says, it doesn't matter, bitch. You know, you're all mine now, and you're never going to get out of there. The planet will die, and you'll still be under my thrall. Really cold, cold-blooded shit, you know? Mm. there's an element of Brandon Faircloth's work that like, you know, it, it makes me uncomfortable, you know, because, because of the, the ruthlessness for which he tortures his characters, but it's not torture porn. It's too, uh, it's too sophisticated for that. And so I'm going to be doing the deep dive on his, uh, several of his books this, this week, uh, in preparation for next week. Um, there's another story. I think my favorite story in this collection, though, has to do with a woman who is um, who is like basically immune to being killed. They they call she's called like the deadened or something or the deadless, the death deadless. Um, is it me? <laughs> you're, no. the, uh, you're the IRL deadless. I, I, yeah, <laughs> I, I could picture it, but. No, the the deadless is like a really effective uh, component to have in certain rituals uh, for people, you know, necromancers who want to, you know, affect the world they live in. Um, so they they this family of uh, you know sorcerers grab this woman and they shoot her through the head in the head five times and then it heals away instantly like the bullets don't even exist in her head anymore and they do this to prove that she's a deathless a deadless uh entity and um then they take her and bury her alive embalm her and mummify her and then bury her underground for uh again seven years which is a thing that seems reoccurring and uh, people in tight, confined spaces, in boxes or dark dimensions that feel like boxes or buried alive. This is a recurring element throughout this book, Whimsical Leprosy, throughout each story. Uh, I, I mean, he's going hard for that kind of symbolism of being locked away, you know, in a box, uh, buried alive, you know, sentenced to limbo. Like I said, really cruel author and really cool author, too. But uh so, so uh, what's interesting is that while she's, you know, buried alive, uh, she keeps thinking, I'm going to die. They got it wrong. They're crazy. But she keeps on living and she eventually uh, comes to hear a voice in her head that is death itself saying, hey, when you get out, you want to you want to you want me to help you fuck them up? <laughs> and since she agrees to that. Uh, and instantly turns on those who thought to use her as a fetish, a living fetish doll in future rituals. Uh, but, you know, she, with the combined power of death and her own abilities, she wreaks revenge on them or starts to. Uh, that story kind of ends abruptly. Um, could have He could have taken it further. But, yeah, a lot of really chilling stories in this one. You know, he's like... Uh, sophisticated with it though in a way that like poe was with the cask of amontillado we've all read that you know another instance of burying someone alive because yeah you know of, of or uh the fall dark, of house of the house of usher dark or antigone huh? or antigone if you want to go way back antigone that's greek myth right yeah that's that's sophocles okay um and then we, everybody remembers Jarrett Brandon Early coming on la, uh, like a few weeks ago, right, to talk about the rot inertia. I mean, how could you forget the yes. yeah. charismatic as hell, right? Um, so uh, I thought this was a good continuation of the Station series. Um, and anybody here who's a fan of Stranger Things, I haven't spent too much time watching it, but I know Robert England signed on recently to portray a character in the next season called Victor Creel, C-R-E-E-L. Uh, and so I just wanted to dispense with this early before anybody tries to accuse Jarrett of, um, of uh, you know, stealing a, a name, you know, or, or like um, plagiarism of a character name or something. Uh, it's 
the Victor Krill in Rod Inertia is Victor K R I L L. Um, overall, the station series in general feels like the Matrix meets Nightbreed. Um, so there are these people who they're very few and far between, but they learn to break or remove the limiters on the human soul uh, to where they can do, you know, incredible things with their bodies, manipulate time, uh, be in two places at once, super strength and, you know, just an overall ability to fuck shit up, you know, before your opponent, your enemy even knows what hit him. Um, Victor Krill was the first to, you know, kind of break the limiter on his body and, and, you know, do this. And he wages an all out war on this territory called the muck. And, uh, it's like an underworld alternate dimension type of thing. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, uh, the main character from the original book station, uh, Marlon Hatter, uh, he is at odds with Victor Krill, uh, because he has also learned the ability to, to break the limiter. And, um, so throughout the book, they're trying to maneuver their a way into, you know, defeating each other. And um, I like how uh, Jarrett tied up the loose ends at the end of this book and set up some, you know, questions for compelling questions for the next book. Um, I think he's got something. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what he does after the station trilogy is concluded. Um, and finally, this this one I've been reading forever in a day, like several months, Unwrapped Sky. Uh, it begins with this girl named Kata, K-A-T-A, who is like a an, a, an assassin. Everybody still with me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, she's an assassin. Yep. And in particular, her uh, employers, although they're more like captors, um, they, they say, you know, you, you'll be able to write your own ticket to freedom if you just kill all the minotaurs, you know, who are visiting for the uh, the the next sun cycle or the night of the sun feast or something. Uh, and as things progress, uh, these entities who are trapped between our world and like a fourth dimension type setting called the Elo to learn are um, they, they start figuring into the plot more and more. And uh, there's a, like a caste system of philosopher warriors uh, who have a direct line of communication to the Elo to learn. And so we have this big sprawling epic, you know, uh, that, that often has point of view characters that you really don't give a shit about until the author goes on to the next point of view character. Like as soon as you get used to reading one point of view character, he's already switching up the next few chapters to somebody else. This was used to good effect with George R. R. Martin's Game of Thrones series. For any of us here who have read that, you, you don't give a shit about Theon Greyjoy because you want to read about Jon Snow, right? But then, you know, you're so used to reading through Theon's portion that when it finally gets to the Jon Snow chapters, you're like, wait a minute, I want to know more about Theon. Yeah. I, huh? I, I was really ambivalent about that. It's annoying, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Like so, sometimes I was like, "Well, it keeps me turning the pages," and other times I'm like, "Well, why do I bother?" <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think you can do too many point of view characters. I think that it should be limited probably to third world omniscient uh, or third person omniscient uh, perspective, or just like um, a journal like first person perspective. I well, really think those are the only two that are utilized well at all. It's not necessarily bad, but it. I think it would work better if the characters were more even. I mean, a lot of the characters had interesting story arcs, but they were not interesting people, especially like Sansa when she's young. You know, I, I really enjoyed reading Tyrion because yeah. he's, fu he's funny. He has a great voice. He's a but cool the, person. The to Khaleesi know. chapters were dull as fuck, oh, I thought. Oh, God, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was I was hoping that she would get burned real early on, and it never happened. Well, the problem <laughs> is that she was so separated from the action in the the what do they call it, the Five uh, Kingdoms or something. Yeah, uh, she was on another continent yes. entirely, and right. so she felt like when when you get to that, you're you felt like you're reading a different book that inter interrupted 
you know, the, the sequence of uh, the Five Kingdoms, you know, uh, intrigue. Yeah, right. 100%. And also she was annoying. Yeah, I didn't like her chapters, but I, I like those books in general, though. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but so, you know, now, that, now that we're having this dis- discussion, I realized pretty much the reason I liked those books was because of, of a couple of characters. Mm-hmm. You said Tyrion, right? Yeah, Tyrion, Brianna Tarth, Jon Snow. You know, you liked reading about those characters, but yeah. Yeah, and I liked reading about, um, what's his name? The, the One of the, the what's his name? Uh, Cersei's brother was the guy's name. Uh, Joffrey. No, 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 no. Uh, 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 Jamie. Jamie. Yeah. yeah, I liked his. I liked him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Unwrapped Sky, it took me a long time to get through because, like I said, at times I, I didn't want to bother with the change of perspective characters. Um, but I, I, any time that it was it, it centered on the female character, Kata, on the front cover, um, I felt like the author abandoned the whole Minotaur aspect way too early um and i and i felt frustration that she kept killing him even though she one of them she almost fell in love with and she still poisoned him and apologized with tears in her eyes as he died uh, uh of being poisoned you know it's like i would think that you would you a minotaur you would want them you could you could see an avenue of escape from your employer slash captor by using utilizing their help, but she, I don't, I don't, as I recall, she never did. You know, she just killed a bunch of them, and uh, you know, like I said, the, the Elo Talaren uh, thing is an interesting concept too. But uh, the amount of world building just seemed really slow to develop here. Uh, and I know that, and, and I got the second book, although I'm hesitant to start because this thing took me so long to get through. It's 430 pages and it felt like 600 pages. Uh, you, know, you, you had the same problem with my book. You do not like, <laughs> like people to like sit back and describe the world. Well, I feel like it can be done in excess, you know? Um, and, and if we're talking about your book, I felt at times that um, there was too much like, quipping back and forth that would go on for pages like everybody's got always got a snappy comeback you know and uh like everybody talks with the 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 vocabulary of a playwright at times this is what i find strange about a lot of plays in particular because if plays want any kind of verisimilitude about how people talk in real life not everybody is able to think on their feet with their their own dialogue with people you know right and that's that's why you don't write books that are full of characters that are just random people you know like yeah yeah like i really enjoyed reading Tyrion's parts because Tyrion was witty and you know i enjoyed his wordplay like i i I guess i'm the opposite i don't want to i don't want to i don't want verisimilitude especially especially if it's like boring people (laughs) You know, I re- the last thing I want to do is hear a non-witty, you know, monosyllabic conversation between two dolts. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I would say, I mean, I'll go, go ahead. Yeah. What, what, I, what I've been thinking about this whole time is, wow, that would be a really cool challenge to try and write a point of view, a point, a point of view novel with a bunch of different points of view, but they're all a different version of a really verbally interesting character. Like mm. they're all Tyrion or, you know, maybe someone's Tyrion and someone else is a maniac, which, which I guess, I guess would be, yeah, you probably wouldn't like that, but it, it sounds like a fun challenge. Like, can I write a point of view novel where none of the characters are someone that you just have to sit through? And this is published by uh, Tor books Basically, all they publish is epic fantasy sword and sorcery. Every book is like a, a five or seven, five to seven hundred dollar like door stopper. It's like yeah. their their specialty. I couldn't give this five stars, only four, but uh, only because of the sh- this the sharp turns of perspective when I'm invested in someone else. And uh, the fact that it just took me so long, I've read books that are 430 pages, like, you know, that I went through in one afternoon like that. 
you know, but this one slogged on forever. And I felt like he just couldn't balance the characters well enough for it to be as captivating uh, as he wanted it to be. But uh, right. that being said, I I'll, I'll end up reading the second one. But <laughs> if you want a, a fast paced epic fantasy, I would actually say start with Station and The Rod Inertia by Jarrett Brandon Early instead of this Unwrapped Sky. So, but you know, well, now that now that you say now that you say it's a tour novel, it all makes sense. Yeah. Did you hear about that that uh, scandal a couple of years ago? When every single author that Tour published in a particular year was friends with the same woman who worked for them. Yeah. Uh, like, uh, what was her, what was her name? It was something with T in the in the last name, right? T E A. Yeah. Something. Yeah. Tessa something yeah. or. Uh... Yeah, I, I, almost, I almost had an opportunity to meet her uh, in, in when I was in Portland. Um, the person I was staying with, one of their roommates uh, had brought up the idea of going to meet her because she worked at Tor, you know, and I'm like, well, I mean, I, I'm, I'm talking to people from Eraserhead, though, you know, why don't I want to talk to Tor, you know, but <laughs> I think it would have been worth it to to attend that uh, dinner, you know, now looking back, but um, yeah, well, if, what if was her name had... again? Cause I think I know who you're talking about and it makes yeah, absolute I... sense. Yeah. I can't remember her name, but it, it, it totally makes sense that a tour book would be filler and boring and horrible because they're publishing their friends right. and you know, their, their, um, their, their raison d'etre is to publish these really long, long uh, doorstopper books. So of course, it's going to be filler. Right. <laughs> that totally makes sense now. Yeah, yeah. It I mean, uh, it wasn't Irene Gallo? Was it? I don't think. It no, was. it wasn't her. She's been around forever. I know. I know who it is. It's a younger woman. I'm pretty sure. I think I know who yeah. you're talking about, but I can't and, remember her name. Yeah, I can't remember it either. And it, I think it is like usually I can't remember people's names because I'm just bad with names. But I think this is actually a genuine instance of me not remembering her name because I don't like her. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I mean, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. I think I know who it is, but I, I'm not sure. So that's it. It's it's an interesting tidbit because it, if it's the person I'm thinking of, it makes absolute sense because that's when like a whole bunch of books got published. They were just like, why is this even getting published? This is just terrible. Right. I do yeah. know that uh, apparently Tor book, I don't know if this is epic fantasy or not, but I do know that Tor published this and it had a lot of acclaim. Grass That's supposed to be really good. Yeah. Uh, and, and you know why that, that title is uh, so intriguing because I don't, I, I may have brought this up before, but, We've all heard Allen Ginsberg or read about him calling what he calls an eyeball kick, right? Mm -hmm. It's like a, a two words that have nothing to do with each other, but when they're brought together, they create a feeling, a sensation, you know, that readers only readers can appreciate. Um, Grasshopper Jungle, that's an that's a, an eyeball kick, basically, and and that was I think that may be one of their only successful non sword and sorcery titles. What I've heard now. I don't know. You know. I mean, it's supposed to be really good. I've I've yeah. got a copy of it. I've not read it yet. Mm -hmm. But uh, what were you going to say, Ann? Um, I don't think I was going to say anything. I I was just thinking about how uh, obscenely expensive cookies are all of a sudden. Yeah. Cookies? Why? Well, because I I was just buying groceries because I I came out here to buy a, a windproof microphone as you know but I couldn't find one so I wound up buying groceries and I was like should I get some cookies and then I was looking at them and I was like when the fuck did a box of cookies start being five dollars yeah yeah I'm I'm I, I am paying attention to the conversation it's just <laughs> it's just sometimes my brain multitasks without my asking it to or wanting it to and yeah. this is one of the times. By the way, Regina, you have tried and and um, had less success with certain authors as far as convincing them to come on, right? At least yeah. three or four that are so shy or anxious that they, they just refuse to come on, right? Yeah, there are a handful that I think are uh, just, they're very they don't know how to talk about their work and they're not confident about it and they're not used to it. And they're just kind of intimidated. I think um, 
so it's kind of hard to convince them on the show. I was thinking about waste, maybe though. one of them I might be able to record an interview with, like not as like an interview, but as more like a conversation with author name here. Um, so I'll let you know if I can finagle that and maybe we could like play it on the show or whatever. But like, I don't know if that person is like, I, I feel like sometimes people are a little intimidated by the panel format, maybe. Hmm. Um, but I don't know. Well, I mean, we're so loose, you know, we're a loose yeah. collective. I don't know why you would be intimidated. Um, I mean, we don't I, really I, go after people. We don't go after I, people. No, I know. And I think um, also just people don't, you know, they, they're not used to talking about their work. And they're not. Unless you're J. Authors, Peter W. Yeah. Authors aren't type A people usually. We're very introverted and very, like, trying to just do day jobs and also write. Or if we have the fortune to be able to write full time, then we're probably going to become more type A if we are writing full time. So, I mean, it's like one of those things where it depends on where you are at in your development path that's going to determine how open you are to the experience of coming on a show like this. Yeah. I, will say that, like it. I will say that uh, one one author in these 10 books that I'm showing on screen here, uh, it's a really kick-ass book, but, uh, and I've read several of their works now, but they, they just refuse to do any kind of podcast stuff, even though their publisher has even tried to put pressure them to doing them. And uh, he, he, they, they just refused to do it due to social anxiety. And I'm like, the person who wrote this book shouldn't be intimidated by anything. That's what I told them. And they said, I even offered to pay them for their time. And, 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 and they just said, sorry, I can't do it at this time. You know? Um, I mean, I think it's good for him or her or whatever, right? I mean, if they don't want to do it, they shouldn't do it. But it's a waste of their talents to not be out there spreading well, the word. Well, maybe they just don't want to do it, right? If they're a writer, they're not a uh, talker, right? Yeah, maybe but I mean. Maybe that's what they're thinking, right? And it's like, I don't, I've don't. Yeah. i got every, everything I want to say is in this book. I don't need, need to talk. So I, I disagree, maybe. though, because, you know, when they write something that's so kick-ass, there, there are divergent points where the reader can kind of, you know, uh, debate with the author it can be a fun back and forth what this scene meant or you know what this what was going on here you know i got a sense of this from this character although it was never confirmed uh you know i mean it's a nice yeah. back and forth yeah. kind of like I, a, I mean i kind of like to hear about people that don't want to talk to us right i mean like you know so like like i like to hear about people like bentley little who like doesn't even get on the internet and you have to write him a letter to ask him to do something right you know if you want him to be part of the an anthology or something you actually have to write them a physical letter to you know what i mean i think i, I like the idea of people being entirely disconnected from a community or, or or the world and being like almost monastic in their uh i just, pursuits. I just think it's a waste of their talents to not be to, to not suck it up and go and talk about it it's so easy i mean yeah i'm, I'm actually kind of i'm kind of with jeremy on this one because here's my thing is i feel like the point of monastic practice in like say the production of illuminated manuscript is to produce something that transmits divine information and so in the same way these isolated writers are doing the divine information in their work a disservice by not disseminating it with more marketing and more work and and subsidizing the work with more work until finally they can like truly do like steep you know soul searching work and it's like you can stop at any point and that's fine and that's what you do you you do the level that you want to do but i feel like you know there are some writers who think it is a superior practice like jd salander who wrote in like this total isolation and didn't publish anything because of you know the kids i mean that's i mean i think that's whatever. stupid right i mean yeah to, i mean well, to really but you know, I, I just you know. I just don't buy that excuse because if there's yeah. anyone who is socially inept and hateful to a painful degree, it's me. And yet here I am every week. You know, I come on here. <laughs> you know, I, I when I started doing this show regularly, in large part, it was to force myself to talk to people every week so that I wouldn't go completely nuts with my cats in lockdown. And you and chose it, this group of people. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah, well, 
it's it's kind of an insanity uh, friendly <laughs> people. You know, I'm, I'm I'm never gonna come across as a normal human being, which, unfortunately, as an author in this day and age, is a vast handicap. And just a generation ago, it was a huge advantage. Now, no. being it, yeah, everybody's got to be very polite and very proper yeah. nowadays. It seems, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like being a unique person somehow over the last 10 years has become a handicap in the arts. And I'm like, what? When the fuck did this start involving flannel suits and briefcases, people? <laughs> but but so just people for- are too good at selling their brand. That's what you're saying, right? Well, yeah. I mean, the, the fact that authors have to do our own marketing means that, yeah, the 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 balance of talent versus marketing skill that's going to succeed just automatically is going to start falling more heavily on marketing skill you know so that's that's one part of the problem but on the other hand just saying well i'm too shy and i'm and or i'm too pure bullshit it's physically painful to me to talk to strangers it's sometimes physically painful to me to talk to the people closest to me. But we're but, talking about on 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 the but, internet, not even in person. You don't have to leave the even worse. Of your house. You don't have yeah, to leave the comfort rough. of your house to talk about your work. That's beautiful. That's even worse. You have to talk to assholes like us online. <laughs> I think it's yeah, great. But, it's more convenient. They should but what I'm saying, is, what I'm saying is I'm doing it, you know? So I, I don't know how, like, if... if if you're not subverbal, you you can't be sicker in this way than I am, really. So if I'm doing it, anyone can do it. Do what? <laughs> <Okay. laughs> no, if see, Jeremy, got interrupted. Yeah, if Jeremy's doing it, anyone can do it. Let me re- rephrase that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> He's the one who ends up throwing up on stream, and I'm the one who drank a whole fucking bottle of Mad Bull up throughout this, or Mad Dog throughout this entire thing. No, no, Mad no. Bull. I mean, I just stick to pot. Place. Did you get fired from your job or something? What are you doing drinking Mad Dog? It tastes good to me. I have really? drank wow. last week. You can't deny that. Well, I, I know. I don't care about that. I, I drink more than you've drunk, boy. Well, that's because you're just a, uh, well, you're mostly just fucked up on pills, so it, that doesn't go good with booze. Hey, I've, I, I'm crossing off everything I can think of on the list except for meth. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you, you're going to start doing heroin, too? <laughs> no, not the way you're thinking, but I have, you know, something that comes close a few times, but never. Speaking of heroin, I finished reading Skag Boys this week. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, nice. Yeah, it's. Um, um, it's a uh, you know st- talking about you know books that have a lot of like uh, perspectives. It, it uh, jumps around uh, through different characters a lot. Um, you know the main character I guess technically is Mark Renton, uh, who was the main character in Train Spotting too. Um, there's actually there is a pretty interesting part toward the end where he's forced to go to rehab, and he's keeping a journal, and you know it's from the perspective of his journal, and you know he's just talking about his time and in rehab and one of the things he starts doing is he starts trying to write like he hears his voice in his head so it's like a i guess a sort of metafictional thing where he's like uh where he you know crashes something out and writes it so it sounds more like a scottish dialect um and um you know there's um um there's a pretty uh messed up part where a character by the name of nixie um, he, uh, in his apartment building, a, uh, a kid drops a, um, uh, a, a puppy down the garbage chute. And so Nixie is like trying, uh, trying to, um, find a way to get into the garbage room in order to rescue it. Um, but while he's, um, while he's doing that, he, uh, comes across his, uh, his girlfriend who he had gotten pregnant. And she says, don't worry about it. I took care of it. <laughs> um, so guess what he finds when he finally gets into the garbage room? Oh, God. He finds the, he finds the puppy chewing on uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, um, the self-induced mis- miscarriage that she also wow. threw on the garbage chute. That's pretty messed up. <laughs> yeah, Irvine. That's a 
pretty messed up part. And he ends up, uh, he ends up keeping it and uh, throwing it in the sea when he uh, takes a job on a uh, on a boat. <laughs> um, that's, uh, there's also like the ending where the uh, where none of the none of them can find any heroin uh, because obviously they're back on it by the end, um, and they try to break into a um, into a factory, you know, where heroin is being produced and. Um, well, opioids are being produced to be made into. <laughs> I was gonna say, like down by the old thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not actual heroin, but the opioids that are used to make heroin, and you know it goes completely fucking awry. And then by the end, they decide, okay, we're just gonna try to kick this cold turkey. And the very last line is the phone ringing, uh, implying that the dealer is calling with, with more of the shit. <laughs> wow, that's um, a happy ending. <laughs> well, yeah, it's a prequel to Train Spotting, and if you've read Train Spotting, you know that um, you know it doesn't. Uh, it's uh, probably not going to end well for them. But, right, um, but I yeah. really, I really like that though, as uh, as like a twist on the happy ending. Like yeah. he did, he did put a positive ending in there. The, the dealer finally called. Right. Yeah. <laughs> happy. It's happy for them it's in the of, moment, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. It's sort of like. It's sort of like how the "quote unquote" happy ending to Train Spotting is uh, Mark Renton just steals a shit ton of money and goes to Amsterdam. Right. <laughs> uh, but I do think I thought it was a. It's a pretty long book, but I think if you did like train, if you did like Train Spotting, it's worth picking up. Um, so that yeah, Skag Boys, I definitely recommend it. Um, I also read uh, the Elephant Man, which is a, uh, a play. Um, it, it doesn't have anything to do with the, um, well, it, it's sort of, it isn't, it isn't what, um, the movie is based off, but it is, um, it does, it, it's about the same thing. It's about the life of Joseph Merrick. Um, and I think it's a pretty solid, um, pretty solid book about, um, you know, Merrick trying to adjust to his differences and, um, you know, it, it goes into like things like his sexual frustration and things like that. Um, you know, and how he came to meet the uh, the doctor who took care of him, um, and how he uh, became a sort of spectacle to the upper class of England at the time. So, I think if you're interested in Joseph Merrick's story, that's worth reading. Um, so yeah, The Elephant Man by uh, Bernard. Bernard Pomerantz. I guess that's how you pronounce it. I don't know. Um, I think it's a solid play. Uh, I also read uh, Mukbang Princess by Rain Havoc. No! <laughs> the first, um, the first uh, Rain oh, Havoc yeah. story that um, I've read. And yeah, it's a pretty fucking nasty piece of work. Um, I don't want to talk much about it because it's a pretty short story, so I don't want to spoil it. But yeah, I will say that um, it, it should be goofier than it, than it is because uh, her descriptions are actually pretty <laughs> um so I'll, I'll definitely be checking out more from rain um and i also read um simon mccarty's uh moon face um oh, yeah. another um another exclusive from godless um go to godless.com buy my story on there and buy other stuff <laughs> um what was that rain when mukbang mukbang princess yeah right there gross yeah, don't let that cover cents. fool you. Forty-five yeah. cents. That's only only two games of Pac-Man. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what was the other one? Uh, Moonface by yeah. um, Simon McCarty. Um, I, I mentioned this in my review on Goodreads. It kind of reminds me of like uh, Edward Lee's nastier work, but he doesn't like overcook the fact that all of the characters are like Australian bogans. Um, he doesn't like, um, uh, it's like the Australian version of a redneck. Mm. Um, he doesn't like overplay that. So it feels like very natural that he's creating this like whole world. That's very, um, very bleak and very dark and violent, but ultimately like there is a very, um, strong undertone of very, of like pitch black humor to it. Um, so it is very enjoyable and I actually thought it would, this would make like a, a really good comic. Um, yeah. Like if it was adapted yeah. by someone like a, I don't know, maybe Mike Diana or someone else with like a, an underground comics style kind of art. I think that would be yeah. really awesome. Absolutely. That's an interesting idea. Yeah, man. 
I keep telling Simon he's gonna he's, so eventually he's gonna get a movie deal and he always laughs me off and he's like haha yeah I really fucked up porno and I'm like no 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 wait and see that's the kind of shit that people love in these extreme horror movies so yeah I can't really see this as like a movie um, I think it's a bit too out there to work as anything one, except yeah. maybe as like a I could see it maybe animated though in like yeah. a sort of heavy metal style. Yeah, yeah, totally. Moonface, you could. Yeah. What like exactly sort of... is what, what is he an alien? Well, no, he's oh just. My God. Uh, this is the third just has, time. Jeremy. Yeah, he's just pale and has like severe pock marks from uh, like smallpox. Okay. He's a smallpox. Victim. That's right. Yeah. And granted, that's the least <laughs> worst thing that happens to him in the book. <laughs> Gregor. Yes. Is it, is it time for your departure, or are you you good? Um, I mean, I could leave. If you no, know. no. I mean, oh. I'm just, I don't, want you, to, I don't oh. want you to to be you know late for work in the morning or something. Are you good? I won't be late for work. I'll just be tired. Well, well um, I guess. Uh, what did you read this week, Gregor? Uh, I didn't finish anything this week. Uh, I read, uh, I started, I, you know, Dune, the audio book came available to me from the library. So I started listening to that. Uh, you know, I've only got 21 days, 21 hours. So I'm trying to, you know, listen to much as much of that as I can. I mean, I've read it before, but I want to read the rest of the books in the series this year. So I'm going to listen to this, you know, and to get ready for it. I'm loving it. I love that book. It's, it's damn good. Has everybody read that? I haven't yet. Um, but for some reason, uh, the other day, someone mentioned the Litany of Fear, and I went and looked that up, and I thought that was a really cool like poem that comes from. The oh book. yeah, that's really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, I will not fear. Read Dune. I'm sorry. I I will not fear. Fear, fear is the mind killer. The mind killer. Fear is the little fear. death that brings total obliteration. You, I will face my fear. I will permit it to pass over me and through me. And when it has gone past, I will turn the inner eye to see its path. And where the fear is gone, there will be nothing. Only I will remain. Very good. Yeah, I think that's really cool. But that's a good book. Yeah, I mean, so have you read it, uh, Regina? Um, I have read it and part of one of the sequels. I read it completely out of order it's one of the i it's one of those things where it's like i say i read it but it was like in middle school or early high school so i don't really remember right. any fucking thing about it because it was before the drugs right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so unfortunately i can't talk informatively about it but i really enjoyed the i they, i have slightly more memories of the david lynch film just because i've seen it several times since then yeah yeah. Um, so that's kind of how I pictured Dune, and then there's the mini that's, series, which I recall also being very good, but I don't remember hardly anything about that one. Yeah, I mean, it was decent the mini series, but the book <laughs> itself is fantastic, and I'm I'm oh, just yeah. curious because like everybody says that you know it falls off a lot after the first book as far as the quality, I guess, yeah. right? But apparently, I also uh, apparently okay. people apparently people really hate B Brian Herbert's sequels. <laughs> Well, I know that. I'm not going to even yeah. bother reading any of that, right? But I'm going to read the. I'm going to try to read all the Frank Herbert books. But yeah. it sounds like yeah. the reason people don't like the Frank Herbert books is because it just gets really crazy and trippy, right? I like think, it's, yeah. And I think people want a protagonist they can like, and I think there's a certain protagonist that I think you know who I'm talking about, who I think a lot of people get turned off by, like the mere idea of basically. Um, so. The Atreides right. aren't like good, good guys. They're um, kind of morally ambiguous, because that's my understanding. Is like that the Atreides sure. are goody goods and the Harkonnen yeah. are like so sociopaths. Yeah, that's uh, well. I mean, it's like everybody in the Dune universe is pretty. I mean, they're all playing twelfth dimensional chess all the fucking right. time, constantly right. with each other, and they're like. Yeah thinking into the future, doing these like long-term eugenics programs and breeding things. And it's just like all very intense. And um, so it's like, but there's like, so yeah, I mean, it's like, if you don't like a morally ambiguous series, you're not going to like it, but there's like specifically a character who's like a big player in this universe late in the game who like, 
people might not like their arc. Who, I mean, they're pretty big, but then they become bigger. And it's like, people, yeah, I think the arc is a problem for people. So I don't know. I, I feel like that's really, really the issue people have with Dune is more just the themes that came out of Frank Herbert's later works. Yeah, I, I mean, um, I haven't gotten to anything beyond the first book, so I'm, I want to. I'm very interested to see where it goes because I think that people probably like it or dislike it for reasons that, like, they're they're they wish it was something else, right? right. I think is, exactly. is 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 kind of what I'm thinking is probably the case, right? Because yes. I can't imagine that the guy that that wrote this book would fall off that much from the mm -hmm. first. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I mean, it's possible, I suppose, right? But I mean, this book is is an incredible feat of uh, of uh, what uh, third person omniscient narration. I mean, it's incredible, like the yeah. how you're able to follow everybody's thoughts like effortlessly as he's jumping from head to head constantly throughout every scene and everybody's constantly thinking about what's going on in the heads of other people and you know it's just crazy you know what i mean it's 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 very interesting and it's amazing that he's able to pull it off yeah. um so that's a good book and i'm getting through that and then i also picked up lost souls i think i said i started that last week I've, i'm a little bit over halfway through that now by poppy z bright and that's very enjoyable uh read it's certainly a book of its time you know uh which is fine you know but it's kind of like a lot of the um aesthetics of it are, are kind of cliched uh, at this point and maybe we're a little bit then it's hard to say right because a bit too uh hot topic yeah it's like you know this the, every there's this this overwhelming goth clove cigarette yeah. The aesthetic going on with it, right? You know what I mean? And then, like, one of the characters seems to be like the the, the writer had a boner or, you know, wanted a boner for, uh, what's his name? Kurt Cobain or something. You know what I mean? I don't know. So, yeah. Wait, you know, so, yeah. but have you read it? What do you mean, Kurt Cobain? This was written in the 70s or something, right? No, it was like 90s. What? No, Last Souls was 90s. Yeah. Hoppy is not that old. Yeah. What does Kurt Cobain have to do with Doom? Nothing. No, we're talking about uh, going through Lost his books Souls. I'm, this I'm week. juggling things with Dad. The cat. <laughs> okay. All right. We're talking so. about uh, Lost <laughs> Poppy Z. Bright's Lost Souls now. Okay. Yeah, have you read it, Ben? No, I haven't. But I have read uh, Poppy's other work, especially um, uh, um, Exquisite Corpse, which uh -huh. um, it isn't quite like that. But um, like there is a certain '90s ish to it, especially the fact that one of the uh, characters is a pirate radio host who spends a lot of time chatting about AIDS activism. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not bad by any stretch, right? I mean, it's, you know, you know, I, I kind of, uh, I'm, I'm overlooking, I guess, some of that stuff because of, like the writing is really good and it, you know, and it's, uh, you know, it's a, you know, a fast paced, interesting vampire book where there's like, yeah, like there's only like one character I think in the whole book that's like a good character, and that's not the first character that they introduce, which is kind of interesting, you know. So, you know, like almost every other character in the book's like a despicable asshole, right? Except for this one character, which is kind of good, you know. So, I mean, it's a good book. I would recommend it to people who want to read a vampire book. Now, now I know Jeremy's like, oh, what what about Dormouse? Well. Or is that what, oh, Church Mouse, I'm sorry, not Dormouse, Church Mouse. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I haven't finished this book yet. I don't know how to compare it quite yet, but I'll say that I would, it, my guess is that I would probably like evenly match them, but, you know, there's different demerits in different books, right? But, you know, so we'll see. Maybe it'll blow my mind after uh, I'm done with it and it'll truly open up. But if it stays in the same sort of scale that it's in right now for the length of the book, I am probably won't like it all that much. But if it really opens up and, and goes into interesting, uh, unexpected directions, uh, uh, you know, I'll, I'll like it a lot more. But if it stays kind of like the same kind of closed story and, you know, and if if there's no real explanation as to why all these people wind up at this town, which doesn't make any, you know, what I mean, it's just like they all wind up at this town, 
and it doesn't make any there's no it's like a huge coincidence that all these people wind up at this town but if that's explained somehow through some supernatural thing i think it'll be okay but you know we'll see but it, i'm liking it. it it's it's a you know fairly compelling read it's pulling me through it so but it's not it's no dune by any stretch so but they're not even comparable, I suppose. But Dune is, is rich and interesting and amazingly uh, detailed, I guess. Yeah. Have you read it, Jeremy, Dune? I started to, but uh, I felt like uh, it just it wasn't for me. Okay. All right. well, I can imagine that. it's not for everybody, for sure, right? Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. I've only seen the David Lynch movie. I like the David Lynch movie. That was that was weird in a way that I, I think it would be hard to justify. <laughs> uh, stuff like uh, stuff like the do- the doctor uh, fucking lancing uh, Har- uh, Baron Harkonnen's boils and going like it. That part was yeah, cool, yeah. and I like it. it spat yeah. it just yeah, it's right. like, but uh, that's it's not like, book, how beautiful you are, my Baron. Your disease is love to me. <laughs> yeah, and then there's the fucking part with the milk the cat scene, which is also <laughs> not a book. What and is it's that? just like, what the fuck, David Lynch? It's just that David. Was the, being was David. That was what? not a book, right? No, it's not no the a book. boils and the milk the cat stuff not in the in the in the book. It's um, just David Lynch. But it's Harkonnen a, is is a, like a creepy, a, you know, uh, a child pedo- groper. Yeah, better ass. Yeah. Well, you see, does he like them dead in the book too? They're a lot like fish, and you sometimes you just catch the right fish. (laughs) But yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know if he likes them dead in the book. I don't recall that being the case. But I've also not. I mean, I've read it once, but years and years ago, and I'm not to any point where he's liking dead boys yet. But it's obvious that he likes young boys in in this. Yeah. Yes. That's something yeah. that would be be seen as a bit uh, suspect these days. Writing a, a character that's that homophobic. Well, how is it homophobic? I mean, well, it was kind, it's kind of a coded homophobia. Like it was kind of implied back when he, you know, was around that uh, all homosexuals were into young boys and things like that. I mean, I don't know that he's implying that with that character, though. That's reading a lot into it. I mean, you can just have a guy that's a villain that just likes. Fucking young boys. I mean, I mean, uh, I mean, having like uh, ca- character uh, villains who are coded as homosexual used to be fairly common. Like you can point to like um, one that immediately comes to mind is uh, Scar from Lion King. Yeah. Really? Yeah. He was pretty swishy and gay in the original. Yeah, I just, I just don't see it. How about really. Scar I mean, was you know, personally. I mean, you know. I mean, just uh, have a bad guy be a child rapist is is slurring homosexuals. I mean, that seemed to be a bit extreme, right? I mean, you know, like I said, it was a coded thing. Well, you know, I mean, everything like, okay? I, I, you know, I can I could say that about anything, it. though, right? I mean, you know, like I could say, oh, it was coded, so I don't. You know, I mean, that is, by Herman yeah. Melville gets uh, that kind of reputation too. I think. The, the the relationship that the uh, captain has with the the cabin boy right in Billy Bud anybody know what I'm talking about but but, is it, but uh, isn't that something that's real though I mean did, was it not was the it sodomy the not I mean haven't you read sodomy in the tra- uh, pirate tradition I mean it's all about you know I no, read I that book that. yeah I yeah that. that's a good book <laughs> yeah I mean come on wait is that a book that, title yeah yeah sodomy in the pirate tradition yeah uh-uh. yeah. yeah. It's a real book, and it's actually pretty oh, it good. Is? Yeah. I guess Anne decided to go right, or she I probably had technical problems. Yeah. Um, but, I don't know. Uh, you guys, okay, go ahead. Sorry, I forgot. Yeah, anything else that you read this week, uh, Gregor? Um, uh, I think I read a little bit more, more, a little more D. Arthur, but not much. But I got caught up in Dune and uh, Lost Souls, so. So that do was you, it. Uh, do you feel like it's a chore to get through at this point? What? Lamorte Arthur? No, I just, you know, like, um, you know, like Dune and, and Lost Souls are more compelling than this, you know, uh, book that doesn't have a real plot 
it's just episodic stuff written in archaic language, right? So, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, I'll get back to it. I'm, I'm dedicated to finishing it. So small bites. That's, that's yes. how I had to approach unwrapped sky. Uh, or otherwise I would have given up. Right. I mean, I, th- I, I kind of want to read it because it seems to be, you know, somewhat of a, a kind of an essential text for that. So much other stuff drawn draws from. So I'm, I'm curious to read the original or at least or as close to, I mean, it's not really the original source, but it's very close, closer than, you know, say, you know, Marion Zimmer Bradley's retelling of it or something, right? So, what about so, uh, you? Were, oh, so go ahead, Ben. Oh, no, I thought you were already on. Okay. Well, yeah, I have. You have what? I was going to say, uh, Regina, what have you read? Uh, really, I was just reading um, uh, the, the, the Fifth Head of Cerberus this week and uh, just really enjoying it. It's. Uh, Gene Wolfe's story about a guy who is um, in a tower and he doesn't really know his dad and his dad is like this maybe genius scientist of some kind who is running this uh, brothel that is located in the tower and there are all these like uh, scientifically altered babes working in the brothel and all these people from town like it's a very famous place and so people are coming and uh it, there's some weird shit happening and like it, it's again it's one of those things where it's like it's just really hard to talk about it without spoilers but i called it during my author spotlight earlier book of the new sunlight and it really is he's it, it was his second published novel and it contains a lot of themes that you will see him revisit and develop in Book of the New Sun, as well as themes that are unique to Fifth Head of Cerberus. So, worth checking out for sure. Yeah, that, that book seems to be a, a fairly well-known of his, right? Like a well-known yeah. book of his, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty popular. And, yeah. um, I, I, you know, somehow I've managed to avoid it, but it's really interesting because I'm reading it now, and it's like, it's very, like, I wish I had been reading it a little bit earlier while writing Burning Soul because I feel like it's very, like, I'm touching on some similar things. And it, it, Gene Wolfe is so instructive to me as a writer. I think that's why he's, like, the writer's writer. And so it's, like, every time I read him, I, like, see a different way of doing things that I, I want to do in my own writing. So it's really helpful. But, yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm, I, I'm definitely going to get some Gene Wolfe. I, I bought Peace while we were talking on this. Ah, good. I'm so excited yeah. to hear what you think of it. I love it. I, it is the only novel I have ever, like, just literally read back-to-back again, like, Oh, you just started it as soon as you finished it? Yeah. Started yeah. it again as soon as you finished it? Yeah. Wow, that's pretty good. All yeah. Right. It better it was... be good. I'm coming after you. <laughs> okay, I'll be prepared. Yeah, no, I really want to know what you think. I think you'll really like it. I think everybody on this podcast would really like it, and I think it's, like, it's I mean, I think I buy a fucking sad. book every time I'm on this podcast. I'm, I'm pretty I sure. Yeah, you know what? I, what my way around that is, I I add it to a wish list when I to try to control yeah. it, and and you, I also go into on Amazon and and disable uh, recommendations <laughs> when I'm really lacking, you know, in uh, self control. Right. Really yeah, I buy a book every time. I think every every episode I buy a book. Yeah. I'm telling you. Yeah. For, wait, say what you will, but I, I mean, we're we're doing a lot of good. I think for a lot of uh, authors, you know, that uh, are underrated. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I hope so. I yeah, hope so. Yeah. Oh, uh, one I forgot to mention, uh, which is stupid to me because it's sitting right in front of me, is I started reading uh, J.G. Ballard's High Rise, and I'm about halfway oh. through it. Yeah, oh, I, I, I'm fascinated by that one. I'd like to read that I, one. I will say that if you really like dogs, that you probably don't want to pick this up because there's a lot of bad things happening to dogs throughout the book. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, it's it's um, it is essentially like a sort of uh, class um, uh, commentary. Like there's this uh, high rise that's um, owned by the tenants themselves, um, mm. and it, uh, it it's sort of self-contained. It has a school in it. It has a shopping center, a liquor store, a supermarket, things like that. And um, when uh, things gradually start going wrong, especially like during a power outage, um, 
it, it uh, pe- the people just all of a sudden go wild and they start dividing themselves into like a sort of class structure with the uh, people on the upper floors um, fucking with the elevators so they're the only ones that can use them. Like the people in the middle being like sort of the middle class and the people on the bottom being the lowest. And at some point they, you know, almost start going, uh, going feral and like breaking into each other's apartments, attacking each other, uh, forming these like little patrols that go around and beat people up if they don't belong on that floor. Um, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty fascinating work so far. So isn't there something about promoting homosexuality in a, in a, as a, as a way to, um, help population control or something in that book. That's not in high rise. No, um, there is, um, one part where a character who is like openly gay gets, uh, um, beaten up and it's, um, like nominally it's because he's, um, trying to do something about the elevator situation. If I remember right, Mm -hmm. but it's sort of implied that, um, the reason they're so brutal with him is homophobia. Yeah. Cause it seems like there's some book that he wrote that I read somewhere where, you know, the, like the social engineers in that world or whatever were promoting homosexuality as a form of population control or something like that. I, I know that, uh, that's in one of, uh, Anne's books, but, um, Oh, is it? Or, yeah. Is it in one of Anne's books? Okay. Yeah. I, I yeah. don't know if that's in one of, uh, Ballard's books. Um, in his, he's more concerned with, uh, um, general like deviancy, like, um, things like, uh, he doesn't really, treat homosexuality like that. He more like a violent acting out and things like uh, rape and pedophilia. Okay. Because there is, um, uh, there isn't like, um, there's like a uh, one character who's like um, filming a documentary about the high rise and he starts getting worried that his uh, wife is going to get assaulted if he leaves her alone because you know, of all the way, the way people are acting. And, um, like, uh, one thing that happens is like people on the lower and middle floors tend to have children, whereas the people on the upper ones do not. And the upper ones, like one of the things that kicks off all of the, uh, um, all of the animosity is the people on the upper floors really want to keep kids out of the pool at at all times. Like they want to ban kids altogether. And obviously the parents don't want that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they start, uh, doing things like doing their best to shut kids out of the um, playgrounds on the upper levels that are meant for kids and things like that. Huh? I mean, that's one, that's the one I want to read for some reason. So I don't, I don't know. I don't know what it yeah. is about it, but that, that, that I like that idea. There's I mean, a like good the, audio book version of that one too. Yeah. Like the opening scene, it like really hits you. It's a, uh, one of the characters is uh, described as like on his balcony. Um, <laughs> are you okay? Yeah, I'm just trying. I'm, I'm starting to doze off, you know, not okay. because of the subject matter, just, you know, because yeah. like, go the ahead. Pills. Um, but yeah, the very first like scene in the book is one of the characters uh, being described as being on his balcony and uh, roasting a dog over um, a burning uh, pile of telephone directories. Oh, man. And he's mentioning, like, just he's like talking about it as if, like, it's just a normal thing to do before he leaves to go do his job. Right. What's it called? What's it called? High Rise. High Rise. Oh, yeah. Matt Stoko. Okay. Uh, no, no, that's no. Uh, that's High Life. I'm talking about yeah. High Rise. Which is By J.G. Ballard. Ballard, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. I remember Zach was talking about one of the, uh, you remember the author we talked to on here, Delicious Tacos was the name he yeah. was. And uh, there's there's a scene in finally some good news one of his novels where a dog is repurposed in a yeah. apocalyptic setting as food. And yeah, uh, I thought that's what. Yeah. It was about, but. Well, I, um, that I mean, like I said, if you're a person who really really likes dogs, it's it would be a difficult it would be difficult to read High Rise because a lot of bad things happen to dogs throughout the book. Mm. You ever wonder uh, if how long uh, Drew over at Godless.com can keep up with with the extreme horror before he has to introduce other elements? Like, is he only accepting extreme horror, or is he open to anything well, quality? What I wonder about that. Well, I mean, he accepted the Tomato Garden, and I wouldn't really categorize that as extreme right. horror. Okay. Okay. 
I mean, I think he's kind of uh, pushing that now because he really wants to have like a refugee for people who, uh, you know, are on thin ice or mm -hmm. are just not able to, you know, express themselves properly on Amazon. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what he's like, uh, you know, pushing to show, you know, it's a place where, you know, pretty much anyone who has a story to tell that may not be acceptable elsewhere. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. I think it's just that it's partly because extreme horror authors have such a hard time keeping their work on Amazon and other places. And uh, I, I think also then, you know, his Knuckle Supper book is horror and pretty violent horror and it very, you know, transgressive in a lot of ways, or at least it deals with some very transgressive, horrible themes. And so, I don't know, I think it just kind of was a natural fit to him. And then uh, tapping into the splatterpunk community, too, really helped him connect to these horror authors. So I, I, I'm sure... I predict that in the future, the platform will expand to more genres just inherently, because why wouldn't it? I mean, it's an additional revenue stream. Why would you turn down more revenue for your site or for your business? Right. But so, you know, we'll see. But for right now, I think it is pretty much horror focused just in yeah, general. It seems like it could easily horror. expand into Bizarro and, you know, just yeah. anything weird, anything weird and horror. Yeah. You ever wonder... Um, you ever one you ever you ever think about like how how authors come to you know uh decisions on what a monster in their work looks like um i, I think that there's a certain quality that i look for in monsters that it, it, i don't know how to describe it but i feel like there should be a word that encapsulates it where the mouth is disproportionate to the face and there's something skeletal about it you know maybe the eyes are just solid black, like the black eyed children, you know, something like that. I mean, I'm just wondering what is everybody's take on, you know, creating a memorable monster in your work, if you ever have. Uh, well, you know, um, like that, that sort of look like things with black eyes, things that are pale, things that vaguely resemble humans. Um, apparently, that's like a fairly universal type of monster because it taps into some kind of. Um, evolutionary um evolutionary you know uh adaptation that that's something we're supposed to be afraid of what which makes you me wonder what exactly is out there that's pale has black eyes and looks vaguely human all i'm saying is just uh all i'm saying <laughs> all i'm saying is uh be careful out there <clears throat> um but what would you call that that kind of uh, does like uh characteristic would like saurian maybe s-a-u-r-i-a-n uh, it's and, a term it's a, like a xeno something a xeno uh, hold on xeno type here's maybe. what I, think. I, would, I would i thought it, it would be a good description for it i don't know there was there's actually like a scp they actually have the scp uh website they actually have a uh, description for something like that it's like a, uh it, it's homo something like sort of like homo sapien but instead it's like <clears throat> homo something to represent something that's looks human but is something beyond human i'm gonna try yeah. to look that up is that like homo plasmate and phil k dick a little bit sort of um i think homo ignatus that's what they use oh, okay. okay so like a uh, human happy. unknown type of human Hmm. Homo agnotus. How do you spell agnotus? Ignatus. I N G N O T U S. Let's see if this is what I'm thinking of. I don't see a picture. Well, yeah. I mean, in the uh, SCP, you know, they're kind of vague about the descriptions because the idea is that they they look vaguely human, but there's something not human. Yeah. Is that the one that like sneaks up on subjects when their back is turned? No, that's, that's not a, a human. That's things. a statue. Okay. I know what you're thinking. That's a statue. SCP but, would be a good movie if they didn't. Yeah. Um, I, I've actually like. It would ruin um, it. 
I've actually like thought about like trying to put together um, short films adaptations of some of them. I especially want to do one for. I can't remember the number, but I think the title of it is "It Was Never There" or something like that, which is um, an attic in a home that people are just unable to enter. When they try to enter it, they black out and wake up at you know the foot of the of the ladder to the attic, and then eventually um, by the end of the um, by the end of the entry, it basically states that the family that was in the house has no record of actually ever existing. Spooky. It's a very, it's a, it's a it gives me a very, um, a very spooky vibe. And I, th I think you could probably like make a, uh, um, make a short film adaptation on it on a very small budget. That's cool. I like stories so what, like what that. What were you getting at Jeremy with people making up monsters? What, what was the question again? Is it best to keep them in the dark or, you know, for most of the story or to fully show them off. Like John Carpenter right. always said that there were two, uh, you know, monster stories. One is about the monster out there when he's, you know, like in a, around a campfire. And, uh, and he, he says one is about the monster out there and the other is about the monster in here. But I mean, is it better to keep the monster in the dark as much as possible for, and, and then yes. build to a final reveal at the end, like in the thing, or or is is it better to like make their establish their appearance early on so that you know when it's coming every time? I mean, I think it depends. Like uh, the uh, yeah. like Clive Barker's uh, Rawhead Rex. Part of the inspiration for that was like instead of like keeping the monster like. Um, you know, in the dark until the very end, it's basically like the monster just immediately comes out and starts, you know, biting people's heads off. Um, and, you know, he describes it as being like vaguely uh, phallic looking and things like that. Mm, right. Because you know, the idea it's it's uh, almost like an um, a manifestation of the unchained male libido, um, and you know how it's eventually defeated by a. Uh, um, a fetish totem that represents uh, pregnant women. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, it, I guess it all depends, right? But as far as where the monsters come from in your brain, I don't know how you could answer that yeah. really. But that, that one thing that you described, though, it is does seem to be a universal thing, like Ben says, that I don't know what it is, but yeah, it yeah. just does seem to be a universal like with, type uh, of creature. Like with Lovecraft, like he probably described... Um, uh, like the creatures he did because he really was afraid of fish or at least the ocean and mm -hmm. anyone who wasn't a wasp. Right. He described a lot of his as Eldritch and Squamous or Squamous. S -Q yeah. And a lot of them, of course, that he actually describes are, of course, very fish like, you know, like the uh, Innsmouth creatures. Yeah. Right. I think people overfeed way too much on the, the whole octopus tentacle shit I, I i mean i'm so tired of monsters with tentacles so tired any kind of octo octopus like you know uh evolutionary shit on them is just overdone a mouth well, if a, shit. i mean just if nick land is to be believed then just in a few years we're going to be ruled by uh bionic monsters with face tentacles who? Who? Nick Land. Nick. Now, that's a guy I knew you would knew something. About yeah, he, he's like an underground sensation, right? Well, he sort of was. Um, he is. Um, he was an accelerationist philosopher. Um, he, uh, um, you know, he believed in basically accelerating capitalism to basically get um, Skynet, basically. He, he was very in favor of the idea of humans being replaced by um, ultra-intelligent um, uh, um, dictators. Was um, he in favor? Is he gone? Well, I think he, he still is in favor of that. The thing is, like, at some point he uh, had a mental breakdown because he took too many amphetamines. And mm -hmm. uh, he sort of started that. becoming uh, – he, he started becoming uh, very racist and started uh, holding up China as uh, – example of what the future should be and things like that. 
he became a he's he's basically he's a reactionary now. He seems kind of like an idiot. Not, he's, I wouldn't, really? he's, I wouldn't call him an idiot. He's obviously very intelligent. It's more a case of... Well, I guess not an... Well, spent, okay. Not an idiot, but, I mean, that's just... I mean, to to want to... I don't know. I, I'm not a real big fan of anti-humans. I mean, uh, you know? for him, I think it was a case of he was just staring in the abyss so long and hard that eventually he blinked and just had to, you know, go in this direction of becoming this reactionary. Yeah, I mean, he's pretty, I don't know. Uh, Nick Land is his name. Yeah, I, I really yeah. do recommend his book, uh, The Thirst for Annihilation. I think that's a great book. <laughs> I mean, I, why would you want to be ruled by machines that well, in were created his case, by in, imperfect, cruel humans? <laughs> in his case, it's basically because he's, uh, it's a, uh, I don't want to get too deep into it because uh, Jeremy is obviously going to nod off soon. But uh, right. basically, he believes that capitalism is the only way. So capitalism should be accelerated until we create a hyper efficient uh, super race of capitalists to rule over us. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, unfortunately, I think there's a fair amount of people that just believe the same thing, and they happen to be people that probably in power <laughs> elon musk yeah. probably believes that who to who elon musk probably or you know klaus schwab so, and the so gang, if, his gang yeah if you yeah. want a vision of the future uh think of elon musk and jeff bezos with face tentacles yeah 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 jeremy you're looking good man yeah are you alive still i am <laughs> barely I'm why do we good you look like you you're uh, you look like Nick Land probably looked when he had his breakdown. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I don't do amphetamines. No, I, I I messed with Adderall and diet pills. You know, uh, yeah. When I had a girlfriend, she I think she got me hooked on those. Yeah, that's that's what I'll say. Yeah, yeah. So that's good to hear. It's our fault. Yeah. <laughs> 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 anyway, no, no. Now it's just, it's just, yeah. I mean, stick with downers if you're going to do drugs. Yeah. I do agree with that. <laughs> um, I, I stick with booze and pot these days. Yeah, I'm well, I mean, pot those, all the time, baby. Those are good, you know, too. But um, don't want to limit it to just that. You want to expand your palate. Right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You just need. <laughs> I don't. Need I don't want to like acid trip and weed twenty four hours a day. Okay. I don't want to be that guy that does um, that does acid in his thirties and becomes an annoying Joe Rogan type. Yeah, yeah. but there's man, there's there's volume. There's all kinds of. Ah, you don't need any of those fucking pharmaceuticals. Stay away from that shit, Jeremy. No, he loves them. <laughs> Bad for you. Fucking, I'll tell you what, I used to, when I was in fucking, my gateway drug was clonopin. And I got prescribed oh, that shit when oh. I was in fucking high school. I was in high school. I can oh, barely yeah. remember my fucking life from the ages of 17 through like 20. And I had a seizure when I fucking came off of those things because I ran out of them. Because I was plowing through them every month. And I was literally walking to the mailbox in my college campus to go pick up my prescription. And I was walking down those stairs to go to the little post office area. And I fucking woke up suddenly. Like, I remember stepping on the landing. And then I woke up on my back, surrounded by fucking paramedics who were all like, you had a seizure and you need to go to the emergency room. And I was so disoriented. I just, like, looked at them and I was like, no, I didn't. And they're like, yes, you did have a seizure. And I was like, no, I didn't. And it was like Obama had just been elected and inaugurated. And they're like, oh, yeah? Who's the president? And I was like, I could not fucking remember his name. I was like, the black guy. I can't remember, but that doesn't mean that I had a seizure. But so anyway, they fucking talked me into going into the hospital, and it was important that I fucking went. But it's like, damn, you know, benzodiazepines are no joke, and they are like the next. They are a present epidemic in our country, but they're gonna get even worse now that opioids are so heavily controlled. I love them. I uh, I made a I made the huge <laughs> mistake of uh, of doing of snorting Klonopin after oh. I had been drinking all day. Here, here's uh, a pro tip: never do that ever. Oh yeah, come on! I, I'm I, wasting I, it I, when you snort it anyway. About 
I, getting sick. Of course, I've, yeah. I've mixed getting sick too. But I mean, what you got there? Sidlinger. How many here are familiar with Michael Sidlinger? Yeah, I know uh, of him. I know you do. I what like do you think? He I haven't read any of his work, though. He runs coping re mechanisms, or he did. I, I think it's still running. Yeah. What's that? Uh, yeah. This is his the thickest book he's ever written. I'm pretty sure. Hmm. There's no there's no Kindle book, uh, Kindle edition of this one, so I had to buy a physical copy. I'm just I and mean, uh, yeah. I know he uh, he published a, a book or two through Lazy Fascist. Yeah. Yeah. What's the deal? Uh, Let's see, uh, the laughter of strangers, I think, or the laughter, laughter of uh, shadows about um, a boxer, like. Yeah, that was like a nonfiction book, I think. I don't know. I know he also published uh, the fun we had. I think that's yeah, what it's called. It about a guy and a girl, like uh, it was kind of like open water with a hipster sensibility, right? Where the, the, the guy and a girl are on a are floating afloat on a, on the top of a coffin at sea and there's a shark circling, right? Yes. Something like that. Yeah. So what's that book about? That book you're just showing? I don't know yet. I just I just know it's his thickest book he's ever written as far as I know. I just, you know, I just got it, but um it kind of reminds me of a Roland Torper book called uh The Tenant. Yeah, yeah, they, use, yeah. they both use the same uh, the same painting, I think. Okay, well that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I've been wanting I, to read the tenant for some quite some time, and they don't have it yeah. at Kindle. And Valancourt just came out with it paperback. They you know they're reissuing it, but they don't have it in Kindle yet. I wonder what the deal is with that. Does that uh, does that version have uh, Thomas Ligotti's introduction? Uh, maybe I'm, I don't think so. I think that was. I know there's a version that has uh, Thomas Ligotti um, doing the introduction. Yeah, but I don't think that's in Kindle. There, there's no Kindle format version of that book. Is it? Uh, you know, part of the reason I wanted to read that was for you know Ligotti's uh, introduction. Yeah, I don't think that the Valancourt Press one does have that. I think that's like a you know fairly recent one, but not a real recent one. You know what I mean? So. Yeah, I think it's somebody else that's doing the the intro for for uh, yeah. But anyways, I want to read that book, but they you know, there's no Kindle version. I wonder what the deal is. So, I think they wait uh, a while before they do Kindle versions. Who Valancourt? Yeah, with the paperbacks from Hell series. I know that. Uh, no, I don't think the tenant would be part of that. Yeah, I wouldn't be. No. You know what? Uh, yeah. Gregor, you told me mm. off the air about that one story you were working on. After you told me you 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 joined the course of people saying don't talk about your work just finish it and you told me about something that you had unfinished that was quite interesting and I'm not going to go into detail. No, it's it's finished in that it, the whole series is written. Why it's not like why, it's in process. Process. Why don't you publish? Why don't you publish it? Uh, I mean, I keep on saying that I will, but then oh. I can you know it's like you know you had to go back and edit it all, and it's a huge book, so it's kind of like a big thing to get into right so i mean i wrote it quite some time ago and to edit it to the where it's uh, up to my current standards is going to be quite the task i think that's the i seem to why. recall it being some kind of epic fantasy right it was a yeah it was a fantasy type novel or series it was the trilogy of books yeah um yeah. so next week i'm going to do or do my best uh, to try and uh cover a, a author spotlight on author Brandon Faircloth, author of I Will Make My Arrows From Your Bones. Uh, my uncle makes dolls for re replaces, makes dolls to replace souls in hell. Uh, that's, a, that's a mouthful. And uh, I think that's the one I got. Whimsical Leprosy and Incarnata. Uh, so he's got a, he's got a fascinating, you know, um, catalog already. And they're all short story collections too. Right? I'm pretty sure they are. Yeah. 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 Um, Regina, before we get out of here, why don't you show us one of your puppets? Oh, well, the dolls. Yeah, yeah. they're they are dolls. Yeah. So I what kind of creepy bring. thing yeah. are you asking her to do for the camera? Yeah. There. Right? Yeah. The the, the dolls uh, for some reason in the middle of the night start screaming for no reason. <laughs> I guess Sorry, I'll have to find they're out. very polite. 
<laughs> they don't scream where I can hear them anyway. Uh -huh. Yeah, they prefer to just wait till you're asleep and uh, and start whispering in your ear. What do you? Oh, let's see if I can. Do you build them this. from scratch or what? Oh, that looks like something so, Ben might like. They uh, are. Can I put my um, dick in it? <laughs> 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 well, no, those are Ona holes, Ben. And if you try to post, <laughs> if you try to post Ona shit in the fucking DJD thread on 4chan, they'll oh, she's got a bong thread <laughs> or a, a pipe. I mean, right? Yeah, she's got a little yeah. pipe because she's, you know, that's just her <laughs> thing. But she's like super adorable, right? I, I love these fucking dolls. So they're called ball jointed dolls, and they come in a bunch of different brands from a bunch of different makers, and they're all resin what? usually. Um, and Such an they're... adorable soul eating abomination. <laughs> I know. I just love her. She's just, and she's brought, I do a, a lot of doll related magic sometimes. And when, at least when I make a doll, it's a magical process. And I feel like Rhodey here especially brought a lot of good energy into my fucking life. We so, you know, doll, what if kind you of doll uh, magic, like, God, voodoo, if you give her, doll oh, yeah. Jeremy. I don't, yeah, I, if, I, if you give her an eighth, does she uh, come back with the heads of your enemies? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, well, yeah, it's, it's not like, really right. I mean, I mean this, happen? this. So this character is is inspired by a, a character in my novel, "Be My Bully," and this doll in particular. I feel like this is the real Regina Watts, ladies and gentlemen. And so it's like a multi, it becomes like a, kind of like a Gene Wolfe story where it's like stories within stories oh. within stories. Oh, it's that's like, how you get the Regina Watts stories. She uh, whispers them to you in the middle of the night. Right. That's exactly. She comes crawling into the bedroom and then like crawls up and it's just like, <laughs> you know, creepy little ASMR noises. And I'm like, yes, yes. I'll write more food of which stories for you. That's a good <laughs> idea, madam. And so, but no, it's like, so basically you have options. This doll is basically custom. It, it, they usually come just all together in one body. And that's how you want them because it is so fucking hard and it takes so much strength to string one of these fucking dolls because they're elastic. I mean, you notice she's sitting up and she's minimally articulatable. The other doll I have that I didn't want to bother bringing upstairs, not that I don't love her, but it's just like, it's enough of a pain to bring the one doll and her little accoutrements upstairs. Um, it's like, uh, to get her to be more articulatable, I had to put like copper wire in her and so she can bend a little bit better and she's a bit better at posing naturally. But so there are all kinds of different companies, all different styles and sizes of dolls. This is the SD size and then they come in like a mini size and a, uh, like a little like chibi size. And they're just, they're fucking adorable. Well, you, the pocket size, you say? Like a it pocket kind of, size? Yeah, some of them get very small. And then some of them are more okay, like 40 Okay, you can carry that around with you, Ben. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I can exactly. carry it around and uh, pull it out to curse my enemies when they piss me off. Yeah. And then it's like you can... Uh, I thought it would be more I'll like an erotic tool for yourself. Uh, uh, Regina just said that there's no holes in it, so obviously yeah. it has to be used to kill I mean, my enemies. Yeah. I will I mean, say it's a little disconcerting oh, when you're okay. first into the hobby because the dolls do appear anatomically correct, but they don't actually have any holes built into them. <laughs> so if you're that kind of person, okay. look, I made her little donuts. <laughs> oh, oh, so nice. when she uh, gets oh, the munchies. Man. Yeah, man, exactly. And I also, it's a little piece of like coffee cake of some kind. So there you go. That's her. She's got oh, a little. That's really nice. Don't, don't, get, don't set that in front of Jeremy. He'll hurt yeah. himself. Yeah, right. <laughs> Um, her, I've got a, a, also when I first see it's like I've always loved mini things <laughs> and I found these fucking dolls oh, yeah. for the first time when I was like 14 but to buy like a full set doll is really expensive and so my father was like no fucking way so I put them out of my mind for years and then suddenly like a couple of years ago I just got the impulse to check on them again and they were more within my price range so I got one and you know slowly but I, I just you know loving tiny shit it was like an excuse to buy cool tiny shit like cool little books so I've got little shop of horrors oh. and psycho and Oh, oh yeah, I remember the uh, yeah. picture on Facebook. I think she had a tiny little uh, Call of Cthulhu book. Yeah, yeah, man. And it's like, you know, all this cool stuff. She's got like little tiny drawing supplies, so like a little tiny pencil case that 
I mean, it's like this hobby, all these people that get into it are so fucking creative. They're all such cool artists. If you just go, if you ever go to Etsy and you go to like, just type BJD, you'll get all kinds of cool <laughs> little props like that. Tiny little colored pencils and shit that actually draw. It's just fun. It's just a fun, cute little art piece. And, you know, it's like, I feel like she gives good vibes to the house when I do things with her. So I just you know, <laughs> try to pay her attention every once in a while and make sure she's not feeling neglected because that's how you get a haunted doll instead of a magic doll. Right? That's how you end up with a, a bunch of those little uh, colored pencils in your eye. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. I, right. I like I'll open the little notebook that comes with it one day and I'll be yeah. these drawings of me being like crucified and shit. <laughs> he reminds me like, of uh, the leech girl from Puppet Master 2. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've not she's, seen that. She's a. Uh, What's her a name? Doll. This doll's name is Rhoda. Rhoda. And the other doll's <laughs> name is Lulu. So it's My funny name this... is Rhoda and yeah. I'm going to kill you. <laughs> yeah, well, she is inspired. Her name is inspired by the bad seeds. So, you know, you want to uh, watch out. But it's interesting because it's like, it's very cyclical how creativity works because uh, this character I already said is based on the Be My Bully character. But the doll itself, because I would always kind of like sit her by me to inspire me while I wrote in the day, she kind of did end up inspiring the character of Dottie. <laughs> who started out the series with a little dot on her cheek like Rhoda here does. So it's really interesting that it's like, you know, when you take the creativity of one thing and put it in another thing, it feeds back into, you know, more creativity. It's just this endless loop. Which is why it's better to make dolls than take Valium, Jeremy. No. <laughs> yeah, get into, yeah, put down the pills, find Jesus, and get into making dolls. Already, already Snort felt. that sweet, sweet resin, baby. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's that's just one thing. The resin. I've got to yeah, say, he, he just takes. No, some, yeah, Valium's just one pill that he takes. He takes more than that. Yeah. I've got to say that no American who works forty hours a week should have to scrape resin to get high. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that is true. Yeah. I agree with you there. Am I muffled again? No, no. You, well, you, well, maybe. Your, I don't know. Were you trying to say something? Did your cat fuck your shit up again? I don't know what happened this time. Uh, Neil Neil Bimbo uh, made an announcement about if uh, an upcoming book, though. Title. Hell yeah. Look at that. So yeah, that looks no great. So something about a time mage, I guess. Yep. Well, that's a cheesecake cover. Whatever it's cover. about, I'm all for it, man. <laughs> Yeah, that is a cheesecake cover for sure. With an MC nice. who's a little bit Aladdin and a whole lot. A whole lot Reminds more. me of uh, the porno comics that would come out in the 90s. And a whole lot Kurth Gerson like from Jack Vance's The Demon Princes. Yeah, kind of like that. <laughs> Coming this Star Wars day, May 4th. <laughs> So Aladdin probably is intriguing you, right? I'm sure. Like when uh, when you watch the uh, the scene where Jafar has uh, um, uh, fuck, what was the name of the princess? Esmeralda. Uh, Jasmine. Uh, no, oh my God, Jasmine. Aladdin. Esmeralda. What the Jasmine. fuck is wrong? Jasmine. Yeah, it's Jasmine. Yeah, I'm sure the scene. Where, I'm sure when you saw the scene where uh, uh, Jafar has a Jasmine tied up in that outfit, I'm sure it did yeah, things to you. Yeah, that was great. That was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Is that oh, what you princess. made you want to talk like Aladdin? Oh, princess, <laughs> there's someone I'm dying to introduce you to. <laughs> prince Ali, yes, it is he. But <laughs> you know what's uh, really weird Hurry about the my original? Lips and come to grips with reality. <laughs> you know what's really weird about the original Aladdin story from the uh, uh, Arabian Nights? Uh, yeah. It takes place in China. Um, Except it's a China where, for some reason, all everyone is Muslim and has Arabic names. I don't know, maybe they're Uyghurs. And uh, yeah, like Makes there's a, apparently like a, um, Aladdin has two genies in that story. Um, huh. So that's kind of interesting. Huh? I did not know that. Where do you get that that from? From reading about you know the, the, the origins oh, of Aladdin. Arabian Nights. Arabian I haven't Night. read the Arabian Nights yet, but you know that's at some point I'm going to try to go through this. 
uh, I, I did. I did want to make mention. I know we got to wrap up, but I did want to mention it's another trend in books that I noticed recently. Okay, and uh, they're well aware of each other, by the way. Um, there's there's a trend lately with books that select odd um, animals as their like monster, uh, you know, but like, like that in the uh, Yeah, this is the most. <laughs> This is the craziest one right here as far as choice of animal. The cassowary, it's one of those weird birds that are almost like prehistoric. Uh, he he was like the last one to choose one. Uh, but also there was uh, Stephanie Rabig with Playing Possum. I haven't read it yet, but I'm going to. Uh, I mean, that looks intriguing, right? And also uh, this one was done for charity. I think they all were. And the, the box tops here. <laughs> That's the funny. Authors we're just trying to top each other with animal horror stories, but yeah, the bug. Have you uh, have you seen that one photograph? It's like a um, it was a, a buck that had another uh, buck's like skull attached to it by the horns because apparently it beat the um, it beat the other buck in a uh, headbutting competition, and so he, in order to actually get loose, he had to rip the other buck's head off. Damn. Wow, it's so he's brutal. just wiping, walking around with like the, uh, with the skull attached to him. That's horrible. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. I saw that picture. It's, it, it's like that Family Guy skit. Dude, Damn nature, you scared one, me. It is. I was thinking about that this morning. It's so funny. One of these fucking days, I was walking with my boyfriend. We take our cat for a walk every day, and what? there are all these fucking deer in our area, and they're fucking awful pests. And thank God, is <laughs> he's always safe in his little backpack, so he's fine. Yeah, okay. That's, but, I remember you talking about that. But. Yeah, but one time we were fucking walking, and this row of deer come lurching out of the darkness from this alley between the houses like they always do. But then one of them looks super fucking wrong, and I look, and its neck is just completely broken. Uh -huh. And it's still walking with its head just at, like, literally worse than a 45-degree angle. Oh, just, wow. like, completely, like, I didn't even know how it wasn't fucking paralyzed or dead. It was the worst thing I've ever been forced to fucking see <laughs> wow. with it's, my own two eyes in real life it, in the flesh. It, and it was... It reminds oh. me a lot of that. It reminds me a lot of that scene in uh, Antichrist where the, he sees mm. that... Uh, that Walk. dough that's hopping around and it has its uh, miscarried uh, fetus hanging out of it. Ah, I forgot what's, about that. What's going on with that tagline? That doesn't make any sense to me. See you out back. <laughs> you out oh, back yeah. in Australia. Yeah, like you want to fight. But why is that co comma there? I don't get that. See you out back. It's like. Yeah, no, I so think you're like right. See you actually, in right the outback, but I see you out back. Instead see you out back. See yeah, that kind back. of implies so that like, someone's bye, out back. Yeah, like someone's name's Outback. <laughs> bye, catch you later, Outback. I think it's just asshole. uh I think it's just implying like a pause, like see you out back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't like it though. Yeah, I understand. I'm what so, what sorry. animal would you all choose to write about if you, if you got in on that? It got in on the on the uh, yeah. obscure I mean the animals attack. Yeah. Genre, probably uh, panda. Really? What would you call it? What would you call it? <laughs> There's a Japanese comic <sighs> called Death Panda that's um, oh, about really? a panda demon. That sounds you, awesome. Uh, uh, it's uh, you don't pull it up on stream because there's a lot of like nudity and rape in it. Who wrote it? Uh, it's a guy named Uziga Waida, who publishes really it? fucked up comics. How do I spell it? Uh, U Z I G A. And as the first name, W A I T A is the last name. <laughs> okay, book family, not... I gotta, I gotta bounce. Wait, 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 so wait. You didn't choose an animal, Regina. Uh, um, what is my animal for writing about for killing people? <laughs> mm, probably a bear, like a bit. You know that story about the Japanese bear that was like the fucking Terminator that just kept like mercilessly torturing this town. It would just come back again and a fucking again and again and again and it killed and ate 
just like constant townspeople and sometimes it didn't even eat them it just fucking seemed to kill them because of like killing humans at this point and so they had to get like this old retired bear hunter out of retirement it was like a fucking action movie and he comes out and like his pregnant wife or somebody who was related to him who was this pregnant woman was like in danger and maybe got killed and so it was like him versus the bear and and it was just it's absolutely fucking insane so I guess I would probably write, well, God, but I can't write that because that's like The Revenant. So it's like, you know, mm, damn, it's just so hard to do an original murderous animal movie. Maybe a mountain lion. Mountain lions are really prominent out here. Bear with me. No, you should, you should tie it with in me. with your erotic stuff and, you know, have it be uh, the cougar. Yeah, <laughs> like a were cougar. Yeah, were cougar. Yeah, were cougar. They're a cougar. Um, yeah, man. Or like, I don't know. Man, you know what? One of the scariest short stories still to this day to me is The Birds, which is just like so good. And so it's just like, man, one of the only truly scary short stories I think I've ever read. Which one? I had to read that one at school. The Birds? Yeah, the I can't remember basis? the author. Was that the basis for the Hitchcock movie? Yeah, yeah. And it yeah. was like, it was in our fucking textbook my sophomore year of English high school, and we read it, and it was great. It was wonderful. Author. Who was the author? I can't remember. Hold on. The Birds Short Story. It's like so claustrophobic and so relentless. It's, oh, it's by Daphne du Maurier, actually. That's huh. interesting. Oh. That's really interesting. I'll have to check I'd, that out. I didn't I'd know. Pick ben before my headset decides it's I'm getting beeps telling me my headset's gonna die. Um, Thanks I'm uh me. probably some kind of uh, worm or parasite, maybe. Nice. Yeah, that's a. Good that seems. One. Yeah, that it, not in the most creative of choices, but you know, I, I like the idea of like cordyceps. Either, maybe the cordyceps. I don't know. It's just some kind of war. Maybe like I probably want to make one up. The things that take over uh, ants and turn them into zombies. Yeah. Oh yeah, that would be an interesting idea. Or the, veterans. or those. Um, I think they're a type of wasp that uh, uh, lay Jewel their eggs wasps. inside of. Yeah, they lay their eggs inside of living ants. I think, and then when they, um, you know, when the um, baby wasps are born, they uh, eat the they eat Ball the ants alive. Dang, ball sack. So scary. <laughs> oh, it looks like the uh, ball sack got um, got uh, Gregor. Uh, his his head ca- his head case was dying. His headset was dying. I, I still it's I'm, I can't figure out what happened to Ann though, but that happens every week, so mm. I shouldn't be surprised. Be okay. okay. Yeah. If she if anyone messes with her, she'll stab him with their Trump twenty twenty knife. That's right. I uh, I must go, my friends. Okay, good right. job on the Hey man. Yeah, it was really thank great. you guys and thank you for the fun night and for always having me on the podcast. I had a great time and I had a great time tonight talking about Gene Wolf. Love you guys. Yep, love you. Ta 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 ta. Well, well I guess all that's left is for Jeremy to play us out. And Jeremy, I hope you will pick something that does not sound like a dumpster falling down five flights of stairs. Do not fuck this up. I swear to God. Or did his computer freeze? Uh, I wonder what happened if I left it now. But it just uh, uh, up, up, we're ready, ready to, go. to go. Yes. <laughs> Good night, night everyone. everyone.
Hey guys, thanks for watching our cover of Somebody That I Used To Know by Gautier. Don't forget you can find all our covers on Spotify and iTunes, and check out our original music on Spotify, iTunes, and a playlist right here on YouTube. Don't forget to check out our website, firstlove.com. You can find physical copies of all the cover CDs, as well as t-shirts and sweaters. 